All right. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? All right, let's get started. So good morning and welcome to our public meeting, Measuring Clinical Benefit in Neonatal Randomized Clinical Trials, Challenges and Opportunities, which is being convened through a cooperative agreement between the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and our team here at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. I'm Morgan Romine. I'm the center's chief of staff in the D.C. office here. And I have to say on a personal note, it is a pleasure to be back in my first FDA meeting in quite some time and also uh, thrilled to be in person with so many familiar faces. So glad that we've got a great team here in the room uh, to guide this discussion uh, and a great presence online as well. Uh, throughout the workshop, we will have a series of presentations, panels, and moderated discussion sessions covering efficacy endpoint considerations for neonatal randomized clinical trials, including various stakeholder perspectives on important clinical benefits in neonates. We're joined by a group of subject matter experts who will speak throughout the meeting. You will find more information about them in the bio sheet provided. We are also honored to be joined by over 400 attendees online, as well as the folks here in this room, uh, all of whom have registered for this public meeting. And we are very glad that all of you are able to join us here today. Now the part that legal makes us do. So this is our statement of independence and uh, I'm not gonna belabor these slides too, too much, but please know that we will not be discussing any proprietary data or information today, uh, any specific development programs or products. Uh, there, here's our antitrust compliance policy. Uh, and most importantly, I do wanna touch on our academic statement of independence, which means that neither Duke nor Margola Center take partisan positions, but of course, individual members are free to speak their minds and express their opinions regarding important issues. I'll also note that for transparency, this webcast will be recorded and will be made available on the Duke Margolis website following today's discussion. Next is some housekeeping. Uh, a reminder that meeting materials, including the agenda, discussion guide, and speaker bios are available on the Duke Margolis website and for those in person. Uh, you can also access them using the QR codes you received at registration. We also have Twitter information on the slide here. Participants should feel free to tweet about the meeting using the hashtag neonatalrctworkshop. We will also be using Slido for audience participation today, so that'll include questions and comments. Uh, this applies to both in-person and virtual participants. We suggest that you take a moment now to log into the Slido by scanning this QR code or navigating to slido.com and entering the word neonatal. If you would like to ask a question during the meeting, you can use this platform to submit those. Uh, we will be monitoring them and passing them along to the moderator of each session. Please note that we will not be monitoring the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, so please do use Slido for all of your questions, and we'll hold on this slide for a moment. Finally, the Duke Margolis Center is convening today's meeting in cooperation with the FDA. Importantly, this is not a federal advisory committee meeting. We will not be taking a vote. We will not be reaching consensus. Uh, none of that stuff today. Uh, we are keenly interested in your input on this topic. Uh, we will not be following advisory committee procedures, and uh, the meeting will be a success if there is an open uh, and honest exchange of ideas in the room toward the goal today. I'm going to briefly walk through the agenda. Uh, apologies for the small font there. Uh, before we hear some opening remarks from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, I will uh, quickly cover the sessions. So in session one, presenters will provide an overview of currently utilized approaches to measuring clinical benefit in neonatal randomized controlled trials. Following those presentations in session one, we will have a moderated Q&A. Uh, during that Q&A, in-person audience members will have the opportunity to ask their questions live, utilizing mics within the room. Participants are also welcome to use Slido, as we mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, please note that this is the only session of the day where in-person audience members will have the opportunity to ask questions using the microphones. Slido will be used for all subsequent sessions. During session two, speakers will discuss condition-specific challenges and considerations for efficacy measurement, including methods used to develop proposed endpoints. Participants will then have one hour for lunch. Our team out at the table uh, can help guide you to some of those options as well if you need them. After the lunch break, panelists in session three will discuss key considerations for selection of endpoints for neonatal clinical trials for therapeutics and consider the clinical importance of endpoints to various stakeholders, including patients and families. Session four will be a forward-looking session focusing on new approaches to measuring clinical benefit in neonatal RCTs and data-driven surrogate or intermediate endpoints. At the end of the meeting, our moderators will summarize the key themes and takeaways of each session during the fireside chat. Uh, we are thrilled that you are all here to join us today, and we anticipate an interesting, productive discussion. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Hilary Marston, Chief Medical Officer of FDA, to provide some opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. 
It's a little bit strange to be at a podium. We're all still getting used to this, not being at our office chairs on a Zoom, but very happy to be here in person. Good morning. It's my great pleasure to be with you here today. Um, listen, today's topic, neonatal clinical trials, is a complex one, and it's one where we need all voices at the table, academia, industry, critically patients, their families, the entire clinical research community. So that's what makes events like today so very important. Increasing the availability of safe and effective medications for this critical population is an important priority of the Food and Drug Administration, and particularly the dedicated team in the Office of Pediatric Therapeutics, which is in the Office of the Commissioner, and I, I get the great pleasure of working very closely with. The first several weeks of life are obviously an important time of growth and development, and we need reliable data to treat these patients should they need treatment with safe and effective therapies. And when it comes to advancing medical products for pediatrics, we have a lot to be very, uh, very happy about, very proud of. Under the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act and the Pediatric Research Equity Act, passed in 2000 and 2003, in 2002 and 2003, um, respectively, we had a set of incentives that were able to help us advance therapies in this area. And the truth is that we've made a lot of progress. So since the passage of those acts, we've had a thousand label changes for children. Those include both adult medications that now have specific information for treating children and also medications specifically developed for children. And these are medications that run the gamut, but they do include medications for infectious diseases, for neurologic conditions, and for pediatric cancers. Really important work in this area. This, uh, this accomplishment reflects the efforts of everyone around this room and online. So this includes the experts at the FDA, industry, academia, and patients and their families. And I want to reflect on the patients and their families in particular. It is so important as we try to develop this evidence that we have the partnership of patients and families so that we can understand, A, what they need, uh, B, what sorts of outcomes are really meaningful to them, both in the short term and the long term, and obviously their partnership in enrolling in clinical studies. To that, so for the FDA's part, we've been trying to uh, work with sponsors to help pave the way for some of those clinical investigations. For example, we recently issued a draft guidance on ethical considerations with regard to clinical trials for children. Um, that draft guidance is meant to be used by everyone from institutional review boards, industry, and sponsors as they're planning these trials. Uh, and while we've made great progress in the area of pediatric research in general, the truth is that neonatal uh, label indications are lagging. So for example, of the thousand label indications that I mentioned earlier, only 10% of those are, have neonatal specific information. Clearly not enough. So part of the goal today is to discuss how we can best advance the information in this area. For the FDA's part, uh, we're working on a couple of guidances that should help industry uh, as they pursue, area, uh, pursue studies in this area, along with the broader clinical research enterprise. For example, we recently issued a draft guidance, which provides a framework for thinking about the long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes of children and how you can study these in, in neonates and follow them over time. We also issued a final guidance on clinical pharmacology considerations for neonatal studies, but challenges remain. So for example, extrapolation of data, this is a big challenge for this, this particular time period in, in children's development and the need for long-term data. So we've made a dent in that with this neurodevelopmental guidance that we've just issued, but obviously there are a number of long-term outcomes that we need to be concerned about. So as we look to the future, events like this are so important as we try to get the input from academia, clinical, the clinical research community, patients and their families. And continued collaboration with all of these stakeholders is going to be essential to our joint success. Only through these collaborations can we develop the right approaches 
to the necessary trials to get us that data that we need to treat these patients uh, effectively. So in short, thank you for your participation today. We really do appreciate all of the input that you're offering and look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much to Dr. Marston for informative remarks to kick off our workshop today. Uh, we will now hear recorded remarks from Dr. Diana Bianchi, the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Good morning, and welcome everyone to today's workshop on measuring clinical benefit in neonatal randomized clinical trials, challenges and opportunities. I'm Dr. Diana Bianchi, Director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, or NICHD. I'm also a board-certified neonatologist, and I was a NICU attending prior to coming to NIH. NICHD's mission is to lead research and training to understand human development, improve reproductive health, enhance the lives of children and adolescents, and optimize abilities for all. Within this mission, NICHD supports individual neonatal research projects, as well as research networks that provide an infrastructure for more extensive clinical trials. One of these networks, the Neonatal Research Network, investigates the safety and efficacy of treatment and management strategies for newborn infants. The network conducts randomized clinical controlled trials of unproven or promising therapies, as well as observational studies of newborns at highest risk. The network structure allows several, strike, several sites to use a common protocol for a study, which enables enrollment of more patients to provide research results quicker. This evidence is then disseminated and used as a guide for clinical practice for critically ill newborns. NICHD also leads research carried out under the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, otherwise known as BPCA. This legislation authorizes research to improve the safety and efficacy of medication use for children. The goal of this act is to provide rigorous clinical data to improve drug label instructions for children. Since its inception, the BPCA implemented by NICHD with support from all of the institutes and centers at NIH has completed 44 trials, has enrolled more than 11,000 children, and resulted in 17 drug or device label updates. We hope that the program is able to continue to operate and perhaps even expand in the future to improve the evidence-based use of drugs in the pediatric population including research that analyzes medications and metabolites in maternal breast milk that then get transferred to the infant. Other NIH networks also support pediatric clinical trials, including the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes Programs, Idea State's Pediatric Clinical Trials Network. This network helps to address disparities in pediatric clinical trials by including children from rural or underserved populations. For these trials to be successful in developing new therapeutics for newborns or updating drug labels for neonatal patients, we need to ensure that clinical trial endpoints are both meaningful for clinical practice and relevant for regulatory approval. As part of this process, it's vital to hear from those with lived experience to learn about the clinical importance of endpoints from their perspective, to incorporate that information into our research trials. I look forward to hearing all of the perspectives shared today so that we can work together to improve neonatal clinical trials and provide the best overall outcomes for newborns and their loved ones. Thank you. And our thanks to Dr. Bianchi as well for her framing conversation. Um, I believe we have our first panel uh, mic'd and ready to go. We're ahead of schedule, something of a rarity. But uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to the experts 
uh, and welcome your moderator for the next session, Dr. Michelle Walsh, to the stage as well as our presenters. Good morning. I don't think I've ever been to a meeting that was ahead of time. But, uh, um, all right. Our first session is uh, Current Approaches to Measuring Efficacy in Neonatal Randomized Control Trials. I am Michelle Walsh. I'm the Program Scientist for the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Development. The I am the program scientist for the Neonatal Research Network and for the broader population of newborn trials that focus on infants who are opioid exposed in utero. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, this is near and dear to my heart. As you can see from my bio, uh, before I joined the NIH, I was a neonatologist uh, and practiced for 36 years in the ICU working with thousands of families and babies. Our first session, we have three presentations. We have a next slide, please. That will focus on an overview of currently utilized approaches to measuring clinical benefit in neonatal randomized control trials. We need to highlight differences between efficacy measurement to support regulatory approval versus clinical practice change, and discuss strategies and considerations related to endpoint selection and clinical outcome measurement in neonatal trials. Next, please. We have three excellent presenters today. First is Jerry Baer, a medical officer and team leader in the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. Our second speaker is Barbara Schmidt, um, who will cannot be with us in person today. So her presentation is recorded. Barbara is a neonatologist, a clinical epidemiologist, um, and professor emerita at McMaster University and the University of Pennsylvania. Barbara felt that she probably would have an unreliable internet connection from her vacation in Patagonia. So here with us today for the question and answer period to represent Barbara is Eric Jensen, neonatologist and professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania. And finally, we'll hear from my great friend, Christy Waterberg, professor emerita of pediatrics in the division of neonatology at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center, an excellent clinical trialist and neonatal clinician who has contributed to many important improvements in therapeutics for newborns. Our first presentation will be from Jerry. Jerry? Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. You need this. Um, it is unusual to be running ahead, so um, I will do my best not to talk as fast as I usually do, um, you know, out of just sheer um, uh, nervousness in, in these uh, type of uh, uh, conferences. So um, good morning. Um, I was introduced already, so you know my name is Jerry Bayer. I am a neonatologist at FDA, and currently I work in the Center for Drugs um, on products for all age groups, um, but I did spend seven years prior to this working almost exclusively on neonatal questions that arise at the FDA. Um, I'll be providing a perspective from the regulatory universe. Um, I'll try to lay down the framework for uh, to explain why choosing endpoints for efficacy trials that are intended for regulatory review and possible approval or labeling for neonates can be different from the process that's used to select endpoints for other types of neonatal uh, clinical trials. Um, and you will hear um, in Dr. Schmidt's um, excellent uh, recorded remarks, um, you know, uh, the, the rationale for some of the uh, endpoints that are, are, are most commonly used um, in neonatal trials. 
So first I have to tell you that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose um, and that the views expressed in this presentation do not represent official FDA positions. So um, I will start by summarizing the importance of today's workshop. Um, I'll explain the basis for the regulatory considerations for efficacy endpoint selection. Um, and I'll describe some of the ways uh, a given protocol, a given program can measure efficacy um, in, in the sort of general sense. I'm not going to be narrowing down to neonates just yet. Um, and finally, I'll finish with the charge to the folks who are um, here in the room today and those at home, um, how we can move from discussion, which is really the focus of today, um, but eventually to uh, action and to um, working together to solve some of these challenges. Um, so why are we, oh, why are we here? Um, short of mortality and severe morbidity, um, measuring the clinical impact of therapies to treat neonates is not straightforward. Um, for the purpose, but, and for the purpose of developing therapies to treat or prevent neonatal conditions, agreement on how to measure clinically meaningful change is absolutely essential. So it's both not straightforward and it's essential. Um, and when I say agreement, who needs to agree? Um, parents and caregivers, and, and they've been shouted out multiple times and we'll continue to discuss today uh, the importance of parent and patient focused drug development. Clinical researchers, clinicians, regulators need to agree, industry partners, research funding organizations, biostatisticians, and possibly even your gardener. Um, we all need to come <laughs> together to, um, to figure out uh, how to measure benefit uh, for, for neonates. So what do I mean by not straightforward? Um, this is a, a, a completely incomplete list of some of the reasons that we have difficulty choosing endpoints that measure clinical benefit in neonates. Um, you know, so short-term benefit may not be durable, and you'll hear about that uh, a bit um, from Dr. Waterberg and others. Um, and it may be accompanied by long-term trade-offs. Um, we have competing endpoints, which you'll hear more about also from Dr. Schmidt, and those can complicate efficacy assessment. Um, third, not everybody values the same outcomes similarly. Um, and that's why we need to have these conversations and, and try to you know, come to some sort of agreement um, or, or at least understanding of, of which endpoints are uh, the most valuable. Um, and then assessment of our medium and long-term endpoints, you know, defining that as anything measured after the initial hospitalization, these assessments are complicated by attrition into current experiences, including a very strong impact of socioeconomic factors. Um, and, and so, you know, looking at short term, you know, is incredibly important because you at least have everybody starting from a, a closer to similar uh, baseline. Um, and then, although I think most of us would agree that the longer term is what we want to improve, uh, everyone wants these children to do well, to, to function well in school, to go out and run with their friends. Um, we want their organ systems to develop um, a lot happens, as, as I mentioned, between hospital discharge and the assessment of these outcomes. Um, and so this is one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in sort of measuring benefit of something that happens, you know, at a discrete point in their life um, when they're in the NICU. Um, so then why is today's discussion essential? Um, you know, some of the conditions, and I'm sure all of you are as frustrated, have, who've taken care of, of neonates, are as frustrated as I was as a clinician that we have conditions that begin in the neonatal and even prenatal period, um, including chronic pulmonary disease of prematurity, brain injuries, congenital infections, and others that cause significant morbidity, and we have inadequate therapeutic options. Um, innovation is, is essential. We need to either develop new therapies, well, it's, it's not really either, or it's both and, um, you know, and also we continue to test repurposed drugs, um, but we need a roadmap. We need clear parameters to judge success. So just because this is a major challenge doesn't mean that we throw our hands up and say this can't be done. Um, and this is you know, a big part of the reason we've convened this workshop. So how is the regulatory viewpoint different from that of clinical trialists and others who think, who've thought deeply over years about improving outcomes for neonates. So for one, um, at the FDA, we have legislation that guides how we approach establishing efficacy. 
The Kefauver-Harris amendments of 1962 are the basis for FDA's authority to require efficacy assessment for approval of new drugs. Prior to 1962, actually in 1938, um, we had to establish safety, but on, only in 1962 did we have to establish efficacy. And efficacy is established based on substantial evidence of effectiveness from adequate and well-controlled investigations. Okay, those are great words. Um, but for an investigation to be adequate and well-controlled, our methods of assessment of response should be well-defined and reliable. Um, we can use clinical endpoints to uh, assess uh, response when appropriate. Um, we can also use surrogate endpoints. We'll talk more about what it takes to uh, have a valid surrogate. Um, and the endpoints need to be clinically meaningful. And uh, for those who enjoy reading uh, dry but quite informative documents, um, I've given you the resource for the FDA's uh, guidance on demonstrating substantial evidence of effectiveness and actually is quite informative as you're designing trials for this population. So when you're selecting endpoints, um, you know, from the FDA perspective, the most important uh, criteria is clinical relevance and validity. Um, what symptoms or outcomes do the caregivers and patients want improved? What do they want help with? And can these be reliably measured? That's number one. Um, then the question is, is your endpoint affected by the treatment? Um, and then thirdly, important, but, but sort of a little lower on the hierarchy is the statistical efficiency in endpoint evaluation. And this is very important for trialists and for folks designing and funding trials. Um, how variable is this measurement? Um, and then based on that, you know, what is the size and duration of the trial that we're going to need um, if this treatment works, what is the size and duration of the trial that is going to be needed to show that effect? So clinical endpoint selection um, from a regulatory perspective is, is based on direct measures of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. You hear that a lot when you come and talk to the FDA, feel, function, survive. Um, but as you all know, feeling for a neonate or infant is challenging to assess. I can ask you how you feel after taking uh, a particular drug to uh, make your COVID feel better, but I can't ask the, the neonate how they're, how they're feeling, how's their breathing, how's, you know, how's their pain. Um, and so for neonates, um, in terms of feel, um, we, we need to consider developing observer reported outcomes. Now, functioning of a neonate infant or child, you know, we can consider things like feeding, sleep, developmental milestones, and the need for medical interventions. Although, you know, we, we do know that that can be somewhat subjective um, and, you know, uh, caregiver dependent. Um, and then survive, you know, that's relatively straightforward. Um, but we also need to think about whether the survival or mortality is related to the underlying condition that you're aiming to treat. Um, in the neonatal world, our clinical endpoint selections can be challenged because there are rare, because many of the events, the severe events are thankfully rare um, and getting rarer because of the improvements in clinical um, practice and, um, and clinical protocols. Um, we need large studies of prolonged duration um, sometimes. There's a lack of precision in measurement, and we have a lack of validated tools for measuring um, these clinical endpoints in this population. So I will talk about a couple of clinical endpoints that have been used um, for neonatal uh, approvals. And I didn't put them on the slide, um, but so some of our sort of more remarkable neonatal product approvals, we have inhaled nitric oxide, um, which I believe was approved in 1999. Um, and that was approved on the basis of improving oxygenation and reducing the need for ECMO. So um, in, in patients with hypoxic respiratory failure slash PPHN. So that's, that's one that was, has been used. Um, some of our older products have been uh, approved or labeled based on um, some shorter term clinical endpoints that we may not um, actually think necessarily um, would be enough for an approval today. Um, as, as some of you may know, we recently labeled, FDA recently labeled um, aflibercept for retinopathy of prematurity. And that was based on a reduction in the proportion of patients with active retinopathy and unfavorable structural outcomes at week 52. So that was thought to be clinically meaningful. 
Um, and then we'll hear more about seizures, um, but we have a labeled product for seizures now in the, in the neonate. Um, and that was based on the percent of neonates whose seizures were terminated for at least 24 hours following treatment, following the initial treatment. So we have done this um, successfully. It requires a lot of discussion um, upfront about how we're going to, to say that a given treatment um, had an impact. So some of the ways, and you'll, you'll hear more about these uh, a little bit later from one of my colleagues, some of the ways that we look at um, outcomes at FDA are through clinical outcome assessments. And these are measures that describe how or reflect how a patient feels, functions, or survives. So there's four different types of COAs that you'll see here. Obviously, the patient reported outcome not relevant um, to the extremely small population, but we have observer reported, clinician reported, and performance outcome measures. Um, FDA can review COAs either as part of a drug development program or via the CEDAR um, Center for Drugs COA qualification program. A COA does not have to be fully qualified to function as a primary endpoint, but qualification is a regulatory conclusion that the FDA finds the COA to be well-defined and reliable um, as an assessment of patient symptoms, function, or, me or mental state. Um, and examples of some of the qualified COAs, just so you have a, a sense for what kinds of COAs, there's a symptoms of major depressive disorder scale that's been uh, a qualified COA. There's a diary for irritable, ir irritable bowel sy syndrome symptoms, and there are asthma um, daytime and nighttime symptom diaries that ha have all been uh, qualified as COAs. Um, we also have COAs that have been used in approvals that are not officially qualified, such as um, the itch reported outcome instrument for cholestatic itching. So you know, thinking about how we might adapt these concepts um, for the neonatal population. Also important uh, as we choose endpoints is that FDA is really committed to getting patient and caregiver experience data. Um, Patient-focused drug development is our systematic approach to capturing and incorporating patient experiences, needs, and priorities. And the patient-focused drug development meetings are conducted with patient organizations, um, and they can be FDA-led or more commonly, they're externally led. Um, and they target disease areas with an identified need for this input um, for, for chronic conditions that affect functioning and activities of daily living. And I do think a lot of the neonatal um, you know, long-term morbidities would, would fit the bill for that. Um, the aspects of disease are not formally captured in the clinical trials. Um, and, and, you know, we really want to focus on those conditions with few or no therapies um, or therapies that we haven't been able to demonstrate impact on clinical endpoints. Um, and so after these meetings, the summary reports are generated that are public um, and they're called voice of the patient. And what happens with that information is that the reviewers within the FDA use that information as they're, you know, developing uh, uh, plans with um, study investigators and sponsors um, to, uh, to choose appropriate clinically meaningful endpoints based on the PFDD information. So if you can't do a clinical endpoint or if a clinical endpoint isn't appropriate as a primary efficacy endpoint, um, there are options to measure surrogate endpoints. Um, a surrogate is a replacement endpoint that does not directly measure how a patient feels, functions, or survives, such as physical signs, imaging, and laboratory measures. A drug's effect on the surrogate should reliably predict direct clinical benefit. So you need clinical information to link the surrogate to the direct clinical benefit. You need epidemiologic and scientific evidence. And uh, I'll talk about the level of clinical validation in a moment, but Biomarkers, which are defined characteristics that can be objectively measured as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathologic process, or response to an intervention can be used as a surrogate endpoint. So a biomarker may be a type of surrogate endpoint that can be used. So there are different sort of levels of clinical validation. Um, the candidate surrogate endpoint is still under evaluation for its ability to predict clinical benefit. We have the reasonably likely surrogate endpoint, which we assume there's a correlation with clinical benefit. It's supported by strong mechanistic and epidemiologic rationale, um, but these are not ready for prime time in terms of being able to use them for a full approval um, in, uh, uh, in a clinical trial. 
Um, and then the validated surrogate endpoints. And this is the bar that we need to try to meet if we want to use these as you know, full approval primary efficacy endpoints, so that we have strong evidence that the effect on a surrogate endpoint predicts specific clinical benefit, and it needs to be supported by mechanistic rationale, clinical data, epidemiologic data. Um, and like I said, these can be used to support a traditional product approval. But we have issues with surrogate endpoints. Um, Treatment impact on an indirect measure establishes biological activity, but may not necessarily predict clinical benefit. Um, the correlation between the biomarker and the clinical endpoint is necessary, but not sufficient to validate the biomarker. Um, biomarkers separate from clinical endpoints can be very helpful for prognosis or diagnosis, but may not be reliable surrogate endpoints to measure the impact of a treatment. It may not be on the causal pathway. Um, and you, there's always going to be some uncertainty about the magnitude of surrogate effect that corresponds to clinical benefit until you have a definitive trial that measures your clinical endpoint, your surrogate endpoint, and really is able to track both for the magnitude of effect. So what are our next steps? Um, today, um, we're going to have excellent presentations and discussions. In session one, we'll have presentations from two esteemed clinical trialists talking about past experiences and current perspectives on um, how to measure benefit um, in neonatal clinical trials. In session two, we'll have academic researchers who are working on measuring clinical benefit in several neonatal conditions, and they'll, they'll be discussing their approaches and experiences trying to um, develop endpoints. Um, in session three, we look forward to hearing from our panelists, um, multi-stakeholder panel with diverse perspectives about what is clinically important. What do we need to consider when we're thinking about measuring clinical benefit? And in session four, we're going to talk about we're going to have presentations and discussion of some of the newer approaches to measuring clinical benefit. Um, please share your experiences, perspectives, and ideas today. Um, and, and after this workshop, we, you know, we need to continue to engage. So consider engagement with public-private partnerships like the International Neonatal Consortium and Critical Path to collaborate. Bring your group to the agency for a patient-focused drug development meeting um, to tell us what's important. Um, we want to hear from, from caregivers and patients. Um, and get involved with other organizations and individuals who've been involved in this workshop. This is really just the start of this conversation where we want to bring people together to, um, to try to have a positive impact. So I thank you for attending. Thanks to everyone who came from out of town. Um, and I look forward to future discussions. Thank you, Jerry. Next, uh, we will move to the recorded presentation of Dr. Barbara Schmidt. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to give this presentation virtually. I will explain why the composite of death or disability is a valid primary outcome for selected research questions in neonatal randomized trials. I have no financial relationships to disclose. However, I should mention that the perspective I discussed today was informed by my following roles. As lead investigator of three international neonatal trials, TIP, CAP, and COT, as site PI in the Neonatal Research Network, and as member of various data safety monitoring boards for prestigious research networks and multi-center trials. I will address the following three questions. Firstly, what are the pros and cons of the primary outcome we used in TIP, CAP, and COT, namely death or disability? Secondly, how do composite outcomes in neonatal and adult trials differ? And lastly, which therapies with short-term benefits require long-term follow-up? Composite outcomes in neonatal trials have come under fire in recent years. And although some critics have been nuanced, others have tarred all composite outcomes with the same brush. The pros of composite outcomes are listed here. 
In general, a composite outcome avoids the arbitrary choice of a single outcome when several are similarly important. It reduces, importantly, problems of multiple testing. It accounts for competing risks, increases trial efficiency, and may estimate the net clinical benefit if efficacy and safety outcomes are combined. In this last case, the component treatment responses may legitimately point in opposite directions. What are the cons? Criticisms have focused on flaws in the choice of the components. The chief concern here is that components in some composites have not been of uh, similar importance. There has also been incomplete reporting by some authors of uh, the results of each component. And there are concerns about misinterpretation by consumers um, of the composite outcomes. I would argue that all of these problems are largely preventable. Here are the results for the primary composite outcome of death or disability in the CAP trial. We chose this outcome because it was relevant, reproducible, and potentially responsive to the intervention. And as you can see, caffeine reduced this outcome. And this is how we reported the components of this composite. In the first row here, you can see that the risk of death was almost identical in the two groups. But caffeine reduced the risks of cerebral palsy and cognitive delay. It has been criticized um, that cognitive delay is included in the two-year composite because studies in the US and also in Australia have shown poor predictive values of the Bailey scores for later intelligence. However, good stability of cognitive development between the ages of two and five years was found in more egalitarian Finland. And they, these investigators also use the Bailey scales at two. What may explain this discrepancy between the study results? We can only speculate, but it is possible that in more unequal societies than Finland, such as the US or Australia, social determinants have greater influence on cognitive development in um, early childhood, causing this two-year assessment to be poorly predictive. You can see in the last two rows that the outcomes of severe hearing loss and bilateral blindness occurred infrequently in the CAP trial. But I want to stress that we communicated the lack of statistical power for these two component outcomes clearly. The 95% confidence intervals around the point estimate of the treatment effects are large, and they include one. This means that not only the size of the caffeine effect on these two outcomes remains uncertain, but even the direction of the treatment effect. It has been argued that death and disability should not be combined in a composite outcome because death trumps all other outcomes in importance for parents. My sister died soon after a difficult birth at 38 weeks gestation. I was in grade one at the time. I know firsthand how devastating a baby's death is for her family. But who can categorically say that caring for a disabled child is always easier than grieving for a lost one? Judgments about the importance of death versus disability are always subjective, and they differ among clinicians as well as among parents, and especially among people from different cultural backgrounds. Outcome selection, yes, should occur at the core phase, but it will always have to involve compromises. And although there are wrong approaches to outcome choice, there is not one right approach. Even the folks 
um, who dispute that death or disability can ever be of similar importance must acknowledge that in most of our neonatal trial populations, death is frequent enough to be an important competing risk we simply cannot ignore in our research. In fact, death is not the only competing risk in the composite outcome as we designed it for the CAP trial. Cognition may be impossible to assess in children with physical impairments. About five years, about 10 years ago, um, Dennis Azopadi, the lead investigator of the TOBI, the Total Body Hypothermia Trial, stopped me in the hallways of the conference center to tell me about problems that they were facing with their six-year follow-up. And he said, we did not foresee this problem. IQ is the primary outcome, but quite a few children cannot be tested. How bad was the problem? In the subsequent paper, you can see that 37 of 184 survivors, that is 20%, were unable to complete the IQ test because of physical impairment. That's a lot of attrition that could have been avoided with better outcome choices. And of course, it would have had to be a composite outcome. Physical impairment, especially motor impairments, can be a serious competing risk that may preclude uh, in affected children the assessment of cognition just as much as a prior death. We move on to our second question. How do composite outcomes in neonatal and adult trials differ? Well, they differ a lot because we are dealing with a unique patient population at a very rapid and critical time of development and the outcomes of our patients are unique. Therefore, lessons learned from adult trials will only go so far and may not apply at all. Composite outcomes have been regularly used in adult cardiovascular medicine. They have also been regularly criticized. This figure on the right-hand side by Paul Armstrong, an eminent adult cardiologist, helps us understand why there is widespread unease about the composition of some of the composite outcomes in this field of medicine. Because the composites have ranged all the way from receiving any new medical therapy after randomization at the entrance, at the blue entrance here to the spiral, all the way up to shock and death shown in bright um, red color. And in fact, all of the outcomes that are shown sort of in blue, including rehospitalization or procedure failure, this is about cardiovascular medicine, they all dependent on the provider. They are therefore subjective and subject or, uh, to bias and such Outcomes should be avoided whenever possible in both adult and neonatal trials. But whether the components in these adult composites are weak or strong, blue or red, they all analyzed as time to first event using survival analysis. This means, for example, if medical therapy after randomization is combined with death, then patient one in group one as a first event um, has medical, new medical therapy, that person would count as having the primary outcome just as much as a person in the comparison group, the first one whose first event is death. This is obviously an unsatisfactory situation. And to improve on this, um, Stuart Pocock and his colleagues some years ago proposed the win ratio. The details don't matter here, but it's a statistical approach that improves the analysis of these very unequal components uh, to be better based on clinical priorities and perceived clinical importance. But here's the catch. All of these methods, and there are modifications of the win ratio now, they are all designed for survival analysis of composite outcomes in adult trials. They are therefore, despite what has been claimed, not suitable for the outcome of disability in our neonatal trials. Why? 
adult therapies are typically intended in fields like oncology or cardiovascular medicine to prevent or delay progression of disease. So survival analysis makes perfect sense. You want to delay as much as possible a first adverse event. However, disability is a non-progressive endpoint of abnormal development. We cannot attach a specific date to it, and we would never analyze it uh, with survival analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we now come to the very last question, which therapies with short-term benefits require long-term follow-up? The International Trial of Endomethacin Prophylaxis in Preterm, so TIP, confirmed that prophylactic endomethacin reduces the risk of severe IVH, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, but showed no apparent effect on the primary composite outcome of death or disability. And even now, more than 20 years after the original trial report, this finding still seems to puzzle some people, and, and it shouldn't. Because when we designed TIP, it was known that endomethacin prophylaxis reduces severe IVH. That was known from prior trials. But it was also known that the treatment effect size is actually quite modest. And thankfully, severe IVH is relatively rare. So why did we perform TIP with the primary outcome of death or disability? Honestly, it was not to search for lasting benefits of this modest reduction of severe IVH. The reason for performing TIP is written right in this abstract of the trial report in the second sentence. And to help you better read it, I've blown it up in this next slide. Whether prophylaxis with endomethacin confers any long-term benefits that outweigh the risks of drug-induced reductions in renal, intestinal, and cerebral blood flow is not known. Endomethacin has multiple targets in the body of an immature infant. And we were interested in the net long-term effect of this powerful drug. In other words, TIP was performed to evaluate the safety of this prophylactic therapy, which had already gained a lot of traction at the time in the neonatal community. And evaluating the safety of a prophylactic treatment is especially important because such treatments are given to a lot of infants who will not experience the main effect, in this case, uh, on the reduction of severe IVH, either because they're not destined to develop IVH in the first place, or because despite endomethacin, um, they still develop severe IVH. So these children, and it's the majority in any prophylactic treatment, will not experience the main effect, the reason why we give it, but they can still be harmed by the side effects. So to wrap up, death or disability is a valid outcome for selected neonatal research questions. Recommendations for the design and analysis of composite outcomes in adult medicine may not apply to neonatal trials. And common neonatal therapies with short-term benefits require long-term follow-up if long-term safety is in doubt. And this is especially important for prophylactic therapies. I thank you for listening, and I thank Eric Jensen for answering your questions while I enjoy the wild beauty of Patagonia. Thank you. We all wish we could be in Patagonia. <laughs> uh, our next speaker, Christy Waterberg. Christy. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this conference. It is always a major difficulty to follow Barbara. <laughs> Oops. So what I'm here to talk about today is the Neonatal Research Network's hydrocortisone trial for BPD. And essentially it is a case study of what has been presented so far. 
How do you approach a situation where you have both potential efficacy and potential safety benefit or risks? So we were faced with a conundrum in when we went to put together this study. We started planning for it in about 2010 and trying to figure out how to structure the trial because it has both safety and efficacy questions. Now we knew we could address the efficacy because we were looking at to whether we could decrease the composite outcome of death or BPD at 36 weeks estimated gestational age. But safety was not a be able to be a sort of assessed until some time later, and we chose a two-year safety outcome. We wanted to figure out how we could put these two outcomes together in a trial and hopefully avoid repeating the dexamethasone story. Now, a lot of people in this audience and, uh, and throughout the people who are listening are familiar with this, but I wanted to review a little of that history anyway, because I think it's really relevant to what people are talking about at this conference. This is the story of a therapeutic misadventure in neonatology. I wanna go back to start animal studies since the 1960s showed that high doses of glucocorticoids cause growth restriction in all organ systems, including the brain and that more immature animals are more susceptible because they're growing faster. Dexamethasone has about, people say, 25 to 40 times the potency of hydrocortisone, although the actions of a glucocorticoid are so broad and so different that I think it's really difficult to talk about equivalencies for any specific action. But in any case, early studies of dexamethasone in preterm infants use high doses generally 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day to start, which would translate here to about 12 and a half to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone per day, which is a lot more than we would be giving today. So the dexamethasone story for treating BPD in babies started at about 1980. And then there were three studies in the 80s that were very influential in this regard. First was Mark Mammel, who did a patient crossover trial and said that it hastened weaning from the ventilator. Second was Gordon Avery and his group, who showed striking short-term improvement in 16 babies in a tied pairs design. And third, probably the biggest study at that time, reported in the New England Journal, had 36 patients and said that it, there was faster weaning from mechanical ventilation and from oxygen in a 42-day tapering course. Now this is 36 babies, but it was three separate groups, placebo 18 days and 42 days. So Mark said back in 1983, when he published this, we chose dexamethasone because of its nearly complete glucocorticoid activity and its long half-life. And because there is reasonable experience with its use in neonates and infants. Turns out that all three of those statements are really troublesome. Complete glucocorticoid activity shuts off the HPA axis and destroys the mineralocorticoid activity of the native cortisol. Secondly, the long half-life proves to be quite troublesome in terms of its effect on babies. And reasonable experience in neonates, well, maybe not so much. But he also said that the treatment cannot be recommended without further study of patient selection, dosage schedules, and long-term side effects and the mechanisms of its actions. Well, studies continued clearly throughout the next few years, but it was also at the same time adopted into clinical practice on the basis of small studies. It was adopted as high, high dose, starting at 0.5 milligrams per kilo per day, generally long-term, 42-day tapering course, maybe 28-day tapering course, and as opposed to those first studies where babies who were developing BPD were studied at a month or so out, it started earlier and earlier in life until we saw them being treated in the first week. Dr. Ye said it worked. He treated babies for 28 days. Uh, Rob Sinkin said it did not work, but he only used two doses and then stopped. Jeff Garland and his group said that the treatment worked, but they had to decrease the dose from their original for GI perforation. And he was using only a three-day course at that time. 
And the last two that were supposed to be the big definitive studies were stopped before completion for a lack of efficacy and or safety concerns. And that's the Vermont Oxford trial and the neonatal network trial. Fortunately, Dr. Ye was able to follow his study group, the one of 28 days starting on day one, all the way out to eight years. He followed 146 of 159 survivors at age eight. Now, those of you who participate in follow-up studies know how very difficult that looks to be. He found that the treated children were shorter, had smaller head circumferences, lower IQ, and more clinically significant disabilities. And he concluded that substantial adverse effects on neuromotor and cognitive function at school age were caused by dexamethasone therapy in the first days of life. So at that time, started, we started to get more in, indication of adverse outcomes. The neonatal network, neonatal network showed in a cohort study of 1,100 or more babies that there were adverse effects for dexamethasone. It was a risk factor for a mental developmental index of less than 70 and an abnormal neurologic exam. That's a cohort study. And as I, I say all the time, please beware of cohort studies of therapeutic interventions because you never know what you don't know. However, then Keith Barrington, who's here with us today, did a meta-analysis of babies in randomized trials and confirmed that it was associated with an increase in cerebral palsy and neurologic impairment. So that was high dose dexamethasone. And with that indictment, the world changed from dexamethasone is good, the more the merrier, it gets you through the call night for sure, to all steroids are bad. No baby should get them. And this is what it looks like graphically. This is, um, I, I believe this is one of your articles, Michelle, showing that the changes in giving dexamethasone in three networks over time. And this, if I can do this, it doesn't work very well. Okay, so you can see that as studies were published late in the 80s, you see 90s, and then it goes up higher, and then it comes back down with the time point that these things began to be noticed to have adverse effects. Caught in the middle of this evolution was Lex Doyle's DART trial, low dose, lower dose dexamethasone. And he had a planned sample size of 800 babies. Postnatal age of greater than one week is when they were gonna be enrolled. His primary outcome for this trial, as he put it together, was disability, assessment of the effects of low-dose dexamethasone on long-term rates of survival free of major neurologic disability. However, because he was starting to enroll his babies right at the time when all of these reports of adverse effects were coming out, he was unable to complete the trial and he had to stop enrollment at 70. So in my opinion, he was asking the right question here. What was the therapy risk? And he was asking the right, he was doing the right study. He had a large enough sample size as opposed to those first studies to potentially answer his actual question and the wrong timing. As a result, we still don't have a good trial of dexamethasone. And Lex Doyle has done some sort of meta-analysis of a regression analysis of how the baseline risk for having BPD can affect the apparent benefit or risk of dexamethasone in this setting. But we still don't have that study. So we were back to the hydrocortisone trial. How do we structure this trial in order to try and get at some of these problems? So our hypothesis was if hydrocortisone can improve survival without moderate or severe BPD, it will also result in improved survival without neurodevelopmental impairment. And we had a, some data to suggest that that would be true based on a lower dose in an earlier period, time period. The reason is that BPD itself is a risk for mortality and for neurodevelopmental impairment. But we didn't figure that a sample size of 800 was going to give us a statistically significant benefit in any case. So we decided to consider, and I, 
I'll, I'll, um, I'll do respect to Dennis Wallace, who was the, the statistician that I worked with at RTI, who was just terrific. So we said, okay, it's going to be successful in the safety outcome. If either death or NDI is lower on the hydrocortisone arm, that's pretty simple. Or, and here we get to the statist statistical questions, or there's an increase in death or NDI on the hydrocortisone arm, but a one-sided 95% confidence interval for benefit, death or BPD, versus risk, NDI, is greater than four. That is, for every additional four infants surviving without BPD, we would have 95% confidence that no more than one in additional infant would experience death or, or NDI. So, you know, this has all kinds of, of baseline assumptions in it. You know, how do you how do you juggle these benefits? How, how do you put this together, the risk and the safety? You have to come down at some point with something, and that's what we decided. So because the primary outcome included an evaluation at 18 to 22 months, we decided we would not report this early outcomes. We did not want to influence people's clinical practice until we had the total answer of our composite outcome. So we were only gonna do this, the, D, the DSMC could choose to reveal the, um, the benefit if there was a mortality benefit favoring hydrocortisone. So the study outcomes, this was a trial enrolling patients who are still on mechanical ventilation between two and four weeks postnatal age, and we gave them hydrocortisone in a tapering study for 10 days. We enrolled them from 2011 to 2018. It was longer than we thought it was going to be because the CPAP trials were um, in the meantime, and so fewer babies were actually on ventilators at two weeks. Survival without BPD was 16.6% in the hydrocortisone group and 13.2% of placebo, which was not statistically improved. Moderate to severe NDI and survival without moderate to severe NDI was about the same in both groups, almost identical. Moderate to severe cerebral palsy was 12% in the hydrocortisone and 10% in the placebo. So that was our primary outcome, and it was not statistically significant in any sense. There were a couple of other outcomes, which I have gotten um, comments back from people all the way from, well, that doesn't really matter, to that's really important. And I think that's one of the things about who cares about what outcome. More of these babies who were treated with hydrocortisone were extubated during the study period. And hydrocortisone treated infants averaged three fewer days of mechanical ventilation. Is that important to you? If you have that tube in your throat? Have you seen babies on mechanical ventilation? On the other hand, if it doesn't change the long-term outcome at 36 weeks or at two years, is it important? That's why we need to talk about it. So how long is long enough? And this is one of the really difficult but important questions in neonatal trials, obviously. Two-year outcomes correlate only weekly with school-age outcomes, at least in the United States, maybe not in Finland. <laughs> But what outcomes are important to parents and eventually to patients? Let's get back to the basics. What is or are the right outcome or outcomes for a study intended to decrease chronic lung disease in preterm infants? Does the outcome at 36 weeks predict future function? And functional outcomes at when? Two years, five years, adulthood? If you follow people to adulthood, that's fantastic. And there are all kinds of different things that you can look at at that point. It's incredibly expensive. And I will tell you that when you look at people 20 years later, the uh, clinicians will say, oh, but we're doing things very differently now. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know? Um, so it's, it's really a very difficult question. For this study, the, the hydrocortisone study, we will have five-year outcomes. We're looking at cognitive and, and motor outcomes, but we're also looking at functional outcomes. We're doing a six minute walk test to see what they can do. And in a subset of centers that have the pulmonary function capabilities, we're gonna have pulmonary function outcomes at five on this group of very sick patients. We'll also have the same outcome on a group of patients in the transfusion study who are preterm infants, but not as totally sick. 
And then we're going to compare that to a group of kids who are healthy, normal term babies to have a really complete look at pulmonary functions at age five, at least in the preterm population versus the healthy term population, which surprisingly enough is something that we have very little of so far. And the point of this conference, obviously, is how do we assess what's important? Ask the parents, ask the babies at some future point. Saroj Segal has done a remarkable job of that. Her voices of preemies, the letters from preemies is, is just an astonishing read, which everybody should take the time to do. But everyone has their own point of view. The clinicians, the parents, eventually the children. I was right to keep treating this baby. I was right to keep my baby alive. I was right to stop. I should have stopped. My life is worth living. My life is not worth living. You ask any of us at any given time and you could get a different answer too. So I, I think it's really difficult. So for this particular case report, case study, the use of dexamethasone has been rising again. We found that hydrocortisone wasn't helpful. These babies are still having chronic lung disease at a high rate. So there's more dexamethasone being used, although generally at a lower dose. And a recent network analysis, looking at all the different studies together and trying to figure out how to put them together, concluded that moderately early, moderately high dose dexamethasone is the most effective therapy in this situation, but no large randomized controlled trials of dex versus placebo have been done in 20 years. And what the outcomes that they looked at, maybe those aren't the right outcomes. So we are still left in the Cochrane continuing review with pretty much the same statement, although it's changed a little bit over time. The review supports late systemic corticosteroids for infants who cannot be weaned from mechanical ventilation. Longer term follow-up into late childhood is vital for assessment of important outcomes such as effects on higher order neurologic functions and lung function. Further RCTs of late systemic corticosteroids should include longer term survival free of neurodevelopmental disability as the primary outcome. I have to say this was written by Lex Doyle as one of the authors of this review. And he of course was the guy who tried to do this 20 years ago. So he too has a point of view, but I, I happen to agree with his and I'm looking forward to comments. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, for that excellent presentation. Now we're going to turn to the question and answer uh, discussion section. For all attendees are invited to use Slido to submit questions for our presenters. You can scan the QR code um, that you obtained with your registration. For our in-person attendees, you can also raise your hand and we will hand you a mic to give you your opportunity to ask your question uh, in person. Just a reminder, this is the only session we'll be providing the opportunity to ask questions using the mic. We have one question already from our remote audience. And this first question is for Jerry Bear. For RCTs, what are the data standards like CDISC that are preferred or used for neonatal related research, if any? And then there's a second question, but let's do that one first. Okay, you can, you can actually ask them both. Okay. The second question is, can you speak to the generation of real-time data during randomized trials? Sure. Um, you, you can all hear me. I think this thing is working. Okay. Um, so the CDISC standards, any sort of data standards for neonatal trials that are submitted to uh, regulatory agencies are not any different from uh, data standards for other populations. Um, there are uh, uh, specific uh, differences as, as uh, the, the questioner probably um, is aware of um, in you know, sort of norms and uh, assessment of lab values and adverse events. And so um, in, in, in those scenarios, um, you know, there's a specific neonatal adverse event severity scale. So for your safety assessment, um, uh, FDA uh, uh, appreciates the adverse event severity scale that was designed for neonatal trials, um, which um, can be 
found um, uh, in uh, the International Neonatal Consortium's body of work. Um, and then there's also work going on to ensure that we have the right lab values for this population. And so that's still to come, but the data standards of, of, for uh, submission are not different from uh, neonates um, or uh, children or adults. And real time RCT data generation, I, I don't actually know what that is. Um, and so if anyone here can sort of clarify that, um, you know, I think we're, we're looking for, you know, complete data sets. We're looking for, you know, well-designed trials with good rationale for dosing and good rationale for um, endpoints and inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria. I mean, really, really high quality trials. Um, and I don't know about real-time uh, data generation. Anyone in the uh, live audience have any? Further information? Can we have a mic, please? Okay. If you could just state your name. <laughs> oh, my name is Zizi. Um, um, I had one question about uh, the outcome of the death. Um, this is also related for the follow-up and treatment durations. So when we're talking about death, is there any requirement like how long should we measure that? Like a time period is, is um, one year or like uh, 90 days or like, it, do we have any requirement for that? So uh, the question is, is there a standard for how long you follow? Um, the infants and what is the appropriate time point to say uh, that, that there may have been later deaths? Is that, am I saying that correctly? Uh, Christy, you wanna take a whack at it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I put, as I put up there, it's impossible to tell. You have to pick a point. You have to pick a point at which you think that's as good as you're gonna get. And it's probably certainly longer than the in-hospital period for the baby. Is it longer than two years? I'm not sure that it would be, really. The only comment I have um, on that topic is that um, depending on what the, the therapy is and what you're intending to treat, um, you you may not be intending, you know, it, it may not be, that you're expecting an impact on mortality. Um, and in that case, mortality might be a safety outcome. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Waterberg both talked about, you know, the, the need to make sure that we account for deaths. Um, but it, it, if deaths are the same um, in both groups, um, you know, and, and if you're intending to treat something that may not have an impact on, on mortality, you can think of death um, as a safety outcome, not necessarily um, as part of an efficacy outcome, but you do have to collect it and you do have to make sure there's not a significant imbalance. Um, in terms of the, the length of time, um, you know, I think to the point of your, of your primary outcome uh, measure really makes the most sense. Um, there's also a lot of intercurrent events um, that, that go on. And so um, carefully making sure that you're measuring severity of, of the condition that you're aiming to treat um, and making sure that your deaths are not imbalanced between your groups. So, uh, Jerry, I'm going to come back to you again. What are the key differences between efficacy measurement to support a regulatory burden um, versus the uh, information and the strength of the evidence for changing clinical practice? How do they differ? I would say the, the one of the key differences is really understanding is the importance of really understanding your therapy and what you're trying to make uh, an impact on and being able to tease out tease that out from the impact of of everything else. Um, I I think you know I we'll we'll get to hear from families and other stakeholders later. 
Um, I think death and disability are clearly very important, but if I'm developing something to improve gastrointestinal function or lung function, um, I need to see that there's an impact on gastrointestinal function and lung function um, and death and disability are important and um, should be measured for safety, but we want to have an impact on specific processes that are occurring and understand that impact. Um, and so that's one of the main differences um, in, in my view. Great. Dr. Barrington. Hi, uh, Barrington from Montreal. Working. Um, I just wanted to challenge something that Barbara said, which is always a uh, it's something you have to be very careful about. Um, um, the Pocock win ratio does not require a time to event um, form of analysis. In fact, it's just a way of prioritizing uh, items within a composite outcome. And it doesn't necessarily require, as I say, a time to event. For example, um, <clears throat> within uh, a win ratio type of analysis, you can make sure that uh, death is considered more important than disability, certainly more important than NDI, for example. Um, and the other thing too, um, she, uh, Barbara talked about the difference between death and disability, talking about as if all of the disability is profound, life-changing disability, whereas what we currently measure within NDI is often just a low Bailey score, which is not necessarily reflective of long-term <clears throat> serious functional disability. And those are things which I think are very different and things that we should analyze very differently, that if a child is surviving or not, in fact, there's very few deaths after discharge, to go back to what we were talking about previously, there's very, very few deaths after discharge of our, of our babies. So usually death uh, survival to discharge is a very good reflection of survival to longer term follow up as well. But um, <clears throat> the uh, kind of profound disability which families in general consider to be uh, of si substantial importance to them are not what we're currently uh, collecting by looking at NDI the way it's currently defined. Thank you. I would agree with Comments that. from the panel? I, I would agree with that, Keith, very much. And that's one reason I'm very glad that we, through the, the, the goodness of NIH, are able to follow the babies in the hydrocortisone trial, the transfusion trial, and the Darby trial through age five, um, and at least get some of those kinds of functional answers at that point. I, I, I'll, I'll say that... Um, if you think it's hard to challenge Barbara, it's even harder to try to answer a question and respond to a comment in her in her place. So I don't quite know. I imagine she would have a conversation with you back and forth. I don't um, quite know what she would say, but I, I do think that she may point to the um, the fact that no matter how you handle uh, that scenario, uh, it requires a judgment call based on uh, how you're going to score the importance of an endpoint uh, and whether a neurologic endpoint in terms of a disability ranks higher than a behavioral endpoint, which we learned to be um, very worrisome and problematic to families and how you're going to grade the level of benefit in terms of death gets this many more points than this level of NDI. I agree, I think we do a fairly poor job of measuring NDI in the sense that we dichotomize it most frequently, but we do have the ability to measure it with a greater degree of granularity. We often don't report it that way. Uh, and all tools that we have have imperfections, but uh, I don't think it's written in stone that we have to measure NDI as moderate to severe only uh, because we are able to measure it with more granularity. And maybe through doing so, we may be able to get closer to understanding how those trade-offs uh, uh, impact families. Uh, okay, uh, a question specifically for Christy and Eric. Is bronchopulmonary dysplasia a meaningful regulatory input or surrogate? Oh, I'm going to give that. <laughs> I, I, 
<laughs> the, the group here has been kind enough to give me 15 minutes. Uh, so I'll save um, my moments uh, for the next session. Okay. Um, in rare diseases uh, or trials that involve rare diseases, an assessment of multi domain responder index, MDRI, has been used to account for multiple efficacy endpoints. Are you all familiar with this and what are your thoughts? I would say vaguely, and I have a colleague who will be on a panel later who can who can speak to that. Okay. Um, so we'll put that on the parking lot. Accounting for multiplicity is clearly very important. And I would definitely agree with, with Dr. Jensen that dichotomizing, you know, can really um, uh, sort of dilute the impact of specific um, uh, areas that that might be important for families for improvement and and might you know may be able to show us some differences. One last question. Um, in the case studies or the trials that were mentioned by Christy and Barbara, all of those had a placebo alarm in their examples. Are there scenarios where it's not ethical to have the placebo arm? And if so, what are the thoughts in those scenarios for registrational purposes? So we'll give the first one to Christy and the second question to Jerry. Okay. Say that again. <laughs> Um, what is a specific rationale to have a placebo arm in the trials mentioned? Are there scenarios where it's not ethical to have so a placebo we did, arm? We did face that actually with the hydrocortisone trial because the question was, should we have a placebo arm or should the other arm be dexamethasone? Because that was the efficacious drug of choice at the time. But we had decided that because of all the adverse effects associated with dexamethasone therapy, we did not want to do that. Um, and if you think that something is not worthy of testing against a placebo, you should be using it. I mean, you know, that, that's the whole idea of the trial is to find out if the drug that you want to do is, is working. There are a lot of, of supposedly standard care drugs that you're then looking at something is this better than. So that would be, I think, a different scenario. And if you have a drug you think works in that circumstance, then you should not have a placebo arm. There have been a lot of questions about that in psychiatric drug trials. And Jerry, you want to comment on if you were doing a comparison between two active treatments, how does that impact the registrational right. aspects? So there's a couple of approaches you can take. And, and obviously, if you have an effective treatment, if you have something that's been shown to be effective or safe for a given condition, you can't withhold that. Um, from a population. So you wouldn't be able to use placebo. Um, you could do a comparative uh, non-inferiority trial, which again, not easy. Uh, statistically um, requires a, a large, generally requires a larger sample size. Um, or you can do an add-on trial where everyone gets the standard of care and then you have the new treatment added on. But no, you know, in the case that something has been reasonably well shown to um, improve outcomes uh, and, and be relatively safe. You can't, you can't justify a placebo. So that is all the time we have for questions in this session. Thank you to all of our presenters and to Eric Jensen for joining the question and answer. And thank you to everyone in the audience present and in the virtual audience for your participation. And now I would like to welcome the moderator for our next session, Dr. Ann Massaro. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everyone. I want to echo um, everyone's thanks for your participation today. It's been a wonderful opening session. I think it's really set the tone for the rest of our discussions today. I'm Emma Saro, as mentioned. I'm um, the lead neonatologist in the neonat um, in the Office of Pediatric Therapeutics on the Neonatology and Rare Pediatric Disease Team, and um, in at the FDA. And we have a wonderful panel today 
Um, this next session is going to focus on our some of our challenging areas. It was hard to select just a few in neonatology, um, but areas that you know we um, are really lacking uh, effective treatments and proven treatments. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and uh, we have some uh, presentations today by folks who can give us some um, overview of work that's been done in figuring out, you know, how we're measuring uh, benefit in some of these either neonatal specific conditions or conditions that really differ from the adult counterparts. Um, so our, if you can go to the next slide. So the objectives of our session today are to highlight the challenges and considerations for developing uh, core outcome sets in neonatal research and choosing appropriate primary endpoints for regulated trials. We're gonna review potential efficacy endpoints related to some of our key neonatal conditions, as I mentioned. Uh, our talks today will focus on um, pain and BPD, um, neonatal seizures and opioid withdrawal syndrome. And then we'll discuss um, in our discussion session some best practices <clears throat> and key solutions for generating high quality evidence for these conditions um, with high unmet clinical needs. So our speakers today are Kanisha Zimmerman. She's an associate professor um, with tenure in the Department of Pediatrics at Duke, um, who will be leading us off with discussion about her work um, in the area of pain um, in babies and young infants. Um, and Eric Jensen, a professor of uh, pediatrics and a neonatologist at the University of Pennsylvania. He's already um, been introduced to us and he's gonna share as promised some more of his um, work in the BPD space. Janet Soul, a, a child neurologist at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, uh, will discuss her work in neonatal seizures and Marna Fringa from the University of Toronto will discuss uh, core outcome sets and, um, and work in the area of neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kanisha. Thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, and um, so we'll just kind of jump in here. Uh, so. We'll talk some about pain and uh, measuring pain for um, really the purpose of uh, acute pain therapeutics and having them um, uh, defining efficacy for acute pain therapeutics in infants and young children. So over the next couple of minutes, we'll talk about why it's so challenging to measure pain in this particular population. We'll talk about a project that we are currently doing um, at Duke, but have lots of people um, across the country, uh, as well as in Canada, um, who have been helping us uh, really think about this particular project. Um, I'll tell you some about our findings and, uh, and our challenges um, and what we recommend as, as our next steps. So pain in anyone uh, is, problem. Um, it is many concepts potentially. So there's, so how in starting off, like how do we even, what are we even talking about? Are we talking about pain intensity, pain interference, pain experience that might actually be like anxiety, depression, other stuff. Um, so identifying exactly what it is you're talking about is really, you know, part of the first step and problem. Pain is rather subjective. Uh, there's lots of literature suggesting that there's malalignment in the perceptions of pain intensity in particular, and this has differed by age and sex and race and ethnicity and who exactly is uh, making that subjective um, identification of whether or not you have intense pain or not. Um, the pain experience is really intertwined with other concepts, and we see that in particular with children with anxiety and fear and other areas of distress. And then uh, the issue that self-report is really the gold standard um, for pain intensity, not only in adults, but in anyone who could actually tell you that they're in pain. So it turns out that kids, younger kids can't really self-report. Um, so that is a problem. Um, so we have to really focus on clinician reported outcome measures, or at least that's been kind of the standard so far. Um, so there are you know, COAs that are completed by clinicians. Um, but then the question becomes like, how do you know it's pain versus some other distress? I mean, if crying is an indicator of pain, for example, like babies cry for a lot of reasons. They're hungry, their diapers are wet, they're just irritated. So how do you differentiate that cry from another cry? 
um, sewer project, clinical outcome assessments, acute pain therapeutics in infants and young children um, is, uh, uh, we're fortunate to be sponsored by the um, uh, patient-focused uh, drug development program at the FDA. And our goal is really to identify or develop course out core sets of high quality COAs and endpoints to assess acute pain in clinical trials of pain therapeutics in infants and young children. And our initial um, target was those zero to three years of age. We have, because this is so hard, <laughs> we've now gone to zero to two years of age, and we'll see how things kind of go. There are two phases of this project. The first is a planning phase. I'll talk some about the results we have from here, but we've really focused on what we know already to date based on the literature. So what COA A's and endpoints actually exist to measure acute pain in pediatric trials or trials of this particular age group in particular, and what validity evidence currently exists for those COAs. So how were they actually put together? What's the evidence that they are actually like valid measures in this particular population? Um, as part of our UG3 phase, we are also doing in-depth qualitative interviews um, for concept elicitation um, in pediatric clinicians, as well as caregivers, really trying to understand like, what is pain to you? What does it look like? How do you measure it? When do you know how to treat it? What is your trigger? What makes it better? Um, or what, how do you define better? Um, and then our goal has been to design studies for the UH3 phase. Our, our hope is that we've gotten to a point at this, we're now kind of transitioning to the UH3 phase, but we um, have some baseline information that I'll share with you in a couple of minutes um, that we can then carry forward and do both qualitative and quantitative evaluations um, to validate the COAs and endpoints for acute pain. All right, so a lot of people have been looking at this. I know this is very difficult to read, but just in case you are interested, there are like 25,000 uh, articles that you know have to do with potentially acute pain therapeutics in children, uh, randomized control trials, something that was on our you know literature review search. That's a, that's a lot to go through. Um, we have eventually gone, gotten to about 1,100 um, papers to review. So people have been trying to look at this for a really long time, and a lot of people have been trying to do it. We uh, have done substantial data extraction to really identify really general information about the study. What is this, the, like who's being studied? Um, what's the age, the sample size? What's the source of pain, for example? And then some information on the quality of the study. Um, what about the pain relief intervention? Like what was actually the intervention um, to relieve pain? And then how did they assess pain within these particular studies? And then specific information on the clinical outcome assessments in particular, like how often was it collected? How did they use it as far as their endpoint? Um, and then whether or not there was a statistical significant, statistically significant finding using that particular COA and that endpoint. So we found that the use of COAs in clinical trials is heterogeneous and often kind of vaguely reported um, for RCTs in this particular age group. There were 83 types of clinical um, or ClinRow measures um, that have been used and how, it's, how they're used, even if they're the same one, actually varies between a, like from one trial to the next. Um, caregiver reported outcome measures are actually used much less frequently than clinician reported outcome measures. And the quality of, um, of the eligible studies really varied. Um, sometimes like things like sample size were adequately reported or you could actually find it. Um, and other times, maybe, maybe not. Um, race and ethnicity in particular of the child participants in the RCTs was reported less than 7% of the time, um, which is, was pretty remarkable for us. All right. Um, so we, the second part of this literature review is just to evaluate what the validity of um, the COAs actually uh, was, or where the, what's the evidence to date um, that people have done the necessary things to get this to a valid measure of pain, um, and what pain indicators are actually included in the COAs, and what's the, um, which of these have the strongest evidence so that we can actually move forward and kind of test them in the next phase. All right, so we um, have reviewed 35 ClinRO measures um, and one OBSRO measure that wasn't necessarily in this particular age group, but it um, was close enough that we wanted to make sure that we included our review. Um, the most common behavioral pain indicators were facial expressions, crying, and uh, body activity or movement. 
Um, there was really sparse content validity and lack of information on how the individual items within each of these measures was actually performing. And there was limited psychometric evidence for many of these um, measures. Very young kids were often excluded from validity analyses and validity data. And the prior um, validation studies really failed to include um, diverse populations, as I mentioned before. And many, many of the um, validation studies actually don't blind the raters to the source of pain or what's happening within the particular um, scenario. So they might know, for example, that the kid had surgery and then they're the ones evaluating pain. And that I think is a concern with regard to bias. Um, many of the existing COAs are also highly correlated. So they build on each other. One is you know, we start with one and then people compare the one to another and they use some of the same measures, et cetera. Um, there are a number of uh, measures that we thought had the kind of strongest evidence for continuing um, to evaluate them in infants and young children, um, but no single COA uh, has really met the threshold of a qualified PLINRO or OBSRO for regulatory purposes. Um, kind of going back to what Jerry was talking about, and all could benefit from improvements, but uh, we know that there are limited resources available with regard to money and time, and really prioritization um, of the next steps is, is quite necessary. So then how do we gather information needed to move the needle in this particular space? We have done concept elicitation interviews with clinicians and with caregivers, and with clinicians, we were really very focusing on um, you know, questions like, what does pain look like versus non-pain distress? How do you define those two things? And how do you separate them? How do you know when one is happening versus the other? And are there differences by age group? And we've divided them up um, here, zero to less than two months, two months to less than one year, and one year to less than three years. And then caregivers, we ask questions um, about pain and non-pain distress, um, questions about what their experience had been with regard to pain, um, how their babies are actually expressing pain itself, and then what interventions um, were necessary or what interventions um, did they think worked um, best and how did they define improvement? So for our clinicians, we had 67% um, uh, white non-Hispanic group. Um, the majority of them are female, uh, a pretty broad age range, 24 to 67. Uh, the majority of them were physicians, but we had a wide range of um, different therapeutic areas um, from, from whom these uh, participants came. And they were recruited through the Pediatric Child's Network, which um, was is one of the BPCA uh, kind of funded initiatives from NICHD. Um, we have found that movements, facial expressions, behaviors, and vital signs are really important to clinicians when they're thinking about pain versus non-pain distress. They thought that there were some key differences by age, more when people are, or kids are getting a little bit older, they're a little bit more expressive, and so a little bit easier to identify whether or not they're having pain. The most commonly identified um, types of non-pain distress um, uh, could be grouped in kind of general themes of like separation, disruption in the normal routine, and related to external conditions, like they're cold or they're wet, for example. Um, and clinicians were most co confident in differentiating pain from non-pain distress um, when there was a discernible medical reason to do so. So we're really relying on the context in order to decide whether or not kids are having pain or not. They, we do... Um, a good job of eliminating the other things. So if we think a kid is having separation anxiety, for example, we might put them with their parents and see if things get better, but that might also make pain better. So that might make it a little bit difficult to kind of understand what's going on there. Um, we might feed them if we think that they might be hungry and if you know they turn away or um, they decide not to, uh, or that doesn't suit them, then maybe we aren't right in our assessment here. Vital signs and um, pain skills they thought were helpful, um, and then the increased language skills as time goes on. Um, the goal of interventions for clinicians really is to decrease pain or pain score. They really rely actually on parents to also say like, yeah, I think the kid is doing okay. I think the kid is better. Um, and um, most clinicians actually aren't using pain skills in order to make their decisions about how to move forward, which we thought was really interesting. And then key, um, the ideal pain scale for many of the clinicians was simple and quick. 
uh, able to differentiate pain from non-pain to stress and objective. I'd like all of those things too, but okay. <clears throat> All right, so we also did caregiver uh, concept elicitation interviews. Here are the demographics. Um, here, you know, we largely had moms, which is not surprising in this particular um, type of evaluation. Many were married, some were co college educated and a reasonably diverse sample. Uh, key findings, you know, things like movements and sounds and facial expression and behaviors were all really important. This just gives you kind of the numbers of people who thought like, Crying, for example, was how they differentiated pain from non-pain distress. And um, in addition to kind of those uh, ideas of um, irritability and emotional dysregulation, crying or changes in crying, and the context and their kind of everyday cues, some reported using process of elimination, just like clinicians do, um, to really address things. They thought that age actually matters. Not only their kids getting older, them being more verbal, but you know your your baby better. Um, so parents were really um, thinking that as their kid as their kids got older, things were better, and they could better assess what's happening. So uh, the question is now, like, what to do and how do we move forward? And one of the things we've been thinking about is whether or not to include a caregiver observer measure, for example. Um, you know, given our information that we've gotten, given the fact that parents really did seem to know and things seem to be better, and clinicians are actually using process of elimination, we thought that you know eliminating the caregiver um, observations was probably not the right thing to do since they're such a valuable source of information, and yet there really aren't any measures that currently exist to to, to help us do this. So our, um, our thoughts are that, you know, there really uh, there's a lot of work to do in this particular area. Um, there's a reason we haven't solved this problem so far. Um, there's a substantial possibility for bias in some of the available information and literature that's out there. Um, you know, we are planning to modify the existing ClinRow measure. We've gotten some permission from the developers, um, but now we can't, we might not be able to use the historical evidence for the validity, which means we have to kind of generate some of our own. And then we are planning to design a de novo um, caregiver observer measure, which is, well, <laughs> um, will be a good amount of work, but we will base it on the, the one observer measure that we identified within um, the setting of uh, our literature review. We are going to, again, use information gained from the literature review, use cognitive interviews, and then we will do a prospective psychometric evaluation um, that will be done in children who are admitted for surgery. Um, so we'll observe them for acute pain behaviors. We'll evaluate a number of the different measures and also actually use some EEG to compare um, EEG findings to, to um, the more subjective kind of clin row and observer evaluations. Uh, critical questions really demonstrate the remaining challenges. So we still, it's still yet to be seen whether or not measures can differentiate pain from no pain. Can they differentiate pain from no from non-pain to stress? And then if yes to both of those questions, then can they differentiate different levels of pain? So those are the things that really need to happen in order for us to have a measure that is um, really can be used for efficacy here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, I'll just remind everyone that um, you can submit questions via Slido um, for both the in-person audience and for the folks joining us online um, today, since we'll do a moderated discussion, um, but won't have the mic around for audience members. So please, as the speakers are, um, are talking, feel free to go ahead and start submitting your questions. Um, so next we'll hear from Eric Vincent. Good morning. It's an honor to be here to discuss BPD. This is a disease that I'm passionate about studying. And this morning, I hope to convince you, as I was asked earlier, uh, if you're not already, that we have valid diagnostic criteria for BPD that are suitable for use as a means to approve new preventative therapies. I have no disclosures. I believe it's essential that we target BPD as a trial outcome for a number of reasons. Perhaps first among them is that BPD is the most common major neonatal morbidity. When defined as the use of supplemental oxygen at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, BPD occurs two to five times more frequently than other major neonatal morbidities, including severe intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy of prematurity, and late onset sepsis. 
Secondly, thanks to the work done by Barbara Schmidt, Lex Doyle, and the investigators for the Caffeine for Apnea and Prematurity trial, we learned that drug therapies that prevent BPD may also have durable benefits for long-term neurodevelopment and pulmonary health. Data from the Melbourne group led by Lex Doyle demonstrate multiple improvements in pulmonary function testing at 11 years of age, including a half standard deviation improvement in FEV1 among those randomized to receive neonatal caffeine therapy. And thirdly, despite some gains in identifying effective therapies through randomized trials, BPD has proved challenging to prevent in clinical practice. By most accounts, BPD rates over the past few decades have either not improved or worse, maybe on the rise. This stagnation has been frustrating, and it may be controversial to say, but I believe some of our disquiet with the inability to meaningfully prevent BPD has prompted criticism of the diagnostic criteria. If we can't prevent it, we must have the wrong disease definition. And regardless of what motivates these critiques, the debate about how best to define BPD continues. Criticisms of the available definitions include concern that they do not adequately characterize disease severity, that they are not sufficiently predictive of post-discharge outcomes, including that some infants without BPD go on to have respiratory disease in childhood, and that families care more about other conditions than BPD. And finally, that BPD is diagnosed based on a treatment, which is inherently subjective. It isn't based on a quote unquote objective diagnostic test. I believe each of these criticisms are valid, but I also believe they are not the severe hindrance that some propose. Since the late 1970s, BPD has been commonly diagnosed as present or absent based on the use of supplemental oxygen at 28 days of age or at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. In 2001, attendees at an NIH-sponsored workshop published the first criteria to grade BPD severity. In subsequent years, this definition has been widely used and reasonably validated. But limitations have emerged, including the inability to classify infants receiving high flow nasal cannula, now a more prominent therapy observation that the need to count 28 days of oxygen therapy prior to 36 weeks postmenstrual age is either misinterpreted as the use of oxygen on day 28, or is omitted entirely from the definition. And lastly, there is concern that these criteria do not adequately capture disease severity among contemporary evidence. The example of this final point I often use is depicted by these three babies, each born at 28 weeks gestation and pictured at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. While all would be classified as severe BPD using the 2001 NIH criteria, I imagine most, if not all of us, would predict that the infant on the left will have a better outcome than the infant on the right. As I mentioned earlier, investigators have also come to question whether the diagnosis of BPD itself matters to families. One such recent study led by investigators from Quebec, Canada, surveyed a large number of preemie parents to learn what respiratory outcomes matter to them. Several outcome themes emerged, a few of which I have listed here. They prominently noted fears of intubation, of death and tracheostomy, and time on respiratory, time on respiratory support. After discharge, use of home oxygen therapy, readmissions, pulmonary medications, and feeding difficulties were commonly noted. In their discussion, the authors stated, it seems that commonly used medical definitions of BPD are not closely associated with outcomes that are important to families. Indeed, none of our parents spontaneously mentioned that their child had a diagnosis of BPD, nor did they ever report that their baby was on oxygen at 36 weeks. Motivated by several of these limitations, a group of us from the Neonatal Research Network sought to use a data-driven approach to develop a new definition for BPD. To do so, we constructed 18 different potential severity-graded definitions for BPD and determined which best predicted a composite outcome of death after 36 weeks postmenstrual age or serious respiratory morbidity, and a secondary outcome of late death or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment. We conducted this study using data from almost 2,700 very preterm infants. Our primary outcome, in addition to late death, included the following respiratory endpoints. Tracheostomy placed any time between follow-up between uh, birth and follow-up, prolonged hospitalization at or beyond 50 weeks postmenstrual age for respiratory reasons, so supplemental oxygen, respiratory support, or respiratory monitoring at two-year follow-up, or greater than or equal to two rehospitalizations for respiratory reasons within the first two years. 
as I hope is evident, we took parental survey data to heart and included things that are meaningful to families, death, prolonged length of stay, tracheostomy, need for home oxygen, and hospital readmissions. We did so to develop a definition of BPD that predicted later outcomes that mattered to families, as well as clinicians and regulators. The 18 definitions we developed were specifically designed to address three key knowledge gaps. Each evaluated definition shown on the next three slides is depicted as a single row in the tables with the disease level indicated based on the mode of support and the level of oxygen administered at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. Our first knowledge gap focused on classification of high versus low flow nasal cannula. Definition number one closely mimics the 2001 criteria with the exception that unclassifiable infants receiving high flow nasal cannula are grouped with those receiving other forms of positive airway pressure. We then iterated the assigned disease severity level based on high versus low flow and oxygen level to generate definitions two and three. The second knowledge gap addressed whether there should be a separate severity level for infants receiving invasive mechanical ventilation at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. Here, we use the same definitions from the prior slide, but include a new higher severity level for ventilated infants with and then without stratification based on oxygen level. Our last set of potential definitions examine whether the requirement from the 2001 criteria that infants must receive at least 28 days of oxygen therapy prior to 36 weeks postmenstrual age helps or hinders prognostic accuracy. These final nine definitions are the same as the first nine, but here we removed the 28 day requirement and only assessed BPD status at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, irrespective of prior duration of oxygen therapy. From these 18 potential definitions, the one that performed the best for both composite outcomes removed the 28 day assessment and assigned disease severity based solely on the mode of respiratory support administered at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. Those breathing in room air are defined as no BPD. Those receiving less than or equal to two liters nasal cannula are defined as grade one BPD. Those receiving high flow nasal cannula or non invasive positive airway pressure are defined as grade two BPD. And those receiving invasive ventilation are defined as grade three BPD. These diagnostic criteria correctly classified the presence or absence of late death or serious respiratory morbidity at two years corrected age in 81% of study infants. We compared the prognostic performance of the definition identified in this analysis against slightly modified versions of the 2001 NIH criteria and one proposed by a 2018 NICHD sponsored workshop. In both cases, the data-driven definition we identified provided modest, statistically better prediction of respiratory and neurodevelopmental outcomes at two years of age. The next few slides show individual outcomes by BPD severity. While most infants without BPD and those with grade one or two thankfully survived to two years of age, 20% or one in five with grade three BPD died prior to their second birthday. Rates of the individual components of our primary respiratory outcome all showed stepwise increases in frequency as BPD severity increased. And for most outcomes, there was a three to five fold increase in rate as BPD severity rose from grade two to grade three. Measures of healthcare utilization, many of which are noted by families as key burdens of post-discharge life, also increased with BPD severity. Respiratory and GI medication use, need for feeding tube, ICU admissions, and a close relationship with the healthcare field are all more prevalent among survivors with higher grade BPD. Similar findings have been observed in external data sets. We evaluated outcomes in the Vermont Oxford Network database, which allowed for classification of no BPD, the combined grade one and two, as nasal cannula flow was not previously recorded in this database, and grade three BPD. The presence and higher grade of BPD were associated with greater frequencies of meaningful outcomes, including home medication and oxygen use, tracheostomy, death, and length of stay. Of note, following completion of this study, the Vermont Oxford Network revised their database to allow them to accurately measure our proposed definition. Investigators from the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium demonstrated similar relationships with stepwise increases in morbidity and mortality with greater BPD severity. Data similar to these continue to emerge, including in studies that now report post-discharge outcomes. 
The collective results of these work by and large are consistent with our original study and indicate BPD severity as we have defined it as a strong predictor of respiratory and neurologic morbidity in early childhood. I believe we've made important gains to address several of the critiques noted here. We have proposed diagnostic criteria that improve prediction of outcomes that matter to families. Rates of measured morbidity and mortality are low among infants without BPD and rise substantially among those with higher severity grades. Despite these gains, however, most stringent among us could continue to point to these limitations as still being present. With that in mind, I think it's reasonable to consider whether these limitations are unique to BPD or exist with other established outcomes as well. We're here today to discuss measurement of clinical benefit defined as improvement in how a person feels, functions, or survives. Importantly, we have developed a broad understanding of this benchmark. As an example, we recognize that systemic hypertension is a, in adults is a serious, and as the FDA tells us, silent health problem that you can have, but not know it or feel it. Going to this conundrum, there have been great public health campaigns to educate the public about the importance of identifying and treating this disease with FDA approved therapies. This leads one to wonder, do parents of children with BPD rarely mention that BPD is important to them because they don't care about it? Or is it because we as clinicians have not adequately conveyed to them that the presence and severity of BPD, frankly, based on any of the commonly used diagnostic criteria, is an important predictor of how their baby will feel, function, and survive in the coming years. What about the critique that some infants without BPD have poor outcomes, while some with BPD have reasonably good outcomes? That is also not unique to BPD. Intraventricular hemorrhage provides a salient example. Despite normal head ultrasounds, roughly 10% of extremely preterm infants develop moderate to severe neural developmental impairment or cerebral palsy, while just over 40% with a grade three or four bleed develop these long-term conditions. This does not mean that IVH isn't a meaningful outcome, simply because it isn't a singular predictor of one's neurologic fate. The patients that we take care of are complex and the etiology of their outcomes are often multifactorial. But even if IVH isn't a perfect predictor of disability, it's, at least it's based on an objective and accurate test. Well, that may not be entirely true either. Data from the neonatal research network that compared local radiologic interpretation of head ultrasounds to two central reviewers found that only grade four IVH had strong interrater sensitivity and specificity. And while specificity, the ability of two reviewers to agree on the absence of abnormal findings was generally high, most sensitivity values, defined by agreement on the presence of an abnormal finding, were quite low. And this phenomenon is not limited to IVH. Examination of ROP diagnoses using wide field digital photographs and expert reviewers demonstrated only fair to moderate inter and intra rater agreement. In this study, experts reviewing the same photos a second time often disagreed with their initial diagnosis or planned treatment. What about respiratory outcomes that matter to families? <clears throat> Using linked data from the CHNC and FIS databases, Joanne Legata and colleagues demonstrated wide intercenter variability in the use of home oxygen therapy and readmissions through one year of age, irrespective of BPD severity grade and known clinical confounders. Should we prolong hospitalization to ensure successful weaning or discharge patients earlier, perhaps at the expense of needing home oxygen therapy or being more likely to require readmission? Such trade-offs may be real phenomenon. I show here one-year outcome data from the TOLSURF trial of late surfactant. Although rates of BPD at 36 weeks were not impacted by the administration of surfactant to infants who remain ventilated at two weeks of age, there was a possible reduction in the use of home respiratory support as shown by the lower height of the gray bars in the plot on your right. However, there also appeared to be a generally proportional increase in the use of inhaled bronchodilators among infants randomized to receive late surfactant as shown in the plot on your left. Such findings note, do not negate the importance of these outcomes. But the data we have reviewed this morning, I believe underscore that many of the outcomes we assess in our patients are imperfect. They are prone to variable degrees of measurement error and may incompletely characterize our patients' risks 
for poor childhood outcomes. Now, I'm certainly not advocating that we have a low bar for what we consider useful in hospital or surrogate outcomes in our patients, but we will also likely need to achieve some compromise because without it, I feel we may scare away our colleagues in industry and elsewhere who are capable of investigating therapies that may prevent BPD while we are preoccupied with finding a perfect definition for BPD when good ones already exist. To summarize, we have proposed a data-driven definition of BPD that grades lung disease severity, corrects some limitations of other definitions, and improves prediction of meaningful childhood outcomes. I fully acknowledge that the diagnostic criteria we have proposed are imperfect, but this is likely true for many, if not most, of the outcomes we use to benchmark our patient's health and assess treatment benefit. BPD prevention is a worthy pursuit that should remain a focus of our ongoing and future research, and in my opinion, meets the threshold for use as a regulatory endpoint. However, as we have learned from families of preterm infants, BPD is not the only meaningful respiratory outcome. To really understand the quality of our care practices and benefits of our therapies, we need to, just as we do for neurologic outcomes, examine a range of respiratory outcomes beginning during the birth hospitalization and extending into child and even adult years. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Great. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to Janet Soul. Um, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to speak here today. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to do this and just a little nervous. <laughs> Forward. Is that, what am I doing here? here we go. All right. So I'm talking about uh, neonatal seizures, and these are the objectives that Ann mentioned, so I won't um, go over them again. Um, so just to convince you of the importance of neonatal seizures, uh, because it's not as big a disease, for example, as BPD. But the highest lifetime seizure incidence is in newborns. Newborns seize much more readily than older children or adults. And it is associated with long-term neurologic disability, all types of disability, intellectual, motor, sensory, and also later epilepsy. So we have a lot of data now, and I won't show it all, that suggests that higher neonatal seizure burden, so longer duration of neonatal seizures and intensity, is associated with worse neurologic outcome, both in the short term, so in terms of greater mortality and longer length of hospital stay, and also in terms of the long-term outcomes. So abnormal neurologic outcome, whether it be motor disability or, or cognitive disability and rates of later epilepsy. But these are likely mediated in part by etiology. So for example, if you think of a, a child with holoprosencephaly who begins having seizures in the newborn, period, your treatment of those seizures is unlikely to prevent their severe intellectual and motor handicap. And even for acute symptomatic seizures, we, 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 we wonder about this. And so the real question is, for acute symptomatic seizures or acute provoked seizures, as ILAE would have us say, you know, is it that the brain injury is causing worse seizures, or is it that the seizures are actually exacerbating the brain injury and making things worse? And therefore the treatment of the seizures would be worthwhile. And that may still depend on, on etiology, uh, even for acute provoked seizures. So these are some data from our Boston Bumetanide trial, uh, just published a couple of months ago. And you can see in all these, do I have a laser pointer? I guess not. To look at the graph, no. Um, so you can see for, for all of these three graphs, we are uh, looking at the relationship between seizure burden in minutes per hour on the um, x-axis and some sort of outcome measure, uh, cognitive motor outcomes in, by the Bailey. And you can see that both for HIE in the blue line and stroke in the green line, there's this direct correlation between seizure severity and outcome. Whereas for intracranial hemorrhage, there wasn't that same relationship. Uh, and we talked about why that might be. We obviously need more data to, to show that that's really true, but I think that that's one of the important things that we need to establish. For whom, when we treat seizures, are we gonna improve the outcome? Some of the best data we have for this relationship between seizure burden and outcome is from two small trials comparing 
treatment of either only clinically apparent seizures to those proven by EEG or AEG, uh, one conducted in Europe and one at WashU. So these are the data from the uh, European trial showing AEG, and they had, uh, you can see the amount of seizure activity in the first graph on the left. So if, if EEG seizures are treated, then it turns out the seizure burden is lessened uh, compared to when only clinically evident seizures are treated. And that's partly because newborns have a ton of subclinical seizures that we miss if we only use clinical criteria. And that occurred mostly in babies with severe HIE, which is what the right graph shows. But importantly, what they really showed was that if you treated AEG seizures, you would show this outcome difference between seizure burden and outcome. And, and the same thing was shown in the WashU group. So they've shown uh, on the left graph, the relationship between seizure burden and cognitive outcome. So more seizures, worse outcome, and then on the right with MRI, brain injury, more seizures, more MRI evidence of injury. So both of these trials suggested that first of all, the drugs actually worked. And that is important because there are some nihilists who say the drugs don't do anything to reduce seizures, but also that, that the treatment of seizures might actually improve long-term <laughs> neurologic outcome. And that really for us has been the holy grail of neonatal seizure treatment, which is what's the point of reducing neonatal seizures if it doesn't do anything in the long term, right? Then you're just making us all feel better by reducing the baby's uh, clinical seizures. So when we think about what are the medications that we could test to improve outcome, it's a very limited bunch so far. So this slide shows some of our drugs and you can see that the first two drugs have been around for an embarrassing number of decades and those are still our top two drugs that we use for treating seizures. Levetiracetam, a little bit newer, um, and there's some others. So phenobarbital has, has been the drug of first choice for 90 to 95% of people. If you do these surveys, people are still using phenobarb. And until the FDA approved phenobarbital just a few months ago, um, that was taken as the standard of care simply because people were using it, which is kind of a circular argument, but it was the best we had. So in terms of the real world evidence, in terms of what are our outcomes, I'm gonna go over some of these trials that have been conducted to give us some insight into what we might do uh, in terms of our trial design so we can try to get to our long-term outcomes. Um, so we don't have a lot of trials that have been published, and I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. The first one I'll highlight, of course, is this sort of landmark trial published uh, now 24 years ago uh, by Painter and colleagues. And, and this was the phenobarb versus phenytoin trial. So this was before the days of continuous digital EEG. So they had a one hour EEG and if the baby had seizures, they were enrolled. If they didn't, they did another one hour EEG the next day. And then the baby could get enrolled that next day. So problem number one, not that they could have done differently, but just to say a bit of an issue. So then babies were randomized to either phenobarb or phenytoin. Importantly, they didn't just go by dose, they went by drug level. Uh, and they found similar rates of seizure cessation among the two groups. And their primary outcome was complete seizure cessation. So then they crossed over. If you got one drug and you continued to seize, you got the other. And when they did that, about 56% of them uh, had cessation of, uh, with, with both drugs. So there were some important takeaways that were buried in that paper. And first of all was the observation that seizure severity really affected rates of success. So they looked at babies who had mild seizure severity versus severe, and that was quantitative. And it turned out drugs worked really well for kids with mild seizure severity and not so well for babies with severe seizures, 88 versus 10%. And also they looked at the course of the seizure. So there's this notion, and I'll show that on the next slide of, you know, neonatal seizures, they start, they get worse and worse and worse, and then they resolve over some period of hours to days. And they looked again, if the drugs were given, you know, at the point when seizures were, were sort of on their downtrend, wow, the drugs worked great. Whereas if seizures were on the upslope, slope, um, the drugs didn't work quite as well. And I'm just going to show some data on this next slide to illustrate that point. This is a uh, some data from a publication of 15 babies with HIE. So each horizontal line there is a different baby. 
And the little black lines that you see are, are represent their seizure activity. And you can see that for babies with HIE, the most common cause of, of, of acute provoked seizures, the seizure starts somewhere around 12 to 24 hours of age. They accelerate and then they resolve within hours to days. So you can imagine if you give a drug to, to baby, you know, who's, who's near the bottom there towards the end of their seizures and it works, maybe you really didn't do anything. Maybe your drug didn't even work. And that's been part of the problem with our trials is, you know, we haven't always been testing drugs at the right time. So in terms of our real world challenges, you know, seizure severity is highly variable and I will show you some more data about that. And that is probably the major determinant of the efficacy of our drugs. Uh, and, and it's the real problem is, is we can't measure it right at the time of enrollment. We don't have a way of rapidly analyzing our data to say, this is what this kid's seizure burden is, unless it's super early and you've only had you know, one seizure. And the timing of randomization is really key. So randomizing early. So I'll show you some more data to give you an example from our Boston Bumetanide trial. This was a trial where newborns were only uh, treated if they had refractory seizures. So babies were, were enrolled ideally before seizures started or when they had their first seizures and got a phenobarbital load. And then if they had more seizures after that phenobarbital load, then they were randomized to either get more phenobarbital with bumetanide or just more phenobarbital, so a standard therapy control group. And we used a dose escalation design to test higher doses. So this is the graph of seizure burden for our subjects, just in order of severity. And what you can see is that, first of all, seizure burden in minutes per hour seizure activity was enormously variable, but just by very bad luck, um, it turned out that six of the 10 babies who had the very lowest uh, seizure severity were in the control group, and two of them received the lowest dose. And then the babies with the absolute worst seizures just so happened to get the highest dose of bumetanide. I mean, you might have said this was lucky because if it had been the reverse, we would never have been able to show any effect of bumetanide, but it meant that we had a limited control group. So we had to adjust our analysis by seizure severity. And that's what's shown on this next graph here. So we compared our control group to our bumetanide group, uh, controls in blue, bumetanide in red, and this is the difference in seizure activity. So the reduction in quantitative seizure activity uh, in the first four hours after drug was given as a function of seizure severity, which is what the x-axis represents. So we were able to show a statistically significant difference, which was great showing some drug uh, works uh, better than bumetanide alone, uh, sorry, than phenobarb alone. Uh, we also compared it at, at a different time interval. This was really just to compare with the NEMO group who used this particular time interval just to see if it was comparable. And then we also looked at our uh, dose exposure. So instead of just saying, oh, here's the dose because every kid is different and the dose might be metabolized differently, we looked at our area under curve data, which gives us dose exposure. And here we have the plot similarly of of uh, the reduction in seizure uh, burden uh, following bumetanide uh, for the three different dose groups. And you can see this dose exposure related effect of bumetanide, which I think was reasonably convincing. Okay. So finally, I wanna to turn to the levetiracetam trial, um, which was a trial very similar in design to the phenobarb versus phenytoin trial. So. This trial compared levetiracetam head-to-head -head with phenobarbital first-line therapy. Uh, if seizures persisted, each group would get another dose of the same drug. And then if they continue to have seizures, they crossed over to get the other drug. It was randomized double-blind and unlike the Painter trial, continuous EEG monitoring right from the get-go. Uh, and it was a phase two trial, so they compared rates of seizure cessation between treatment groups. And these were the numbers. So this is the percent of babies with complete seizure cessation at, at one hour, 24 hours, and 48 hours. And you can see it's sort of astonishing that phenobarbital was really much more effective than levetiracetam. And this is my understanding of how the FDA came to approve uh, phenobarbital for the treatment of, of neonatal seizures. 
you might say, well, these data are really very different from the painter trial. Why so? I think part of it may be that treatment was a lot faster. So instead of having a one hour EG where they're looking for seizures and then waiting again, these babies were really prioritized to be uh, to get EEG going quickly and to be treated quickly. And so this may be in part also reflecting that earlier time of randomization and treatment uh, as part of the as part of what what their success showed. So in terms of trial endpoints or or, or outcome, you know, we're I've, I've mostly talked with you about short-term outcome in terms of reducing a seizure burden or morbidity or hospital, of course. But in fact, our real goal still is to reduce long-term disability because we think that's probably mediated by seizure burden, uh, reducing seizure burden. That's why we're measuring seizure burden as, as an important outcome. But we really need to be able to, to, to measure both of these long-term outcome measures, disability and rates of later epilepsy. And just as an aside, rates of later epilepsy, I mean, babies can present with, with epilepsy much later in life. I am now of that, uh, I'm told to use the word seniority. I've reached that level of seniority in my career where I had a baby uh, I looked after as a resident with a neonatal stroke who presented with refractory epilepsy at 17 years of age. How discouraging. Um, so how long should we be following these kids to look for rates of epilepsy? Obviously a very long time if we really want the true answer. So what do we have in terms of long-term outcome from our trials? Uh, so the Painter trial, we don't have long-term outcome data. The NEMO trial, which was another trial of bumetanide was stopped early. They only had 11 survivors. Um, the Levitaristam trial and then the ANSWER trial that I didn't describe, they may, I don't know, they may still be uh, collecting outcome data. And so hopefully we'll look for that. Um, but in terms of long-term outcome data, we have the monitoring trials uh, that I described and our Boston Bumetanide trial. We really don't have a lot of outcome data. And I will say as an aside, it was, it was actually hard to get the grant reviewers uh, to convince them that we needed long-term outcome data in our trial because it was an early phase trial. And they said, well, you know, that's not what you're really looking for. So we had to argue that, you know, we're trying to establish what are the outcome for, for babies with neonatal seizures so that we can plan future trials and design them accordingly. And that's how we were able to get that funded. And I still had to get additional date money to do that. So I think one of the things we need to think about is how do we fund these long-term uh, studies uh, for neonatal seizure trials? Um, the other point being that, of course, we need to be able to assess drug safety. People have a lot of concerns about getting any neurologic drug to babies. And so long-term outcome data are just as important to make sure that our drugs are safe as they are uh, efficacious in terms of reducing both seizures and improving outcome. So in terms of short-term outcome, uh, we might look at quantitative uh, you know, response to, to drugs in terms of early phase trials, just because that's what we're doing when we're trying to assess whether a drug works at all in terms of seizure reduction but we really need to be comparing seizure burden among groups and getting safety data uh, so that we can collect adverse events and make sure our drugs are safe. But the long-term outcome are the really important data where we need to be looking at rates of, of neurologic impairments. Uh, and in this paper that you see cited here, an international group of us came together to talk about what those long-term outcome measures should be. Rates of epilepsy, which as I said, will we'll take really long years of, of follow-up and, and we need those to measure both drugs efficacy and safety. And then just as an aside, sort of to go back to the very beginning, I remember when we were all sitting around talking about uh, designing neonatal seizure trials before the Levitrastem trial and our bumetanide trials got going, we all decided, you know, should we talk about seizure cessation? What about an 80% reduction? And I think those were really naive conversations when we look back now. 80% reduction if you have two minutes of seizure activity is very different than if you have two hours of seizure activity. And we just don't know what is the seizure burden that we need to reduce or, or reduce to in order to improve outcome. So those are all really important questions that we need to figure out in order to be able to develop and test drugs that will really uh, do what we want in terms of improving the long-term outcome for our babies. Thanks so much. Thank you.
And we'll move on to our last speaker, Martin Ofinga. Good morning. Um, my name is Martin Ofinga. Um, I am from Canada. Um, I'm a neonatologist and a clinical trialist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And I'd like to start with um, bringing the greetings from Canada to you. Um, Canada is now a country that has a clinical trial network that is ready to participate and lead regulatory trials in neonates. And uh, the name of the network is MyCERN. And I want to greet all my online colleagues in Canada from the network. Um, I've been invited here, thanks for the invitation, to talk about uh, two things a little bit. One is about the neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome core outcome set. Um, and then go on a little bit uh, before we go into the discussion uh, this morning to talk about challenges and uh, considerations um, when you develop a core outcome set. And, and we're going to really talk about whether they, the, the COS can, can be used as a, a COA, you know, in the true regulatory sense. Um, the justification of proposed efficacy endpoints for clinical trials in neonates. And then maybe um, uh, the beginning of a conversation on what best practices could be in uh, deciding and, and selecting appropriate trial outcomes. So it's good to be back um, here in Washington. Um, I was here um, nine years ago when we started um, the, the Inc. Network. And uh, there's a few people even in the audience that were with me at the time when we are uh, set the agenda uh, for you know what needs to be done in, in neonatal trials, um, and number two there, um, the yellow you know is really focusing on the outcomes and the endpoints is really important. At the time, uh, one of our um, priority areas, number four here on the screen, was neonatal um, opiate withdrawal syndrome, and um, in Canada, um, I can tell you that over the last decade. You know, the, the incidence of this uh, syndrome has, has risen with 80% from 3.5 per thousand live birth to 6.2 per thousand children born in Canada. And uh, it's an unmet need, uh, you know, how to treat these babies. Um, we, we, we don't have uh, agreement globally, locally on what is the best uh, treatment approach. So our challenge is to evaluate, um, develop and evaluate new interventions. Um, the problem um, is that we um, encountered when we looked at the literature that people were really not very um, on the same page when it comes to what are important outcomes to improve with these drug interventions, drug or, or non-drug interventions. And our solution in Canada, my group, um, took on to develop a core outcome set. And um, it's interesting, we haven't defined what a core outcome set is uh, in this session yet, but let me say it's a very quick definition. It's the minimal set of outcomes that people have agreed on should be measured in any future clinical trial on that disease. And the, the whole development of core outcome sets comes a little bit out of the UK, out of Liverpool, where the COMET initiative was started uh, you know, almost a decade ago. Uh, led by Paula Williamson and my group in Toronto have been really interested in um, uh, in participating in developing these core sets of outcomes for clinical trials in child health. Um, I've been part of at least 10 uh, and uh, ongoing uh, core outcome sets around the world that have been developed. We looked at the field of uh, neonatal uh, opioid withdrawal and we conclude that there was really um, a very inconsistent selection in, in trials and the definition of outcomes for uh, trials in this population. And um, we also found in a systematic review that's on the screen here that no studies have ever involved parents uh, or ex-patients you know, in the process of outcome selection. And um, uh, clinical meaningful practice guidelines, you know, have not been really uh, developed um, as a result of, of, of these deficiencies. So what we did is uh, here you see, for example, it's a small print table, we can find it in the publication, uh, that you know, uh, length of hospital stay and duration until the end of the symptoms of the baby, of the withdrawal symptoms, with the most frequently used red 
primary outcomes or blue secondary outcomes in, in trials, but in, and then a whole host of uh, other outcomes we identified. But immediately we found that these most um, commonly uh, reported outcomes in trials, you know, have not been defined in the same way, you know, in more than two or three studies at the time. So it's the definitions are all over the place. And it's really hard to combine the evidence or to compare the studies because they use different uh, definitions. And I learned a lot from Eric's talk this morning, you know, definitions matter. Um, what we did, and this was uh, published uh, in Pediatrics in 2020, is we went on and gathered an international group of people um, and um, interviewed parents, uh, did the literature search, did Delphi's, and then had a formal consensus meeting to get to a, a final uh, minimum set of outcomes that should be measured in all trials. And um, usually these core outcome sets are a mix of short-term and long-term outcomes and a mix of outcomes that, you know, regulators can use as COAs and uh, other outcomes that are important for other reasons. And um, uh, I'm just showing you here that this is unreadable probably um, uh, unless you have a very big screen at home, but this is just the, a picture of the list of the outcomes that we examined in the Delphi. And the dark blue means that in three Delphi rounds, they were voted in uh, or had a higher sort of score of, uh, of over 100 people that contributed to the Delphi to be included. And then the, the lighter blue and the white means that people didn't find, uh, well, these may, may have been interesting and important outcomes, but they weren't considered core, like they need to be in the core set. In our uh, development, we also in, uh, interviewed parents. We screened um, 58 women um, on various uh, non-opiate and opiate uh, uh, drugs um, and with babies with withdrawals. Um, we actually uh, ended up recruiting six women that we have qualitative intervention with for this process. You know, um, that's not something that we do on a Saturday morning. We have to submit REB or IRB here in the US uh, approvals, uh, consent, you know, record, um, transcribe, thematic qualitative analysis, et cetera. It's all in the paper, you can see that there. But I, I, I stress this on this uh, slide because I think the other speakers have also alluded to the absence of involvement of patients and parents. And there is good methodology to do that now. And, uh, and the group in, in Canada, we've published several papers now on how to involve patient parents ex-patients and, and, and parents and uh, how to do a, a job that is also satisfactory for the people that are involved. What do parents think? Well, for, for the for the ladies that we interviewed, um, the time to a resolution of symptoms was most important, uh, more important than anything else, actually. It's just a, a, a snapshot. Um, I don't think it's worth, you know, sticking too long with the final core outcome set. Um, 13 outcomes made it, uh, and probably too many <laughs> to, to be included in any trial. And I'll, I'll just tell you one thing that, you know, um, in Canada, if you submit um, a trial to be funded by public money, you know, um, the reviewers don't really like, you know, if you um, if measure too many outcomes and could be costly. And so PIs like myself, they don't want that. They want one primary outcome and two secondary outcome. But, you know, so th that's a little bit uh, for the discussion, you know. Um, is when you set up a trial, isn't it the, the, the opportunity to measure everything that is in the core set? Isn't that a unique opportunity or shouldn't we? Um, I'm personally a little bit proud that we uh, arrived at consensus of 13 definitions here, which, which was actually the most work, you know, not, not, not only to pick the, the, the outcome domains themselves, but to define them. Anyway, so here is um, the PI, Lauren Kelly, presenting at Inc. Um, uh, a few years back, um, so what we have done. And um, we are measuring the pickup of this core outcome set now in new trials that are registered at clinicaltrial.gov and are ongoing. And the pickup is slow so far. So second part is a quick um, touch upon um, core outcome set challenges and consideration. And um, has been discussed in an, in, in, early this morning, you know, that uh, validity of, you know, a set of outcomes is, is the big problem. You know, how were these uh, sets developed? Who, uh, 
who was hurt? I mean, in the first session, you know, there has to be agreement. So, but who are the stakeholders? Was everybody there? And did they get a fair chance to get to a consensus? Or was it a little bit of a lip service in engaging patients and families? You know, what really happened there? So rigor in development is number one. And um, the definitions, I can't emphasize enough, you know, sometimes are forgotten in these core outcomes. It's not more than the pediatric ones that we are involved in, obviously, because definitions are, are crucial, especially in these neonatal trials. Um, and then um, the third point, and we'll get to that later uh, today, I hope, is also that, you know, for some outcome domains, there are several measurement instruments. So you can imagine, you know, in the in the world of NAS or NAUS, you know, there, there, there are at least seven scales that uh, nurses and doctors use, you know, at the bedside to see what, you know, the severity of the of the symptoms. And so what is the measurement instrument of choice? And what do we know about measurement properties? And is there a minimally important difference that we know about? And you know, is the instrument fit for purpose for a regulatory trial? Those are questions that, um, that keep my, uh, my lab very busy here currently. And then finally, I just wanted to mention here, and it hasn't been addressed, that we are also in an involving uh, uh, world where a reporting standards uh, are now um, dictated. I mean, so this is just a, a publication from a month ago from our group, um, and it's titled uh, Peer to Core Outcome Sets uh, Had Deficiencies and Lacked Child and Family Input, a Methodological Review. So we went back all to the history to the start 30 years ago of the first core outcome set in child health, and we found that um, the development, you know, has been not up to sort of current standards. And I'm just showing this slide very quickly to show to the people at the at the FDA and, and, and the others here in the room that there are 12 criteria. It says 11, but it's 9A and 9B, you know, for uh, the steps in getting to a valid core outcome sets. And um, all these steps, you know, in our sample, you you know, like the beginning, um, you know, the setting, the research setting, uh, the domain, uh, what outcome uh, are we really talking about was 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 pretty good overall. But again, you know, um, to um, set a criterion for what consensus, quote unquote, really meant, you know, like numerical values, et cetera, how to um, I priori, priori uh, deal with, you know, discussions in, involving also patient groups, et cetera, was very poorly developed. So um, this is just showing from out of the 12 criteria on the EY axis, you know, in the early uh, days in 92 to 99, you know, on average, you know, a medium of four criteria were met and over time it's going up a little bit, but um, the green, you know, should be all green and, and, and red is certainly not met. And then the yellowish is, is, is wasn't clear from the reporting. And that's the other thing. So if you don't report what you did well and, and we cannot interpret it, then probably you know all your effort will be wasted because the core outcome set will not be used because we don't trust it, we don't like it. And so in here is the modern reporting standard. So if you go about doing something like this, whether it's for a national trial or or, or within you know the um, the office, you know, make sure that um anything you produce lives up to a minimal reporting standard as well. So the validity in our uh, now um, core outcome set, you know, we, we, we struggled, you know, is everything there? And so this is just uh, borrowed from Omarokt. Uh, so that's the um, sort of 20 year old uh, network in uh, rheumatology uh, where they identify these five uh, core, core areas of outcomes from the right from death to adverse events, to life impact, and and then the second one, resource use, economical, like, like length of stay in the hospital, you know, the time on ventilators, et cetera, um, and uh, to the pathophysiological manifestations of disease on the left. So we always wanted to pick in the core outcome set, every, you know, one or two domains from each of these areas. So we struggled a little bit with that. Um, and uh, I must say that, you know, um, uh, at the same time, while we were doing that, the English, uh, you know, um, uh, James Webby and Chris Gale leading, you know, developed a core outcome set for the whole of neonatology. And I think, you know, we should pay attention to that. This is called COIN, and you can see here that uh, participants 
414 former patients, parents, healthcare professionals, and researchers took part in the Delphi survey. You know, and, and so they had really uh, done a, a great effort to come up with core outcomes in etiology after they've shown, of course, that um, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in clinical trials. And so just a, a snapshot, uh, an advertisement for the final core outcomes, which is now sort of evaluated in a sample of uh, large neonatal trials, you know, how often these trials report on these and how well they are. Um, outcome domains are defined and how, you know, um, the details of the uh, data analysis around these outcomes are done. We're, we're, it's ongoing work, but these are the 12 um, domains that uh, made it to the coin, coin the core outcome set that we could probably use and look at. Anyway, I just, uh, it was mentioned before um, this morning already, and I am uh, fortunate to have been part of uh, a few um, consort and, and, and spirit extensions. Uh, those are the, of course, the reporting standards for trial protocols and trial reports. And this one, you know, um, less than less than two weeks ago, I think in Glasgow for two days, we reached consensus on um, what to report if your trial addresses surrogate outcomes. And, you know, and my, after 35 years in neonatology, I think, you know, the outcomes in our trials are usually considered surrogate. And of course, um, the um, evolving definition on the right, uh, based on the FDA definition, of course, um, and we've heard it before today, uh, it's a substitute um, outcome for what a patient really feels function or survives. Um, and then the emphasis now is, you know, can we be a little bit clearer on what is the evidence to really um, validate those, you know, and how reliably uh, is the surrogate actually predicting that? So this is coming out very soon, and I think we should take that in consideration. We will look at neonatal endpoints in trials as well, because again, there is an upstream effect of these reporting standards. You know, if the standard asks you to report on something, you know, then you have to sort of think of it when you're designing your your next validation study. And finally, you know, my group um, was involved in, um, these are two uh, papers published in December last year in JAMA, Spirit on the left, Consort on the right, detailing the outcomes. And what I've learned personally from this extension uh, of the reporting standard Spirit and Consort is that, you know, each outcome, you know, has five core elements. Number one, the domain, what, what is the title or concept of the outcome? Number two, the measurement variable or specific measurement, also known you know, as the scale of the measurement instrument. The specific metric number three is what value uh, are we focusing on in our primary outcome? The method of aggregation, whether it's a continuous, it's a mean value, whether it's a binary alpha, it's a proportion. Um, or it's a time to event. I have a few examples there, and this is also from the JAMA publication, so you don't have to write that down, just go to JAMA, it's open access. And then number five, of course, a very important in child health and very important in neonatal trials, the time point is one of the five dimensions of each outcome. You know, at what time, Eric, are we looking at the chronic lung condition? And it changes, it's fluid, as these kids develop. So I just wanted to let you uh, let you know, and this is my final slide. You, you know, I think, you know, um, if we are going to um, use core outcome sets uh, and, and use them as COAs and to make sure that COAs are in there, you know, I would recommend that um, we develop them for each of these diseases, you know, using uh, current uh, and uniform methodology. And, um, and generate transparent reports so that it doesn't get wasted. Everybody knows what happens. Maybe use the CoStar reporting standard. Number two, uh, that's the meat of my talk, I think, you know, let's invest in definitions, definitions and measurement properties of all the instruments, you know, if they're skills, you know, I'm not talking about survival as an, as an outcome, although there's a separate talk about uh, you know, death in neonatal trials that is sometimes very confusing on, on how to compare trials. But here it's really about the scales, the pain scales, the, the, the neurodevelopmental scales, et cetera. And, uh, and don't forget about the five core elements of any defined um, primary trial outcome. And then um, finally, you know, which is uh, something that, you know, I just came out of the Glasgow meeting, but I think 
let's make some efforts to, 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 to look again at our sort of neonatal surrogate endpoints and make sure that they're validated according to 2023 standards and not just, you know, like Martin Ovriga's gut feeling. Thanks so, so much. Great, thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, I think it was um, great case examples of a lot of work that is going into a lot of uh, difficult areas um, that you know starts with um, you know identifying new therapies. Obviously, starts with figuring out how we'll say that they work <laughs> if we can do that. Um, so we'll go into the discussion session. Uh, there are some questions that have been coming in over Slido um, and kind of weave into some of the general discussion questions we wanted to have um, after the session. So a couple of these actually are for you, Eric, um, and I think uh, touch on some of the broader themes when we talk about um, a lot of our endpoints that are surrogate endpoints as we discussed. And when, when we change that bar to you know, reasonably uh, reliable to saying this is this is ready for prime time, as Jerry put it, um, ready for to say this this is something we can use to know that this works. So one of the questions for you, Eric, is a recent article by Katz showed very poor prediction of two year respiratory outcomes using any definition of BBD. The ROCs were similar to chance. Why not measure two year outcomes for lung injury rather than thirty six weeks? Um, and I think this goes. <laughs> to a little bit about, um, you know, the predictive validity and, and whether it's enough uh, or whether even if we start to accept some of those shorter term endpoints, whether we're still going to need to confirm that with looking later on. Yep. Yep. Good questions. Um, uh, I had the, the, the fortune of being able to read the, the paper that you mentioned um, and uh, all credit due to the, the folks in the Netherlands where that paper's from. Um, they have really, really low rates of BPD in that cohort. And so when you have children that by and large do well, uh, and you have those that don't do well by the BPD standard have very mild disease, it's not unexpected that they're all going to have reasonably good outcomes at two years of age when compared to one another. Uh, when you're in cohorts, um, that are more commonly experienced in the US and elsewhere where there's a wide range in illness severity. Uh, I think that the data are fairly consistent that the, um, the BPD itself at 36 weeks uh, and the various ways of grading its severity are reasonably good predictors of long-term outcomes. There's a whole host of reasons why children go on to have respiratory deficits. Uh, it may have to do with the home environment. It may have to do with exposures later on, epigenetics and, and things that we probably don't understand. Um, so I don't anticipate that any of the outcomes that we have, BPD included, are going to be singularly perfect predictors. Um, but when we evaluate their utility, we have to keep in mind the types of kids that we're looking at and do they represent the range of those that we encounter in the broad neonatal practice. Um, whether or not we should be measuring two-year outcomes, I think the answer is yes, uh, but we've discussed that it's expensive. So if the benchmark is two years, uh, what happens when we look to see if two years predicts 10 years and then that's not quite as good Is now the benchmark 10 years and do we need to wait 20 years to approve a therapy? I think in, in neonatology, we're going to have to have some measures that we can look at in hospital as a way to evaluate whether or not therapies are effective and then we should follow those things forward. But if a baby is better at a year, but not two years and that family has been reduced a great one year of burden, uh, and they've had fewer readmissions, they've had fewer medication uses, they've had fewer days where they've had to miss work, that's probably beneficial. I bet if they did that over six months, that would be beneficial. I have two children, uh, and spending one extra day in the hospital felt like a mountain to lift. Now it's been five years later, and it's okay, but right, each of those things is meaningful to families. And so if the benchmark is that you have to be different in a trial that's not powered for five years to see five-year outcomes, we're never going to have therapies that are effective. And then we'll just be stuck using off-label medications and not knowing whether or not the things we're using are good or bad. And Jenna, I don't know if you want to comment on that too, with the respect of eliminating or reducing seizure burden and with respect to the two-year outcome. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a great point. I think, you know, as I've said, we we think that the way we would achieve the better long-term outcome is by reducing seizures. That's what seizure drugs do. Um, but I feel like we really 
do have to do both. Like we do have to be able to, so, you know, if we were managed to get a drug that actually reduce seizure burden, we, we, I think we would have to measure two-year outcome at least, A, to look at safety, right? To make sure we don't go down the dexamethasone pathway of saving the baby and losing the war. Mixing my metaphors there, but, um, but, but just to say, like, I just don't think we can have one without the other. I really think we have to have a two-year outcome to ensure that we're not doing harm and that we're, we are being a benefit to children. It's not quite like BPD, right? Babies, if they, you know, a, a small number of them will, will develop epilepsy within the first two years, but many of them will develop it later. So it's not like that's going to change the outcome so much in the very short term. And parents obviously don't like seeing their children seize in the, in the NICU, but most of those seizures are unwitnessed or clinically silent. So that's not the same kind of uh, distress for parents other than you telling them, oh, they had 27 seizures overnight on their EEG, which is enormously stressful. So we don't have the same kind of short-term benefits like in BPD where you're off oxygen and therefore it's way better. Um, there, that's a whole separate debate about whether or not you stop anti-seizure medications at, at the end of NICU discharge, which I won't get into, but just to say, I, for us, I think we have to have two-year outcome. And that's why I, I would say we want to be able to state that so that funding agencies will include those outcomes for our trials. Otherwise, we could go down the rabbit hole. The other thing is, is we might actually have a seizure medication that has additional neuroprotective benefit. And so that it isn't just that the reduction of seizures. So for example, topiramate is a drug that many of us would love to study for neonatal seizures. There's a real potential for additional neuroprotective benefit based on animal data. There's also the potential for harm. And so that would be a study that where I think we would have to have two-year outcome data, even in a pilot study, just because there might be some safety issues. So. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question for Eric. Um, is the severe grade three BPD by NIH or your definition is a bad outcome and appears associated clearly with poor long-term outcomes, but thankfully it's uncommon. How can one measure the impact of therapy reducing less severe preterm lung disease? So I think this gets to the, you know, are we? Can, how can we get away from the categorical death or disability, these severe outcomes, and is there a way, and we may get to this a little bit later in, in the workshop today about, um, you know, some of the, the ordinal type outcomes or, or ways that we can um, look at those less severe manifestations? Sure. Well, I, I think that there's been a, a number of proposed definitions for BPD that grade the disease severity. So we proposed one. There was a NIH workshop from 2001 and 2018. So each of those provide um, definitions that could be used to grade the severity. And I, I would agree with you that the our grade three is reasonably rare. We found it in about 10% of kids. Um, but the patients who develop it will def depend on the cohort that you're studying. So if you're examining children with a high-grade early RDS, the incidence in that population will be higher. If you're evaluating children who are already uh, receiving very little respiratory support early in life, the incidence will be almost zero. Uh, and so the group that you investigate for your therapies may not be representative of neonatal infants as a whole. And so the power that you'll need to uh, address that outcome uh, in terms of the number of infants is gonna vary based on the, the likely incidence of the disease in that group. But I think it's reasonable to target reductions in all levels of BPD severity. I think that if you go from very mild to no BPD, uh, the impact that that's going to have on long-term health may be a bit more muted than if you can take severe BPD and reduce it to no BPD. But if a therapy is inexpensive and it's safe uh, and you could reduce the entire birth population uh, in the US that's born very preterm from having like one step down in their severity, that's likely to have uh, benefit. If it's incredibly expensive or potentially dangerous, then you probably wouldn't want to use it. But I think that there's utility in moving everybody to a healthier place uh, along the scale of their lung disease, as well as the rest of the organs. Great, thank you. Um, and we have time probably for one more question. So I'm gonna leave it and have it be a provocative one that will also lead into our session for the afternoon. But for Kanisha and for Martin, for developing core outcome sets or using the approach of, you know, uh, clinician caregiver perspectives and, and trying to develop um, 
you know, selection of, of um, what will go into your measure. We're talking as if all of bringing all these stakeholders to the table, I think is, is key and everybody agrees on that. Should they all be weighted equally? Um, and if there's conflict between these different perspectives, how, how should we be handling that? It's Maybe. a fantastic Maybe. question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, great um, uh, so in pain, for example, I mean, there's, it's well documented that people view things differently. Even moms and dads view their kids differently as far as um, whether the kid has pain or whether the kid doesn't, or if it's a girl kid versus a boy kid, which one has pain? Like all, we already know that that's an issue. Um, so I think acknowledging that that exists and there are going to be differences in how people are going to um, view things is, you know, really the first step. Uh, I think it's a place where, um, um, you know, clinicians certainly might say that they have the say, right? Like where, because they're the ones giving the medications, et cetera. But um, uh, I think resolving potential conflict between, you know, what a mother might say, for example, and what a clinician um, might say uh, really requires kind of coming to the table and understanding where each of the people are coming from. Uh, I think it also um, kind of embodies the idea of like, um, not just pain itself, but like potential harms with therapeutic intervention that need to be considered and whether or not that's something that's, um, how important that is or the relative importance of that as a contributor um, as well. I, I think I'm encouraged in the area of pain though, that um, clinicians already seem to rely on, on parents for a lot of the things that, like whether or not an intervention is working, because we um, hopefully realize that we don't know that kid, especially if the kid has some you know, degree of um, intellectual disability or limitations, et cetera. We, I think, uh, have been less confident in the evidence that we have been able to see suggests that we are less confident in those situations. We are less confident when we don't have a long history with the, the kid itself. Um, we're less confident when we don't know the clinical situation um, in which the kid is coming from. Um, so ho hopefully we will, um, I think working together is gonna be important, but it seems like we're already kind of moving towards understanding what, what parents really think about and caregivers really think about pain in particular. Martin. Okay, um, so yeah, so great question. So from my experience on working now with parents uh, on getting these core outcome sets done, um, I'm, I really developed a, an interest in, in public and patient involvement. And a few lessons that we've learned is uh, number one, um, it is a conversation and education in two directions. So the old world was more like tokenism, like, you know, okay, there was one parent on the committee, but now you have a group of parents that have their own dynamics in preparing for the meeting. And they are really very able to understand, for example, if the focus is on regulatory trials, what society needs and what the scientists needs and, uh, you know, to make decisions. And so um, from participating and actually chairing a few of those meetings and working with patients and parents, I'm very impressed so far. And, and this has been like, for example, in the area of um, rare metabolic diseases like MPS, you know, and, um, and MCAT. And, these parents are, are experts. These are chronic diseases, maybe a little different, the average parent from a, a premature newborn or a newborn with uh, seizures. So we have to sort of take that into account. But they um, take stuff in and they consider it and they're completely um, able to partner with us. Like they're actually partners and co-authors on these core outcome set reports. And so I feel like as they are the um, receiver in the end, you know, of the treatments and they have to deal with, you know, all the consequences, you know, of like, like the story about seizure burden versus, you know, that some of these drugs also cause apoptosis and harm. They take the child home, right? I've come to believe that, you know, if we follow the um, um, best practices that are out there now and learn and, and report that conflict is rare and resolutions are there, um, final point, core outcome sets are just core outcome sets. It doesn't mean that outcomes that parents sometimes find very important aren't relevant for a particular type of trial. 
because the mechanism of that intervention leads to this outcome to be maybe one of the primary or you know, co-primary outcomes to be studied. And, and it may not be in the core outcome set. So we, we have to be flexible you know, on a case by case basis. What is the intervention and what is the most sort of, um, what's the best candidate for CLA here? So I feel that um, if we do this more and the experience from the UK, I wasn't involved in the coin set, but I, I heard that was a fantastic meeting and they had, you know, 20 or 25 year old extremes, you know, looking back on their life, et cetera, informing the discussion. It is actually um, a pleasure and a growth to do it. It will, yeah, it will take some time, but I think it will, it will not lead to conflict per se. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for this wonderful discussion and a fantastic morning. I think it will leave us percolating through lunch to continue this conversation about multi-stakeholder um, involvement and, and input as we think about this, um, these areas um, in the afternoon session. So we have a one hour lunch break and we will return here um, at one o'clock. Um, there's information in your packages about uh, local areas where you can find lunch on your own. Um, and we'll meet back here at one o'clock and thank you to everybody and our presenters. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful lunch. Um, it is um, a pleasure to be back with you all this afternoon. Um, my name is Monica Lemon. I am coming from the Duke School of Medicine um, where I am an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Population Health Sciences and also serve as the Associate Dean for Scientific Integrity. Let's see how we do this afternoon with slide advancement. Excellent. Um, so I am delighted to um, be joined by a stellar panel today to talk about key considerations for endpoint selection. And we have a few objectives, um, which are pretty lofty. We'll talk through endpoint types and key aspects of selection for neonatal conditioning, uh, conditions, including the timing of outcome measurement and how we in, their interpretability, reliability, and validity. We will consider how feasibility with respect to timing costs and other burdens may impact how we select endpoints. And we'll consider the clinical importance of endpoints to various stakeholders, including patients and families. Our panelists in this session are Keith Barrington, a neonatologist and clinical researcher at St. Justine University Health Center in Montreal, and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Montreal. We have Ar Ashley Darcy Mahoney, a tenured professor of nursing and the director of infant research at GW, GW's Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disorders Institute and a neonatal nurse practitioner with pediatrics. We have Janine Cross, an assistant professor at Howard University School of Social Work, Deb DeSenza, the founder of Creamy World and Crystal Ball Health and co-founder of the Alliance for Black NICU Families. Etsy Pilon, the executive director of Hope for HIE. Daniel Fuentes, director of medical affairs and chair of the grants committee for KAC USA. And Naomi Noble, associate director of rare disease measurement science at the Division of Clinical Outcome Assessment. Office of Drug Evaluation Science, Office of New Drugs, Center for Drug Evaluation Research, and the US FDA. Happy to get through all those acronyms. Okay. Um, as in the previous session, we um, audience members are encouraged to submit questions using Slido. Um, the login details are on the screen again, if, if you need them. And um, in this session, we'll be um, accepting questions exclusively through Slido, um, rather than using mics as well for those who are here in person. Um, to start this discussion, we'll be giving each of our panelists an opportunity to provide initial remarks. And first, we'll hear from Keith Barrington. Keith. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, uh, in addition to the, uh, to, to the things that were mentioned uh, in the introduction, I'm also the father of an extremely preterm uh, little girl who was born uh, nearly 18 years ago, now 24 weeks, and uh, is uh, is at college currently. Um, and I, I don't want to um, be repetitive because I didn't know exactly what people would be saying this morning, but obviously outcomes need to be meaningful and measurable. And I think they need to be meaningful for the individual and for parents, for society as a whole, whereas the outcomes that we're currently measuring in many trials are, are meaningful mostly for physicians and for the care and for caregivers rather than for the parents. 
Um, and I think uh, we've already mentioned very briefly about composite outcomes, and I think composite outcomes are a huge problem in, in research generally, um, because they should, I, I believe, include components which are of equal importance, or at least, or in some way, prioritize those components. And the outcomes that we're currently measuring, such as death or NDI, death or BPD, don't do either of those things. They ni the death is obviously not equivalent to being in oxygen at 36 weeks, um, but the way that we analyze the, uh, the, the trials, um, there are now several ways, including the pocock win ratio um, uh, method that was mentioned earlier, for prioritizing the parts, the components of composite outcomes that we should really do. And the example that I want to go back, and I, again, this has been talked about a little um, in, or, already, the lung damage is very common. It's uh, had long-term consequences. And it's usually defined by respiratory support, which persists as you get near to term, almost always oxygen respiratory support at 36 weeks. But each time the definition of a BPD has been adjusted, it's been based on a correlation with a longer term respiratory morbidity. Every single one of the new definitions has, has been presented as being a good or better predictor of the long term respiratory morbidity. But why don't we just measure that longer term respiratory morbidity instead of uh, and um, acknowledge that BPD is an interim, a surrogate outcome. Um, and although, as it's been mentioned, the measuring outcomes at two years of age, for example, um, is more expensive. In fact, certainly in Canada, all of our babies come back, uh, at least 96% of them actually, actually do come back. They're all invited to come back at two years of age anyway. And the actual additional cost of measuring respiratory outcomes at two years of age compared to what's currently being done is actually really very small. So we actually asked parents what outcomes measured to them. This has just been published in Act Pediatrica. It was already mentioned before. There's um, uh, nearly 300 parents who were, were questioned. And um, we asked them um, what outcomes were important to them. And nearly half of them mentioned respiratory outcomes. And none of them, as was mentioned, either talked about the diagnosis of BPD or whether or not the kid was in oxygen at 36 weeks. So they either didn't know or they didn't care. And this is a, a uh, the table from that publication, and the, the short and just from that table, the short term pulmonary outcomes, which were of importance to parents, which reflect lung injury, were actually not being on oxygen as they got close to being discharged, but being on oxygen at the time of discharge or being retained in hospital for longer because the kid was still on oxygen. That is the duration of oxygen use after term were two outcomes which were important to, to the, those parents. As I say, none of them mentioned being on oxygen at 36 weeks. The longer term outcomes of importance are mentioned there. And in fact, some of those things have been recorded and published in various different um, uh, studies in the past, but many of them haven't, such as feeding difficulties and exercise limitation has really almost never been um, published in any of the outcome studies um, of long-term outcomes. And the, the big uh, problem with this to me is that BPD is actually, when you look in randomized controlled trials where BPD has been an outcome, in those few that sort of small subgroup of studies, which has also reported longer term outcomes, there's actually very little correlation between a diagnosis of BPD or the, the impact of an intervention on a diagnosis of BPD and the impact of that intervention on longer term outcomes. For example, the, um, the late surfactant studies, Tolsurf and the, the study from uh, Christopher Rosé in, in France, Neither of them showed a change in BPD, but they both showed some improvement in longer term pulmonary outcomes, which are in that list of things that parents considered to be uh, important. And for the uh, and in the same way, in the, the opposite direction, if you look at all of the studies of steroids for BPD, all of those that show a decrease in BPD that have also followed the kids longer and reported their outcomes are long term, none of them show that longer term pulmonary function is improved, even though the kids have less BPD, because you're reducing inflammation acutely and reducing oxygen requir requirements um, during the hospitalization, it doesn't mean that you're actually making the lungs of these kids any better by giving them steroids. So I, I think there's a big, for, for, to me, it's a huge concern that many of the studies that we're relying on to decide which therapies to give to reduce, try and reduce lung damage 
have actually never been shown to improve um, uh, lung damage in the longer term in terms of clinically important outcomes that are of importance to parents. So I think that the we, sh we should be um, looking more closely at this. We're actually in, in this uh, Parent Voices project that I'm involved with, with some of the follow-up people across Canada. We're trying to construct a, an, a, an, a long-term outcome variable alongside with, with parents, um, which reflects really the clinical impacts of lung damage, which could be done at two years of age. And as I say, it's actually the additional cost in addition to other um, uh, outcomes that we're already collecting is actually quite low. Um, and in fact, the short-term outcomes which should be collected, I think we should probably abandon BPD at 36 weeks and look at other things which are actually of importance to parents. Thank you, Keith. Next up, we have Ashley Darcy Mahoney. Ashley. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. So I'm actually going to talk here about a perspective of nursing and the perspective of a bedside nurse. <laughs> yeah, I think it's working on it. The perspective of the bedside nurse. Um, as we think about clinical training. One. <laughs> Sorry. coming with a new one. Can you hear me now? She's going to turn it on in the back. All right, let's try that again. Uh, the best laid plans here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to come at this from uh, a nursing perspective today. Um, and specifically, really thinking about where the bedside nurse plays into these key considerations of neonatal outcomes. Um, and many years ago, about 15 years ago now, I actually was a bedside nurse collecting data for Barbara Schmidt's study in the COT trial. Um, up in Philadelphia. And so um, having had the sort of bedside nurse experience and then living now as a, as a researcher, really trying to understand what role the people that are collecting your data have in the papers that we're reading to make these decisions is incredibly important to think about. What are the outcomes uh, that are needed? I think are also important to understand really how can we collect data well with high fidelity and with as much sort of reliability as we can. That's asking a lot of a person, I'm gonna speak from the nurse perspective right now, that's already doing quite a bit at the bedside. Not only is that person caring for families, charting an abundance of their time, and also trying to care for families, um, adding on the collection of really robust RCTs and how they collect that data is a gigantic time suck, right? It's a really gigantic time, um, time that we, obviously have minimal, um, minimal of. The other thing to think about, I think, is that um, patient assignments and sort of patient acuity doesn't change if a nurse has these trials that they're part of, um, which I think, at least from the U.S. perspective, is something to consider as we're thinking about how time-intensive or labor-intensive that data collection might be. So I think that's, that's the sort of first thing I'd like to talk about. As we think about the aims of the study, does the team that's collecting that data really understand what the endpoints are? Do they understand exactly what uh, the, the researchers are trying to do and how can they then get that information across to families? What often happens is the PI or the research assistants or research associates that are coming to consent families will do a wonderful job explaining absolutely everything in the best possible way to families. Families will nod, They'll listen, they'll take the paper, they'll say, thank you, we'll think about it. The person then leaves and they look at the nurse and they say, well, what would you do? All the time. And so to ensure that that clinician at the bedside knows what's happening, knows why this is important and what are the endpoints to really be able to get that across to families is important. And what families are really asking is, is this, would this help my baby? Would this help future babies? 
not so much as like, would I do it for my own child? But if you were me, would this be something that you would take part of? Because this is important to either the outcomes of my kid or kids as a whole. I think that's what parents are often asking. So can we ensure that the person that's that direct contact point with the families and with the patient knows exactly what it is the study's trying to collect and what those key measurements are? We heard a lot today about the sort of composite measures. Can we ensure that we break that information down such that everybody on that team understands exactly what we're trying to collect? Uh, I'm not sure that we do as good of a job of that as we could right now. Um, and then I think the last point that I will um, bring up is, besides the NICU nurse involved in these long-term outcomes, are we asking community health nurses, the ones that see these patients in schools, the ones that are managing their asthma as school nurses, are we asking them any of these long-term outcome questions? As Keith was sort of just alluding to, these are what parents really want, and are we really bringing in those community partners, the people that are managing our post-BPD kids with respiratory differences when they're in school age, are we really getting at what parents need and want as some of these outcome trials? Um, and then what about our pediatric colleagues that are worried about readmitting a lot of our patients and making sure that we understand what uh, readmission rates could be part of these long-term data um, and long-term outcomes? So I think those are the sort of big points that I'll highlight now, and we'll certainly have a robust discussion at the end. Thank you so much, Ashley. Next, we have Janine Cross. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I was half anticipating to have the same problem you had, but I don't. Um, but welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is uh, Janine Cross, as you know. Um, I'm going to also talk about this from a different angle, and it's going to be from the angle of social work. Um, what I don't think was mentioned is that I used to work in a hospital in the NICU for about 15 years. And so what I think is very important is to include um, the voice of nursing as well as social work when you're designing your studies and conceptualizing what is clinically meaningful. My question is, you know, what's clinically meaningful and to whom? and to making sure that we're getting the voice of the patient, an inclusive voice of the patient. And I think there needs to be more steps that occur well before the, the designing of the clinical trial even begins. What work are you doing as a provider, as a researcher, to develop those relationships with the populations in which you are actually engaging with the research for? Um, there was a discussion earlier about partnering with, with caregivers and patients and populations. But I think there needs to be more engagement to really understand why there are certain things that are clinically meaningful. Um, morbidity was discussed. Mortality was discussed. Um, earlier, there was also discussions about disability. Um, but from a social work standpoint, what I get, what I'm concerned about when I hear about outcomes of disability, is you know, are we are we talking about a special needs child, and how does this increase child maltreatment concerns for parents post discharge? Um, and, and what are we doing to understand that? And do we do a good enough job understanding the context? So there's having a child with special needs. And if that may be an outcome that you're, you're examining, it's different when you have a special needs child. We're in also including socioeconomic status. When we're talking about um, single parents, parents who may have multiple children at home that have other type of health conditions that they're contending with. Cause we know that when parents have high risk children, there's um, um, good chance that they have other children at home that are also high risk. And so really understanding that. Um, I know we talk about oftentimes gold standard being objective measures, but I also look at subjective measure, measures and secondary measures because that oftentimes helps us include the voice of parents and caregivers in terms of the studies and what they're reporting in terms of what they're seeing, whether they, these are short-term or long-term. So I would like to see any effort that does more to include patients and, and again, the representation of all groups um, based on um, socioeconomic status, race, religion. Really, when we're designing these studies and want to know what these clinical outcomes are, we need to measure, again, who. Um, Who's, who gets to say what's clinically meaningful and to whom, and to understand that. Um, I would like to also talk about, you know, um, including nursing. I do see nurses are at the bedside. 
um, as well as social workers. And oftentimes, even though we um, include patient, um, I think they said patient organizations, um, you really reach out to them to get understanding. Um, I like to include more patients, directly word of mouth, more grassroots efforts, you know, town hall discussions, going into the communities, developing those relationships. When you're meeting a patient or family at the bedside for the first time and you're asking them to enroll in a study and they do not know who you are and you've not developed any relationships outside of the hospital, um, again, more community meetings to really discuss research, really talk about concepts of research with the community so that they understand when you approach them at the bedside and you talk about what the endpoints and the outcomes are and what's significant to them, you have a better idea, again, at the time of the conceptualization of the research design. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, now we'll hear from Deb Desenza. Good afternoon. I'm Deb Desenza, and I'm speaking from the parent perspective, but also as someone that's very involved in this area. This is very personal to me, not only as a mother of a child that was born at 30 weeks almost 20 years ago, but as someone that was born prematurely in 1967 at 36 weeks, there was no NICU, there was nothing. I just survived, but I still see the ramifications today. I also look back to my brothers who were adopted in 1964. They were premature. I still see the ramifications today. 1963, as you all may recall, is the year that Patrick Kennedy died of respiratory distress syndrome. 1963 was also the year that my older brother, David Aaron, born and died prematurely. Prematurity runs through my generations of my family. I look at my daughter now and I'm grateful for her. I'm lucky she came home, but there are after effects, a scatter shock effect across the generations. And she will live out those outcomes even now. Becky was that outlier in the NICU. She was the child that actually did really well at birth. The tiny little kitten cry. We were very fortunate. 38 days later, we came home on oxygen and monitor a whole team of specialists. She ran back into the, NICU, into the PEDS unit five days later. We were up and down, went home on full-time oxygen. And months later, we're finally working through some of the specialists. It was a mess, not only medically, but also developmentally. At bedside, I said to myself, and I said to the doctors, "What will she walk? Will she talk? Is this going to be okay? What's happening? I want every bit of eyes on her. And the people that listen to me, nurses, social worker. I kept talking about it. The pediatrician, when you leave the NICU, you supposedly leave it behind, but it comes with you. You have to remember that. The pediatricians, and I apologize to anyone in here that's a pediatrician, but the pediatricians do no longer do a NICU rotation, and many of them have other interests. So they don't look at this patient coming in as a former NICU patient. They see it as a full-term baby at this point. Well, we all know that that's not the case. So we have to think about those outcomes and how we help those families in the communities, like the school nurse, like the public health nurse through the health department. Those were the folks that helped us through our journey. Autism at six years old in kindergarten, because I spoke up. Early intervention that didn't happen until she was 18 months old, because I spoke up. She did not qualify. At in third grade, it was ADHD because I vocally told and repeated to the pediatrician, we are not leaving. We are talking about ADHD. Then I kept talking to everybody about her walking gait for years. Almost a decade later, shortly after we got her through a major feeding issue at 12, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy with spasticity in a doctor's office at 13 and a half six months after her bat mitzvah, that's not a good outcome to me. And my child knew at eight years old, something was wrong and was afraid to tell me. I went through multiple specialists. So all the things that we're doing in the NICU, if we're not looking at long-term outcomes, 
What are we doing? I'm working on a project called Premie Crystal Ball. It's supposed to do many different things. It's supposed to help with the outcomes across the lifespan. It's supposed to equalize access to clinical trials, to medications, to other services, and to learn from one another because representation matters a million percent. We have to do better by this population. We have to do much better by them. And the long-term outcomes, I have to tell you, I speak to former premature babies all the time, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. I have two at least that are going, one went through a lung transplant, another one's about to go through one, multiple hospitalizations, and another gentleman is gonna be heading toward his second kidney transplant. We got a lot of work to do. I look forward to talking with you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Now we'll hear from Betsy Pilon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm really um, grateful for the opportunity to elevate the lived experiences of the HIE community. Um, I have a son, Max, who actually is turning 11 next month, and that's how I joined this club. <laughs> um, he was my first child, uh, and he stopped moving when I was 37 weeks pregnant. I had a very uneventful, normal first pregnancy from all measurement um, and was not at any you know, risk factors for having any adverse outcomes. Um, and certainly had never heard of HIE um, and delivered into our local community hospital. Um, I actually have a background in marketing communication and worked for the health system that I delivered into. Um, so I was very comfortable with the team. Um, and when Max uh, came out by emergency C-section, um, you know, all hands on deck, and, um, you know, they told us that he needed to be consented into um, brain cooling, which as a new parent in a very um, emergency situation sounds like science fiction. So um, I'll get into a little bit of, you know, the evolution and, um, you know, the, the gratefulness I have at the families that opted into something that just sounds very strange to be effective. Um, but he was transferred to uh, the main campus of the health system at the high level NICU. Um, and we went through a course of about three weeks of our experience. Um, he was extremely, um, you know, ill um, and, and needed a lot of interventions the first 24 to 48 hours. Um, he was bolused, ironically, with uh, phenobarb, I believe, in the um, shortly after he was born when they were doing the assessment, um, although we had no noted clinical seizures. So really interesting from Janet's um, work and experience earlier um, to, you know, to understand and, and see the science evolve in that area as well over the past um, decade plus. Um, and so, you know, understanding that as we, you know, started going through the NICU, um, a lot of questions came up of, you know, what happened and um, what, you know, what could this mean? We had our, you know, the, the clinical, um, you know, measurements of getting an MRI and what that looked like, um, you know, and the, the information communicated to us about the potential outcomes that we would be looking at. But with HIE, it's very difficult many times to um, give a, a, a great prognosis of, you know, of, of accuracy. Um, and so, you know, as we went to discharge and I um, asked for, and as someone that has uh, developed a lot of patient education materials for the health system, asked uh, for resources to be connected to, and they didn't have any. So um, that was, a, you know, a, a moment um, of, of being a little frustrated and then looking to find community because, um, you know, I was, we were, my husband and I were uh, kind of escalated into this um, period of unknown and needed to find some sort of framework uh, to work from. So I ended up finding a couple of parents online who were blogging about HIE and um, had connected me to a support group called Hope for HIE, the Facebook group at the time. There were about 300 families connected all over the world and everyone had a similar story of feeling very isolated, having, you know, most of us have full-term babies and a sea of preemies being told that your child is in the most critical pod and, um, you know, requiring so much, um, you know, intervention. Um, and then not having any sort of educational information or a community to really um, dig into um, for that longitudinal support. So um, I was one of um, several parents that came together to develop the organizational side of it and grow it out and um, seeing the need, first and foremost, for peer support um, through a very uh, wide range. Um, I, I don't have to tell you if you're in this field, 
um, the complexity and nuance that HIE brings um, and the very, very wide variety of outcomes and impacts that many cannot be measured until much later in childhood. Um, so for, for that, you know, we, um, you know, and I'll say the past 11 years, it's been really incredible to see the advancement. Max was born at a time that, you know, we knew that the, the trial data came out for cooling um, and he was benefiting and it was just becoming standard of care. And then to see it escalate over the past, you know, almost 11 years is really incredible, but it remains the one treatment that we have. So there is definitely significant need. Um, and when we talk about death and disability, um, obviously those measures are incredibly important to our families. Um, and with everything with HIE, it's all about nuance and context. Um, so, you know, our families have a wide variety of what they value. Um, some, you know, would make very different choices when faced with similar situations, whether to continue support or to withdraw care. Um, someone might be more comfortable with one outcome versus another. Um, and so there's just a lot of that complexity within this, which, you know, is not discouraging. I think it just needs to be, um, you know, I, I think when we talk about partnering, um, it's, it's so important to understand that and figure out what are the key themes that can um, come up. So from, you know, our family perspectives of looking at these different buckets of, um, of measures of, along the time frame, you have, of course, the initial neonatal measures, but what can we look at that's really important to families around the six-month mark, the two-year mark, into childhood and beyond, um, and giving weight to those accordingly um, and making sure that people understand that this is, these are the impacts, you know? So Max, you know, always the question is, how is he doing today? You know, Max had a moderate, I was told moderate uh, brain injury to three parts of his brain. And he was at risk for cerebral palsy and cognitive challenges and all of that. Um, and so, you know, he has mild spastic diplegia. He has a mild vision impairment. Um, he developed epilepsy at age eight, which was a real shocker to us. Um, and that, you know, took a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, uh, we were lucky to have support and families that had gone through that before that I knew that outcome was possible. Um, so I was able, thankfully, to get great care for him right away. Um, but that is something that, you know, is not necessarily considered when we're looking at those long-term outcomes and that, I mean, I will say over CP, over anything else, our family's epilepsy is the boogeyman. It is the thing that keeps our families up at night. It is something that um, is just, you know, uh, you know, as I was speaking with Jenna earlier, it is just really hard to predict. You can't say your child's going to seize Friday at 3 PM. Um, you can only do your best to find the way to mitigate the seizures. Um, and it's scary. SUDAP is a terrifying possibility, and it is a possibility for many of our kids and a reality for many of our families. So, you know, just some thoughts, um, you know, when we look at what these um, long-term outcomes might be, we're talking about this, of what would be appropriate for less than a year, you know, feeding issues, high stress. And these are all impact areas that not only impact the child and the baby, but the whole family. Nothing is more stressful than trying to feed your baby and have it not go well or not being able to because they would aspirate on their feeds, right? Um, sleep longitudinally is an issue with our community. Um, and when babies and children don't sleep, parents don't sleep. And the chronic health conditions that can come out of that for, for parents um, you know, we see this every day. It's, it, it is so difficult to see that, that lived impact on the entire family. Um, and then, you know, irritability, neuro irritability for our, our kids in particular, those first six months, there's so many that struggle and there just aren't a lot of good solutions right now. Um, and then, you know, looking at, you know, again, seizures and epilepsy, infantile spasms, HIE is the second leading cause. And this is a horrific type of epilepsy. Um, and the other rare epilepsies, HIE is a significant cause of those. These are catastrophic, potentially um, developmentally regressive forms of epilepsies that impact our community. Um, and, you know, things that, again, if we can decrease that impact, you're going to improve the full quality of life. And that those are the important measures. Um, and, you know, we do have historicals so when we talk about partnering with patient advocacy organizations and individual families at the site level. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we're able to bring now, um, today we now are connecting over 8,500 families worldwide. So we grew from this little tiny group 
um, to now this really, really broad group and have been sharing information for the past 12 years. So we've been able to find a lot of these trends and take this, um, this unmet need expression from our families and elevate that. And, and look forward to doing that. We have families that participated in the original Toby trials. We have parents that participated in the HEAL study. They all have important perspectives on how that went and what can guide best practices moving forward. Um, and so, you know, we, I wanted to also touch on the multidisciplinary approach to this. So including nursing, including social work, also including neonatal therapists, including child life specialists. All of these people have really important insights to a lot of the discussion points that have been shared here on pain management, on the sensory system, and how those there could be measures that are studied to decrease impact that could start neurodevelopmentally very, very early on and lead to better outcomes. Um, so I think those are just my initial thoughts. On that. And I want to thank you for, um, you know, for this discussion and for, again, the inclusivity. Thank you, Betsy. And now we'll hear from Daniel Fuentes. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve on this panel and certainly humbled to be uh, sitting with these individuals here next to me. Um, so, you know, I've been fortunate also to, to work at a company that's uh, serving this particular patient population uh, for a number of years. You know, when we think about uh, the clinically me meaningful endpoints, uh, we think of much of what, you know, we've heard earlier today about um, endpoints that matter that, you know, can, can change the trajectory of someone's life. Um, but also from our perspective, we also look at, uh, well, if there's an opportunity to, to potentially investigate a new treatment or a new therapy is, well, what's the feasibility of doing that? And one of the challenges we encounter in measuring this efficacy is, is um, you know, variability uh, and, it, and more so variability in the standards of care. Uh, so, of course, many clinical trials, you know, over a long period of time, there might be temporal changes as as time goes on. And we know that uh, in neonatology, there's a rapid evolution sometimes, rapid uh, evolution cycles of, um, of you know, changes in practice. And, and so that can become a problem if a, if a study is uh, required to recruit a high number of uh, infants and, and it can take quite some time. Uh, another type of variability that we encounter perhaps, um, and, you know, we've um, had to face a couple of times is is the uh, between site variability that's present, you know, every day. And it's, you know, I think much of the discussion earlier today is, is consistent with, you know, our understanding. And that's that there, there's still a lot of opportunity for consensus uh, generation in neonatology. And there might be there, at any point in time, there are multiple reasonable care standards that are being utilized that can vary quite widely between centers that are in the same region, same city. Um, and uh, this can make it more difficult to measure efficacy, uh, challenges the ability to, to have the appropriate level of sensitivity. And to counter that, then you know, studies may need to increase in size, become longer in time. And of course, it just becomes an additional challenge for, for our, an organization like ours or and as well for the clinical community. And so it's um you know, it's just one point that's a little bit different. I think I think I agree with a lot of the um, specific points that have been brought up by the panel and earlier today as well. Um, so this is uh, we feel uh, an opportunity. I'm encouraged by the discussion um, earlier today uh, about uh, the the consort, the, the Delphi panels as well, and the work going into standardizing outcomes. I think that that's going to be particularly meaningful. Um, uh, also now considering, you know, secondly, I guess another point is that, uh, I think the neonatal space has experienced a lot of success in, in advancing care. And, um, you know, there's, you know, I think we were just talking in the elevator with, with, um, uh, on the way back from lunch, the gestational age that infants, you know, the discussion around a 22 week or today is very different than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, the, these patients, their morbidities aren't limited to just the NICU, of course, and they go on to have, you know, they have the whole life uh, ahead of them. And so it's increasingly important for us to also measure and understand, you know, the, the decision that's made on that first day of life, potentially in some cases, the impact that that has, you know, once the baby's discharged four months later, weeks later, whatever it may be, 
the rest of their life. And uh, it's there's an opportunity there potentially to have a tremendous impact on, of course, the individual, the family, as well as society as a whole. Um, so that's uh, what I wanted to share today. Thank you, Daniel. And now we'll hear from Naomi Noble. So hello, everyone. I'm Naomi Noble, and it is a, it's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here. I specialize in the measurement uh, of rare diseases. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist by training, and I tend to work in the rare disease space and in pediatric indications. And so you may be wondering, like, why did they ask you? <laughs> this isn't, you know, we're talking about neonatology. This isn't like a rare disease. This is, um, you know, just a function of being a, a human being. Um, but it, it's very clear that in neonatology, much of what we're learning about the measurement of rare diseases, especially pediatric rare diseases, um, could help to benefit uh, neonatology trials potentially. And as we're on this panel here to talk about efficacy endpoints and, and you know, how we could do this in a different way, um, I'd just like to share a few reflections from the rare disease world, um, at least from the perspective, perspective as, a, as a regulator. And one is, and this is a point that's been echoed by almost every single person sitting here, I think, is that um, measuring what matters to patients is a critical part of uh, measuring outcomes and endpoints in clinical trials. It's very clear uh, to us, uh, at the FDA at least, that patient advocacy groups are uh, eager, are very willing to be collaborators, not just in the selection of outcomes that matter, but also as collaborators uh, for the whole of the drug development life cycle. And so I often hear from patient advocates who say, well, you know, you know, this pharma company just came to us to help us salvage their trial. They never came to us to say, what outcomes matter to you? Or are we measuring this in a way that makes sense? Is this even feasible? You know, to the, to the questions that our nursing colleagues and our social work colleagues raised as well earlier too. And so one of the learnings, certainly from the rare disease space, is engaging patient advocacy groups as proper partners and collaborators in the drug development process and integrating perspectives for measuring what matters. A second point to offer is um, a theme I think we heard throughout the morning and I'm sure we'll continue to hear in this space as well is, is heterogeneous outcomes. It's incredibly difficult to measure in an efficient, um, focused way you know, that list of maybe what do we see earlier, 12 things, or maybe, you know, the 15 top important things that are um, critical in, in the neonatal space. So um, how do we measure um, with, with validity and reliability um, and precision these outcomes that are so important from the clinician's perspective, from the caregiver's perspective? You know, we have um, now, in fact, the benefit of asking uh, adults who are themselves preemies, potentially, uh, what outcomes they see in their lives as well. And potentially, too, some of uh, identifying outcomes that matter may be a, a function of translation. Right. As, as clinical experts, we use our medical language, and sometimes that is wholly unintelligible to the rest of the world. And potentially parents will speak in terms of um, the impacts that matter, the, the functional adaptations that matter. We heard about feeding, um, and, and feeding is something that matters. Maybe our clinical experts won't use that terminology, but we'll use something else. And so sometimes when I hear clinical experts saying, well, you know, parents didn't mention this when we asked them what was important. What I am also hearing is maybe parents use different language. And that's okay. The third piece I'll offer, and I'll keep this brief because I think we have amazing people here. And I know Monica's prepared some great questions and the, and the, the public has great questions as well. Is that um, we need to open the door of possibility on measurement uh, from uh, maybe the classic approaches that have been used previously in neonatal trials. Uh, certainly in the rare disease space, we are learning, and we learn almost every single day, that continuous outcomes uh, set us all up for success in terms of identifying um, effective treatments and, and impacts that matter. 
it was mentioned earlier today about you know this question of dichotomizing outcomes you know this dichotomizing disability are you, you know, do you have a disability or not um you know speaking as a pediatric neuropsychologist we know that um not all of our tests are that great at identifying either disability quote unquote disability whatever exactly that is um you know, at, at very young ages, we know that some of our assessments aren't great predictors of future outcomes. And so knowing this, knowing that um, the idea of chopping up the ecology, chopping up the data um, may not necessarily set us up for success either to detect effects that are actually there, uh, to miss, we could potentially miss the nuance of what caregivers or patients or even clinical experts are saying that they're seeing. And so looking at continuous outcomes um, may likely set us all up for um, advancing the science and advancing treatments uh, for kids that need them. And so with that too, I'll just say, it's the, uh, you know, in the regulatory space, we are looking at the totality of evidence, right? We are looking at the, essentially the evidence ecosystem. And one last learning I'll share from the rare disease space is that there are other methods of data collection that can also be done in a rigorous and standardized way outside of our classic quantitative measurements and layering in something uh, like a, a an exit interview, a qualitative semi-structured exit interview at the end of a clinical trial uh, with caregivers and also potentially with the clinical experts involved to ask, you know, what have you seen change? Um, what's happening right now can also be part of that totality of evidence. And um, that's kind of supportive data that can be collected along the way, again, may just help um, illustrate and demonstrate the nuances of outcomes that we're seeing, and, and again, help us detect um, and advance the science here. All right, so I'll leave it at that and turn it over to you, Monica. Thank you so much, Naomi, and just thank you to all of our panelists for those opening remarks. So we are gonna transition now to some discussion questions. And um, in addition to, to taking um, as many as we can from the audience, um, we've also asked the panelists to think about a few key questions. And I'd love to open with how each of you think about the factors that are most important to consider as we are considering efficacy endpoints. And I'll just invite uh, you all to speak on that um, as you see fit. We don't have to go in order. Yeah. So when I talk about the survival of an infant, whether it be premature, HIE, or any other condition in the NICU, parents are looking at survivability, but they're also worried about disability. And they're worried about what life will be like at home if they make it home. And if they do, they really do. They're like, well, is it going to be temporary? Like we were told Becky was coming home on oxygen. Okay, this is going to be temporary. Okay, this part's going to be temporary. And then just things kind of lengthened out from there. Um, parents, I mean, you've got to remember that families are desperately trying to do the normal. They want to have the birthday parties. They want to have their child go to school. They want their child to have friends. These are very normal things but they're not necessarily normal in the communities that we're in. And it looks different. It definitely is different. Um, I think it's really important to have honest conversations, especially, and why do we have a pediatric neuropsychologist? Because all of us patients, families end up going to one at one point. And I refer parents all the time to pediatric neuropsychologists. It's common, it's very common. So um, we got to think about the long-term. And when I say, when that baby goes home, think about the fact that there needs to be supports in the community for that child. Early intervention is one, child find is another, special education, these are great things, the, community, the health department. But if that information isn't on the discharge paperwork or it's not even discussed in the NICU at all, that family is swimming, trying to find information. And if the family doesn't have the privilege that I did and access to a great health plan and other things, if they don't have that and I was still swimming trying to find resources, guess what? Highly unlikely they're going to get the help they need, especially in the underrepresented populations. So we have to remember that. If, if many of us are trying to find, and I deal with a lot of these families, if I'm, we're trying to find that information or, 
or look up symptoms or anything else, trying to talk to a pediatrician who's not listening and doesn't really know, probably not going to happen. Think about how many patients have been treated over the decades, where they're at right now. A lot of undiagnosed patients. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'll add to this. I, I find that oftentimes when, and I'm, I believe many of you too, when you talk to families, one of the first things they say is, when is my baby going home? And how soon can they go home? And if you, if you, if you have a conversation about doing research, measuring anything that could potentially help their baby go home, um, they're, they're, they're going to sign up for it. They're going to want, they want the opportunity to improve outcomes and to improve any chances. And I, I oftentimes as a social worker have sat in many family meetings. And one of the things that is most exasperating for families is to have an, have a doctor attending come one service for three weeks and they say, I'm going to start this medication because I think this is going to help improve. Um, um, it'll decrease the chance, the, the length of time your baby may be on the vent. We know the research is saying this about this medication and it improves outcomes. And then another attending will come on right after and say, yeah, I dc would all those medications. And when I asked the attending, why did you do that? And they said, oh, because it's not safe long term or there's concerns about the safety, or there's concerns about other side effects long-term. So not understanding this, of course, I went back to the original attending. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, the other doctor said that they're concerned and the family wants the medication back on because the other attending said it was might increase the chances of the baby going home earlier because the baby could probably be, be weaned off the vent. And then that attending said, well, that study was when the dose is at this amount and for at least six months. I'm not putting the dose that high and I'm not implying that it's going to be that long either. I'm like, well, are you talking to each other? <laughs> and are you, are you on the same page with the outcome and the interpretation of those outcomes? Because the family is exasperated and they were they had their hopes up that the medication that the other doctor prescribed may potentially get the baby home quicker. And then, you know, and and two two completely opposite um, opinions and interpretation of the research related to a medication. And so um, that that had been my experience. And um, the par the parents wanted that medication on and any chance that that baby may go home earlier. Thank you. I'd like to dovetail a little bit on that and um, go back to, I think, a little bit of the original question of measuring efficacy. Um, and just thinking, it just brought up the thought that for a lot of our families, our kids are actually getting discharged sooner, I think, than ever before. But a lot of times that takes out the intensive need for interventions that can happen in the NICU, especially for swallowing and feeding, that um, do not then creates a gap if they come home and they could potentially build skills earlier on and carry those through to not necessarily have to have, you know, a G tube or something like that. So I think the, the balance for that is also that in a, what is the appropriate length of stay? What is the appropriate intervention in that acute care setting that could set the child up for a long-term success with an area? And I think that's an area of focus and measurement that we currently don't have either. So just another call to action. That dovetails really nicely with some questions we're getting from the audience around clinical meaningfulness and how, and specifically if we can talk together and think about outcomes that are clinically meaningful to the communities you serve in hospital, um, potential, you know, at the 36 to 40 week mark, what are things that um, are important either in your own lived experience or in the communities that you work with? I'm happy to take this one at least to start. So I think one of the things when we talk about clinically meaningful, um, does coming off of TPN a couple of days earlier, is that clinically meaningful? Is it clinically meaningful to be at PO feeding, full volume PO feeding five days earlier? Is it clinically meaningful to go home four days sooner than you might otherwise? And for different people, they might have different answers. And 
thinking about not only the clinically meaningful part to the baby, but also to the family. I know many of us clinicians in the room, we might say your baby's going to go home in a few days and those few days go by and the baby's not home. That is devastating for families and it feels exhausting. It tempers, uh, it tempers flare. And oftentimes relationships within the family are also really strained. And so while a couple days length of stay in the hospital may not feel clinically meaningful to me, it may be incredibly clinically meaningful to a family trying to get home for any number of reasons, both special like a birthday or some special holiday, or just frankly, to get back to their, their lives, their financial lives, their work lives. Um, and so I, wouldn't, I would say that as we think about this idea of clinically meaningful, really thinking that like, even if we are decreasing the length of stay, a shorter time than most of us might feel is that big of a deal. For most families, going home as soon as possible, for the most part, is a really big deal. Um, and thinking about you know, taking out an uh, ET tube is a really big deal. So clinically meaningful does have certainly a various perspectives for various participants. Um, but I do think we need to think about not only what that means for that individual patient, but what it means for the sort of family as a whole and how an infant uh, and changing the sort of or shortening the timeline of any number of the things that I just said might be really powerful for the family unit. I'll add to that as well. Um, I also think that, you know, progress clinically provides opportunity for the families to engage in cares for the infant and improves bonding between the mother and the infant as well, which we know improves neurodevelopmental, cognitive, cognitive um, long-term for the infant. And so, you know, being able to have that baby out the isolate, you know, earlier so that mom can begin to begin to learn um, cues, understand their baby's language and how their baby demonstrates what they need and giving nursing the opportunity to observe and work with that mother as she's caring or that caregiver as they're caring for that infant also is, it goes a long way in terms of preparing um, that particular caregiver um, for discharge and, and, it, and it gives them uh, opportunities to intervene and support, whether it's with feeding, um, giving a temperature, understanding when their baby's comfortable, not uncomfortable, um, and so forth. And to dovetail on that, mm -hmm. um, basically the parent, the mental health of the mother actually plays out mm -hmm. in terms of the neurodevelopmental income yeah. outcomes, if I understand it correctly. And so, um, you know, having that mother yeah. feel supported and the mother to bond with that child, as, as Janine had said, is a big deal. Um, that can affect everything. That is a clinically, that that to me is efficacy right there. That is that ability for that mother to be able to be a mother and also to have the equipment coming off. Again, is the ability to be a mother. I, I felt incredibly powerless touching a baby that had all this equipment. I felt like I wasn't her parent. This is a very common theme in the NICU across all families. So the sooner that equipment comes off, the better. That will improve that bond, that relationship. It will make everything much smoother. And I think a really good case study that we're seeing in HIE in particular um, that I am so pleased to see um, from my own experience of being told, do not touch your baby, just stand, you know, like while he's in cooling, it can exacerbate pain. Of course, like that's the last thing you want to hear as a new parent is that you could actually hurt your baby by touching them. Um, and now the studies that have been done and are, are ongoing um, are showing that, you know, certain babies can be held in cooling safely and maintaining temperature. Um, we can start feeds many times earlier than we ever thought were possible. Um, and so there is that, you know, these da data points that are coming out and showing that. And of course, like from the parent perspective, you know, we know like one of my favorite studies is from Alexa Craig in um, Maine Medical Center, where she actually measured the cortisol levels of mom and baby and was able to show those decreased when they were being held. So, um, you know, there is that meaningful data that that blends the needs of the parents and the needs um, clinically to to make sure that it is safe um, and that we're we're also able again to see what that impact could be for better outcomes. 
Thank you, Naomi. In in some ways, I feel like I'm speaking another language, <laughs> and it you know hearing your reflections as um, you know nurses, social workers, and parents, and then my reflections as a measurement nerd. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is a bit of a it is a bit of a different language. I think to the question of what is clinically meaningful change, um, sometimes it's almost like a setup. Sometimes stabilization, so not seeing change or like improvement or you know decline, just like holding steady, is sometimes a really meaningful outcome. And so um, I think as we as we consider that question, you know, it, uh, an old school term used to be minimally important difference. Um, FDA does not use that language anymore. We we talk about um, meaningful with inpatient change, but the you know the question of what is change that we can actually think is quote unquote real, right? It's something above and beyond measurement error. I think in our, our morning presentations, we heard that, you know, you can be the exact same clinician and look at the exact same data 24 hours later and come to a different conclusion because you're in a different frame of mind. And, you know, especially for um, this acute phase, right, where decisions have to be made very quickly and time is not on your side. Um, you know, what is the measurement error and can we look at outcomes and know that um, the shift, the improvement potentially is above and beyond measurement error um, so that we can actually say, yes, a change did occur. And then, you know, as regulators, we can make decisions on that. You know, if yes, I please. can just um, say a few words, the, um, one of the problems with answering, addressing these questions is that are all extremely broad. Um, and um, I think one of the, the, the most important factors to consider for measuring efficacy is that the outcomes need to be objective. But how objective they are is really also um, questionable. For example, you might think that length of hospitalization is objective because you can measure it in a number of days. But exactly when a patient goes home is very variable. In fact, in Canada, our lengths of stay are longer in general than they are in the USA because we are we are more reluctant to send babies home with oxygen and tube feeding and so on because we can we can get paid for the babies staying in the hospital. We don't have insurance companies trying to push us to to discharge patients. Mm -hmm. um, similarly. Um, uh, other things which you might think are objective, such as rehospitalization rates, that's also very dependent on exactly the environment the patient is in. My own daughter was not rehospitalized, but if she hadn't had two patient, two parents who are pediatricians, she almost certainly would have been rehospitalized. <laughs> and she actually had several courses of dexamethasone during her first year of life because of her upper airway problems. And so even that, uh, even things which you might think are objective, um, certainly, uh, uh, there's a subjective or a, a, a variability in those, depending on the environment that the, the patient is in. Um, the other one of the other things that um, I talked about, which is um, going home on oxygen, which I just mentioned, tends to be different between Canada and the U.S. And in fact, it's also different from family to family. There's a uh, Neil Leventhal, I think, is the one who, who did a study asking parents in the hospital whether or not they'd rather stay in hospital a, a couple, you know, uh, several more days and to be able to try and wean off the oxygen or, or go home on oxygen. And in the hospital, most of the parents said, oh, we'll stay a few more days to try and to avoid going home on oxygen. But then when she asked them afterwards, the parents who went home on oxygen said it really wasn't such a big deal. They wished they'd gone home earlier. Um, so the, a, a lot of the, those uh, variations between families and so on are things that we need to think about when we're trying to construct as objective outcomes as we possibly can for these studies. Thank you. It's so important. And I, um, your answer started to segue into how we think about longer term outcomes, outcomes after discharge. I wonder if other members of the panel would be willing to speak a bit to determining what's clinically meaningful in some of those longer time horizons. So I'd mentioned uh, our school nurse colleagues. I'll sort of invoke them again here because I think that that group of people is largely caring for our children with chronic illness all the time, whether it's asthma, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, all challenges that our preterm babies have. And so thinking 
farther out than the two years and the five-year mark, but thinking of when those kids enter school age and what are some of the both physical manifestations of prematurity and measuring those at the school level, utilizing our school nurses, I think is, and school data that we have could be very, very powerful. Uh, and then certainly our behavioral and, and mental health um, colleagues could certainly also speak to sort of those longer term outcomes. But those are the things that are really meaningful to families. What is their life going to be like when children go to school? And how do we measure those outcomes, whether it's IEPs, asthma plans, diabetes plans? Those are some ways that we can begin to objectively measure some of these things. Yeah, and adding to that point, I was um, thinking about how uh, seizure action plans for the epilepsy community seem, you know, fall right in with that as well. Um, you know, the, the behavior and social emotional impacts from um, neurodevelopment, um, definitely in that school age population. Again, neuropsychology um, is, I wish it was available more uh, readily for so many. There's a lot of disparity in that, but the, um, the impact of having that data. Um, and, you know, we talk about assessments. I thought it was so wonderful to talk about the limitations as well for some of the kids that just um, are more impacted, but might be very cognitively bright and are very cognitively bright. And I have seen this shift as well, where originally we focused very much on motor when I, you know, when I first became a parent and cerebral palsy, and now we're really focused on communication. And that there's researchers in neuropsychology as well. U of M has a great lab for this that are looking at what can we do to build an assessment that's appropriate to build in these really um, meaningful things and getting kids communicating earlier in whatever way they can. And that is a significant shift that we have seen that I think will continue to drive um, forward and change some of these things um, as we move, that's the intersection of the, you know, uh, the mobility aids and communication devices as we move forward too. And I'll add to that, that in terms of when you go into the elementary school setting, you can no longer have a developmental delay as a label from the heyday of the early intervention and child find areas in order to continue that individualized education plan, at least in the United States. Um, IEP, you have to have a diagnosis. And so you have an entire team coordinated around this. And what's so interesting to me is how well they all understand prematurity. So the OT, the PT, the social worker, the everybody, everyone, even the school principal, they all understand a lot more than I thought about that. And I assume it's the same thing with HIE as well. They're becoming very well versed. And I didn't expect that. Um, and so, you know, they're looking at certain things on Becky's discharge paperwork. They're looking at the different, the IFSP from early intervention. They're looking at all this and they, they're just reading right through it going, yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to start assuming certain things, which I had no idea. Yeah. The domain of birth history is absolutely something that is more widely. And, you know, and I love that we're having these conversations mm -hmm. because this is decreasing that gap that has often existed between the medical side and the educational side. Mm -hmm. And when those can cross over, we have again, better data to analyze and see how this holistically affects the child families and what supports can be implemented. Right. Because the IEPs actually detail out. I mean, I mean, in excruciating detail, probably to the point where you'd be in pain, but it really does detail out the supports in place. You could actually measure it with those, with those types of plans. And I'm sure you could do that across like the community health nurse, everybody. I mean, just everyone that's involved in the, after the NICU piece, so you could do early intervention. You could do all those things. You could also do the specialists that these parents follow up with as well, their records. You could, you could literally see how, what, how long it's taking for them to discharge from the cardiologist or from the pulmonologist or any other specialist mm -hmm. that could be useful. And I'll just add um, improved research partnerships mm -hmm. um, with all types of um, providers to improve those long-term data points, mm -hmm. such as your, your, your developmental follow-up clinics, your pediatricians, your Healthy Start programs, um, and all those other types of early intervention programs that have those long-term contacts uh, with, with, with um, caregivers to be able to ascertain um, long-term outcomes.
and let's make sure that the pockets of doesn't doesn't know enough about prematurity in the pediatrician community that we 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 close that gap because that's I mean the parents are very frustrated. So we we sort of spoke up here as if it was really easy to link birth <laughs> records and educational <laughs> records, um, and the difficulty in doing that, at least in the United States, is is not lost on me or I don't think any of us here. But the idea that we should be thinking about how to link birth records, perhaps Medicaid data and ICD-9-10 codes to our school educational data uh, and maybe even our Head Start, right? How do we link these really large data sets we have in the United States to get a holistic picture of what has happened to that child, birth through age eight perhaps, is actually a really good way to think about measuring outcomes. Those data sets have what a lot of what we're asking for and linking them requires us to understand the sort of regulatory, the FERPA HIPAA guidelines, and also making sure that we have these partnerships both at HHS and DOE, right? Department of Education and Health and Human Services to help us to link this at both maybe state and federal levels, but largely at the state level. Um, these are not easy things to do, right? <laughs> not, not at all. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, but they will help us to get a grasp on real outcomes um, that we can see for these kids. You know, I, I think while we're on the topic of talking about hard things and solving hard problems, one of the things I think that strikes probably everyone here is the critical need for long-term data and to in creative ways of measuring that data. That might be intention with timeliness, especially for therapeutic areas in which there's a, a, a real unmet urgent need. Can you speak a bit to how we should think about balancing All these kids, is it not? You know, what is that in selecting these and moving things forward? That is a something that I'm really grateful that people are tackling um, to, to identify that as a gap area and something that parents are very passionate about expressing as, as a key question that they will live with unanswered for sure for many of them. That's very true. And so, on the prematurity side, it's the same thing, but it's the late preterm infants. And for years, the March of Dimes talked about the late preterm infant, and I want my 39 weeks. And it's very true because there are a lot of babies that will they'll be like, oh, just a feeder and grower, they'll go home. Um, and next thing you know, the parents are on this medical journey and developmental journey that they didn't, didn't expect. when you have the entire focus on micro preemies or, you know, 30 weeks and below or whatever, you leave out an entire population that you're like, oh, just feeder grower. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, potential there. I think that could even be expanded. And this is one of my favorite points to talk about, which is the equity of yes. looking at all of NICU and the impact, yes. right? Like it's not just preemies, it's not just right. HIE. There are so many different reasons that a baby might be in the NICU mm -hmm. and what is that impact, but that takes us off topic. I know a little bit. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Maybe thinking about the RSV vaccine or the RS RSV oh, treatment yes. <laughs> is like a good perspective to answer this question. It's sort of timely right now too, as we're thinking about this, who should get it? When should they get it? 
How long should they get it for? Right? These are all questions that have like challenged us as we think about, as we thought about RSV treatment or our prophylactic RSV treatment. Uh, what age is the right age? How preemie is enough? All of those questions I think are, are really reasonable for, for this. Were you about to say something? Yeah, I was just um, going to, to sort of mention that um, every aspect of clinical research design is a compromise. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everything, sample size is always a compromise. Um, you always, uh, you'd like to have bigger studies, but you've got to be able to pay for them and actually complete them. And the the, the length of follow-up is all, also always going to be a compromise. I mean, we can't, you know, I think the most important outcome of clinical research of any clinical research is the quality of life and probably the best measure of whether or not an intervention is appropriate or not is to ask all of the research participants when they're on their deathbed did they have a good life or not? <laughs> and obviously you can't do that and we have to look at things which are sort of interim outcomes and at a reasonable age and I don't think you can come up with a general rule of how that compromise um, is going to be uh, is going to be developed for every particular intervention. It's going to be different. For example, for an RSV vaccine, we know that almost all dangerous RSV occurs in the first two years of life, so you can actually stop the follow-up at two years, probably, um, unless you want to look at what the impacts of having the RSV uh, vaccine on your long-term pulmonary function, in which case you're going to have to follow the kids for longer. So the, the compromise is really going to depend on the intervention and the mm -hmm. question that you're uh, that you're asking. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to mention, you know, in some of the discussion here and, and earlier today as well is reminds me a lot of uh, the adage of that uh, perfect can be the enemy of good in some in many cases. Um, you know, and and there are those uh, scenarios where maybe there's a legitimate concern or risk with a particular treatment or drug therapy where, you know, we, we do need to wait, we should wait for that long-term, uh, data before we, you know, say make that recommendation or, or, you know, the agency makes a decision on it. Um, but where, where, you know, where at least we feel good about where things are at, right. Then potentially then that's good enough to, to have progress in you know, in the immediate term, at least in, from a timeline perspective. So you're not putting off you know, some uh, a benefit there uh, for patients, you know, long term, you know, it seems like there are registries, of course, you know, there's, there's uh, for, for preterm infants, I don't know how well the, they track, you know, over a long period of time. Uh, but it seems like this is a very, you know, this is a distinct patient population. And it seems like, you know, there are some other examples of long term registries, it seems like, you know, that there is uh, certainly enough interest. Um, and, you know, over time, you know, you're not going to be able to improve things unless you can measure it, right? And then linking that data all the way through continuously seems like a, a great um, opportunity. I think the question of feasibility as well, right? It's uh, to your point about making compromises and sample size, right? There's the, the compromise of, you know, to what extent are we going to burden the study team and families and also get good data that we can use to make decisions on? And, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic was a very interesting time for clinical trial science, certainly. And um, it had a very unfortunate impact on some trials where it totally disrupted them. Um, you know, the families weren't able to cross national borders and um, participate in, in trials that they were in. However, it did also show us um, the possibility of, um, you know, remote assessment and looking at, uh, you know, the horizon of decentralized trials too. And so with that in mind, and also, you know, with the, the possibility of, um, you know, what we call in the regulatory space and digital health technology tools, you know, I, I just wonder to what extent could we bring some of these uh, newer approaches to measuring um, while we're still potentially or ideally measuring the same thing and also still measuring it well, but in a way that's feasible and sustainable uh, for everyone involved. And it potentially requires some creativity and also always a lot of hard work, uh, but may really be worth it in the end. I'm so glad you brought that up because a lot of the, um, you know, uh, studies that we are currently involved in, when we talk about, you know, the impact of the pandemic, um, and then also what comes up with um, families of, you know, being compliant with assessment and follow-up, 
Um, and, you know, another call for, you know, the role of a patient advocacy organization to um, to also partner with and being able, you know, we are the ones that communicate regularly with the population. We found this with the HEAL study. Um, the investigators reached out and said, hey, we have some stuff and we're not getting as much response from families. Can you help us? You know, and we have the majority of the families that were in that study are in our community. That is, you know, there was no communication before for them to get referred into our community. It just naturally happens because they're looking for support. But then we're able to help, you know, say, hey, this follow-up is coming up or this, the end of the study is come up, coming up. Have you checked in with your site investigator? And just having that extra, you know, um, layer and then also troubleshooting why, you know, there might not be that compliance and what are those barriers um, to doing that, you know, we're asking families to do four hour assessments like that for a lower income family, four hours, mm -hmm. hourly salary is, I mean, that is a significant burden to overcome and it has to be worth their while. So what can we use with these digital tools, telemedicine and all these things that, you know, can potentially flip. It's very um, exciting to see that a lot of that work and those questions um, are being asked and, and really problem solving. And Betsy, this is a gorgeous example of a patient advocacy group being a, a proper collaborator, yeah. right? Not just the, the ad hoc, can you get us patients, but like a real collaborator in the process of looking at the feasibility of the impact, the recruitment, the, the whole point of why are we doing the study and follow up, it's gorgeous. And it's so, it's so telling when you hear a success like that to then be asked to be a patient representative in a clinical trial that failed and they want to know why mm -hmm. after the fact it's like well, why am i here mm -hmm. and you know when mm -hmm. one of the things that we talked about the annual meeting for the international neonatal consortium was that you need to have more than just one recruiter involved for a clinical trial and that as janine mentioned the relationship is so important you, you're hearing different perspectives here about how you can bring people into clinical trials and make them successful. And you're hearing about how those same partners can help make it a, a great success all the way through without failure. So one of the questions coming in is around, and from a regulatory perspective right now, how are these types of community voices and being taken into consideration when developing endpoints. And so I'd love for folks to speak to experiences they've had. And if, if you don't have one to speak to an experience you'd like to have um, at the table um, when these endpoints are created. Well, I'll say that we're um, gratefully um, included in many different um, studies that are in various stages right now. And researchers are reaching out um, before even beginning to look at feasibility to include us, which has not happened before, obviously. Um, there was, well, one, historically, there wasn't an advocacy organization in HIE to exist until Hope for HIE existed. Um, but I think we're also seeing, and I would say that this is a great example of the partnership of, um, of the people that are convened today. Like FDA is making the commitment to say, if you're going to look at therapeutic development and there is a patient advocacy organization, you should be looking at engaging them. You should be looking at what those community members are and where they are and doing that before you begin any of this work to make sure that you're concurrently working on this and that is, it is what matters. I mean, those are there's that is the culture that is being created and we are seeing that now every day and the, the, the things that our families are a part of at the beginning of these processes, whether it's with an academic or industry situation, are able, we're able to source intentionally for diversity of experience, diversity across the many ways that it's um, defined, and make sure that we are getting those key insights from the beginning to help drive these things forward in meaningful ways. Um, one of my concerns is, are we, collect, are we collecting data on the groups that need it the most? Um, and are socioeconomic factors a barrier to long-term data collection on certain groups? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not sure that it is happening. Um, and are their voices represented in, at the table? Um, and I do think that it will require innovative ways in which we engage communities um, and do education. And this forum is wonderful, you know, but I feel like we're speaking to the choir here. 
but are we actually going out into the communities? Are we um, collaborating with, with churches, uh, uh, synagogues, um, um, different type of organizations of where going to communities where we're actually doing more education to certain groups about research and what it looks like, especially groups that have not benefited historically from research. And, and that's me saying it nicely. Yeah. Um, they're not going to trust you and they're not going to feel comfortable with you. They may not want to enroll and they will come to the nurses or the social worker and say, should I do this? Can I trust them? Um, and what is this going to mean for my baby? Um, and, you know, and those are those are valid concerns. And so I'm not sure we are actually, I, I want to say I'm positive that we are not engaging the, the, the populations that we need to be engaging in research. Mm -hmm. And I definitely wonder if we have enough data in terms of the long term. We don't. And are we, we telling them what happens after in a way that they can access, right? I mean, the journals are lovely. Uh, largely not open access, although the federally funded ones now are. But like if we're talking about moms, let's just say uh, of childbearing age, however you would like to define that today, most of them are not on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Most of them are probably on TikTok and Instagram. Mm -hmm. So seriously, are we using the trial data to make the information that we just found accessible to the families that were in our studies? And, and I'm not even joking when I say this, right? Knowing there's a something on the hill right now about these platforms, but really making information about the trials that the families enrolled in accessible to them in ways that they actually want to access that information. I and think I that's important. I will say that there are some really great case studies of that happening though. And it's, I think the, a lot of the studies in PCORI in particular have a focus on dissemination. And when you are involving parents in, in these trials in particular, um, you know, we're involved in the neonatal seizure registry. Um, and the amount of educational information that is created, um, you know, I've personally helped design some of them as well wow. with my background in, you know, marketing and communication because knowing what kind of language needs, you know, plain language and, and how that is and translation. Do we have it in Spanish? Do we have it in the most common languages? Mm -hmm. All of that to make it accessible is possible and it doesn't have to be expensive. You just have to be intentional about including it. Mm -hmm. So Premi World is a patient education company and I wrote the Premi Parent Survival Guide to the NICU. Parents walk into this experience and I'm sure this is HIE as well. You walk in like you did, you created the Hope for HIE organization because of it. You walk into it and you're like, I am not a doctor. I don't know anything. And then what if you're approached for a clinical trial? You've already been gobsmacked with a ton of information and a lot of lingo that you know nothing about. Patient education is very important and it has to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. It has to be personal. It has to look like them. Mm -hmm. To your question about... Um, you know, the regulatory perspective, <laughs> you know, Dr. Jerry Bear very nicely shared this morning the value of uh, the voice of the patient reports that we we rely on at FDA. Sometimes we have to rely on them because uh, drug developers, medical product developers haven't submitted any uh, voice of the patient information in their own submission materials. And so uh, as reviewing teams, trying to learn what's important to patients and families, um, as well as, of course, what's important to clinical experts and, and you know, mechanism of action and, and bringing all of that data together. It's sometimes it's the voice of the patient reports that are the only source of that information. And so they're so important. I feel a little uncool saying this because Instagram and TikTok are like so splashy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these reports really do matter. And it's sometimes it's really hard. You know, of course, people are asking, so FDA, how do you use this information? And, you know, we are trying to, to, to come back to the public with that answer. But sometimes it's really nuanced, you know. Um, but I can, th there's an example uh, in a dermatology indication, for example, where a reviewer used a voice of the patient report to understand seemingly divergent uh, findings on a co-primary endpoint. And so you really never know how it's going to be used. For me as a reviewer, um, I am trying to bring 
patients to life in front of me, not just data of outcomes, but like actual little kids running around or not running around. I would like to see what they look like um, to, to make them real, uh, to better understand you know, how these outcomes may be playing out. And it's the voice of the patient reports or sometimes the patient listening sessions that we have as well um, that make that, that possible. Uh, but it really is too on medical product developers to engage patient advocacy groups as research collaborators and bring that evidence to us as well. Thank you so much. I think all of you um, really have made this feel real to all of us. So thank you for taking the time to describe your experiences. And um, I'm looking forward to welcoming our next panel, um, Matt Lawn, and um, to to end the end today's session. So thank you all. Yeah. Well done. So, oh, there we go. Um, so thank you, Monica, for that. Uh, and the other panel members for a really wonderful session that we had over the last hour and a half. And it's my pleasure. I'm Matt Lawn, uh, and I am a, a neonatologist at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I'm here uh, to help moderate the next session. And I'm going to figure out how to actually send, do the next session um, in a minute here. There we go. So we're going to have some objectives. Uh, the entitle for the session four is novel approaches to measuring clinical benefit in neonatal clinical trials. And we'll have three presenters and three additional panelists who will discuss uh, the bullet points that are on, um, on the slide there. And we're going to start it off with um, Jenny Taylor. I'm going to read all the, uh, the presenters so in the, and, then, um, and then they'll just go thereafter. He was an assistant professor of the Division of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine at UNC followed by Kevin Hill, who's Professor of Pediatrics and Division Chief of Pediatric Cardiology at Duke, and then Claudia Pedroza, Professor of Pediatrics at the UT Health Medical School Center for Clinical Research and Evidence-Based Medicine. And then we'll hear a few remarks from uh, Diana Green, Director of uh, Office of Pediatric Therapeutics, Ken Walter Singh, uh, Executive Director of CPATH, INC, International Neonatal Consortium, and Susan Susie McCune, Vice President of Pediatrics and Clinical Pharmacology uh, for PPD. Uh, and so with that, uh, we will start with uh, Jenny. Thank you for the introduction, Matt. I'll go ahead and come up here to present. Um, so again, I'm Jenny Taylor. I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina. I'm a neonatologist there. I'm also a neonatal follow-up physician, meaning I see kids through two, kids, two years of age for developmental follow-up. And today, um, I am very grateful to be here to talk about the neonatal global rank score development and future applications. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so I'm going to really focus on preterm infants today, but uh, really want to recognize that there are broader implications um, and hope that you appreciate those too as I go through this talk. Um, so preterm infants face a lot of challenges. First is simply survival. Fortunately, um, with research and improvements in clinical care, survival has gotten better and better, even for the smallest and most preterm babies. And has, as has been discussed a lot today, um, it's very important to focus research on other outcomes um, that affect every body system for these infants. Um, to highlight just a couple, there's necrotizing enterocolitis, BPD, um, neurodevelopmental impairment, IVH, ROP. I'm glad length of stay was also discussed last um, session because that does have an impact on families. Um, this has been discussed a lot already too, but I'll hit the highlights. And that is that composite endpoints are frequently used in neonatal clinical trials. Um, this is from a systematic review done by the core outcomes in neonatology group from the UK, and just recognizing that in large clinical trials, 
um, over half of them do use composite endpoints. The most common are BPD or death, um, death or disability, disability, death or neck. And I, again, don't have to be too repetitive on these points, but there are limitations to composite endpoints. They assume uniform directionality of each component. Um, they rely on the assumption that relative clinical significance of each component be treated as equal, um, which for a lot of those composite endpoints I showed on the last slide, um, just death is not the same as BPD. I think we all realize that. Um, there's inconsistent definitions really across studies. And in some studies, there is an inadequate reporting. Um, I'm glad we've touched a little bit on this already um, in Dr. Smith's talk um, and Dr. Barrington's kind of discussion on other endpoints. And um, I will be talking about the global rank score methodology as well, Dr. Hill after me. Um, but neonatologists aren't alone in these issues. Um, composite endpoints are also used frequently in cardiovascular research because as research has improved outcomes and survival has improved, um, the ability to do just huge large-scale trials isn't feasible. And the clinical questions uh, that we face are more than just mortality questions. Um, so many cardiovascular trials do use statistical methods involving weighting or ranking. Um, I am gonna talk specifically about the global rank score. Um, and so the global rank score has been used in cardiovascular trials. We're um, going to talk today about the process for developing a neonatal global rank score and some of the potential benefits that have been seen um, in other adult trials. And Dr. Hill will talk about um, benefits in pediatric card cardiological trials, excuse me, um, our increased power, improved clinical relevance, and the ability to evaluate both efficacy and safety endpoints. Um, and just thinking back about um, some of the neonatal trials um, where there are limitation with composite endpoints. Um, this table is from the 2008 aggressive versus conservative phototherapy in extremely low birth weight infants trial. And here um, you can see that the composite or death of death or neurodevelopmental impairments, um, there was no significant difference, but there was a little bit of improvements um, in neurodevelopment alone in the aggressive phototherapy group. However, in a sub-analysis of small babies less than 650 grams, um, there was actually increased mortality. So again, just highlighting the need for um, endpoints that can account for um, more of these nuanced findings. And so now I'm really gonna step away from the background and our motivation for development of a neonatal global rank score and talk more about the process. Um, our aim was really to be broad in scope. And so though I've focused on prematurity, um, really think through careful content selection um, and use a modified Delphi consensus process approach um, so that some of the broad concepts um, we utilize in this method um, could provide framework for future global rank score development. And so content selection was done through a steering committee of neonatologists, clinical trialists, um, and just had one parent on our steering committee, but I'll go, go through how we um, really incorporated more parent voices and further steps um, and really appreciated a lot of the work that had already been done on core outcome sets. And you've heard a little bit about today, um, the core outcome sets in neonatology group. I mentioned the systematic review previously, um, but we used that as our initial step to review the 216 outcomes um, that they published in that systematic review and really just narrow it down um, from birth to two years old and took into account the consensus process work that had already been done using that systematic review and development in the core outcome set for, for neonates and really think about it from a slightly different perspective um, in the development of this global rank. 
or tool. And so we consolidate um, into 31 outcomes um, to be considered in our Delphi consensus process. So uh, a modified Delphi consensus process, just to orient you on what that is. Um, so we asked participants in a series of surveys uh, for each of those 31 outcomes, should this specific outcome be included in the neonatal global rank score? And we asked for comments on why or why not. For our medical group, we asked specifically, um, would you use this outcome definition? And I'll go on the next slide to talk about who was in our medical group. Um, and then in the next two surveys, that's subsequent surveys, we asked again, if this outcome did not meet pre-specified consensus criteria, um, we showed them how they'd answered previously. We showed them a short comment summary of what the key stakeholder groups said and asked them to reconsider whether or not um, this would be a helpful outcome to include in the global rank score. Um, in the second and third surveys, we also asked our participants to rank um, the outcomes that had already met consensus criteria by severity. Um, and then the final step is to review results in a consensus uh, teleconference to finalize the outcome selection and severity ranking. So a little bit more about our participants. We um, split into two groups to really try and target equal power in the process. And so our two groups were parents and other caregivers. Um, for our specific question, it really, really helped to approach parents who'd previously participated in research. Um, we had many parents who'd participated in a longitudinal co cohort study at the University of North Carolina and some who'd participated in um, randomized controlled trials. And so um, just as they started to take these surveys, um, had some insight into what we were asking and how things were being married, uh, being measured and um, what kind of impact it had on families um, who were involved in research. And then our medical group um, had researchers and clinicians, a lot of people involved in neonatal clinical trials, as well as follow-up researchers, um, other pediatric subspecialists, pediatricians, and regulators. Um, this is a little small, I apologize for that, but it shows um, how our participation rates varied by round. Um, and so in our family group, um, we did have a number who started, um, but weren't able to complete that first survey. And I have included the, in the analysis portion because we wanted to include all comers and anyone who had answered at least one of the ranking questions, we analyzed their data, but there was an optional demographic section that I'll show um, some information from on the next slide that not everyone completed. Um, and there was some dropout as was to be expected. This was a complex question near, um, but we were pleased that in round two and round three, we we're able to maintain participation. Um, this is a little bit more about the two groups. The family group was mostly made up of parents. Most of those were moms. There was one grandma and a couple of dads. Um, all of the caregivers had kids who were born preterm. The most uh, had extremely preterm infants. Um, the kids were now three years old to 23 years old. Um, we thought that was helpful to give parents some distance and some time to really heal from the experience of being in the NICU. Um, and most parents did complete at least four years of college or greater. Um, this is something we recognized. We had invited others who hadn't had that degree of education um, and just saw that they weren't able to complete the survey. Um, and it's just so something to think about in the future as to how to reach those individuals. Uh, the medical group, again, not everyone answered these optional demographic questions, but we did mostly have neonatologists, had a couple of pulmonologists, general pediatricians, and one infectious disease doc. And just some touching on the thematic analysis that we've done thus far, um, there were a lot of common themes. Uh, in the family group, unique to that group was really delving into personal experiences in the medical group, um, they really talked about how practice variation could be a barrier to including some of these outcomes um, as has been touched on already. But um, although answers were kind of different in the language they used, um, a lot of the common themes were long-term impact, um, having a marker of overall health, strain on families, 
feasibility. It was something that surprised, surprised me that some of the parents actually commented on that based on their experience and research thus far. Um, and there was just overall a lot of gratitude for being included in the process. Um, this just summarizes the survey results at a high level. Um, there was consensus to include 19 outcomes. There was borderline consensus to include four additional outcomes. And we have a preliminary ranking that's just based on this heat map on the right. Um, however, we still have our teleconference left to really nail down those results, um, make sure that the outcome selected makes sense and um, finalize the severity ranking and are um, glad that we've had interest from several parents to participate in this conference, not just the one who is on our steering panel. Um, so just some of the lessons that I've taken from this are that it can be difficult to engage families across multiple rounds, but it is helpful um, to see um, in multiple rounds how they respond and adapt the process for that. Um, use of mixed methods, I think, is something that could be helpful in the future, as uh, just doing an online survey was hard for a couple of our parents, um, and just that there were common themes that emerged. Uh, future applications for the neonatal global rank score, uh, we plan to use existing clinical trial data um, once our score uh, development process is complete to really show how this works. And then ideally use this as an endpoint in prospective trials and as a foundation for other neonatal global rank scores. Um, I really hope to use this as a framework to tackle the question of neural development um, in NICU graduates and focus on assessments at two years as that is most common in clinical trials um, and use what I've learned from this process and um, what's known about core outcomes at developments um, to come up with standardized definitions and um, be able to use continuous and categorical variables. All right, so I will stop here, but here's a summary from my talk. Great, well, thanks, Jenny. I uh, really appreciate that um, that overview. And the next up is uh, Kevin. Yep. Hey, Kevin. Thank you. So I'm a uh, pediatric cardiologist, as Matt said earlier. Um, so it's an honor to be invited to speak to mostly neonatology focused folks today. Um, I think my topic dovetails nicely with Ginny because I'm going to talk about a trial that we recently completed where we did use a global rank outcome in a pediatric cardiovascular population. So we can see the performance of that measure. Um, hopefully also touch on some other key elements of the trial that we used that maybe have application um, for, for other future trials, um, the pragmatic nature of the trial and, and the design, which used a registry. Um, some brief disclosures over here. Um, so the trial I'm going to talk about is the STRESS trial, or steroids to reduce systemic inflammation after infant heart surgery. Um, and this was a multi-center pragmatic trial that was built into the STS registry. The STS registry is a surgical registry that we use in pediatric cardiology. And as I mentioned, we did use a global rank endpoint. And our trial was, was published um, just last fall. And so anyone who's interested can, can read the full um, study. Oops. So just by way of brief background, um, one of our goals was to conduct a cost-effective and efficient trial. Um, and we aim to leverage existing registry resources. And this was because of this paper, which was published in 2013. Um, it was the TASTE trial, which was conducted in adults um, in a Swedish national registry. And uh, it was very successful because it was highly efficient and highly cost-effective. And you can see the quote at the bottom there from Dr. Mike Lauer, uh, who said the randomized registry trial um, is a disruptive technology uh, that has the potential to transform existing standards, procedures, and cost structures. Um, and Mike Lauer is the, at the time was the deputy director of NIH. Uh, so this is high praise. Um, one of the things that we do well in peds cardiology is we have a lot of registries. 96% um, of all children with heart defects undergoing intervention are enrolled in, in one of our registries, at least. Um, these are a list of a bunch of different registries that we enroll patients in. Uh, and this is just looking at the numbers in our surgical registry. We have more than 200,000 patients um, enrolled in that registry, and it's been in existence for more than 20 years now. 
So our trial focused on perioperative corticosteroids, which are used to treat the bypass-related inflammation that babies experience. And so anybody who's been in a cardiac ICU is used to seeing pictures like the one at the bottom. Our neonates have a severe systemic inflammatory response, and as a result, many cannot have their chest closed immediately after surgery. And this is because of uh, a number of different factors, um, the surgical injury, the exposure of um, blood to the bypass circuitry, uh, the ischemic reperfusion injury. Um, and so uh, we've been using steroids for decades, but safety and efficacy have never been established in children. Um, we did have clear equipoise for this question in a registry analysis conducted from the STS registry for data from 2011 through 2016, 52% of, of surgeons use steroids for neonatal surgeons, surgeries, implying that 48% do not. So clearly equipoise. Um, there had been a host of um, suboptimal um, evaluations of steroid efficacy. Uh, registry data had suggested that steroids might actually have some harm, um, but this was in conflict with existing um, pediatric trial data. Now, the pediatric trial data at that time was very limited, just over 200 patients enrolled across six different studies over the course of three decades. But that trial data, when analyzed in a meta-analysis, suggested some potential for benefit. Um, the adults had, as usual, conducted very large trials of this over the last decade, more than 12,000 patients enrolled, and they showed no benefit with steroids. Um, but obviously, as we all know in this setting, children are not little adults. So our trial was designed as a pragmatic trial built into this registry. And so the STS congenital heart surgery database is a mature registry. We've been using it for decades. Um, and so it has very robust data collection infrastructure. And we leveraged that infrastructure to build out our trial so we didn't have to replicate the database and the data collection methodology. Uh, we were lucky in that the uh, surgical registry, because it's been around so long, has been well validated. Um, in a, a previous audit, 98% of the variables that we collected for outcomes had been demonstrated to be accurately collected. And so our trial was designed as a randomized placebo-controlled trial with patients randomized one-to-one -to, -one to steroids or placebo. Um, we collected almost all of the data through the STS registry, but um, after discussion with FDA, they advised a small ancillary database to capture in real time adverse events and some other key variables. And then we linked those um, data sets on the back end to create a final study database. Um, one of the benefits of using registry data um, to conduct the trial is that you can use the retrospective registry data to simulate essentially any aspect of the trial, and that's what we did. Um, we have simulated the enrollment timelines, the adaptive design, stopping rules, the number of centers and the cost, the power gains, um, treatment versus placebo ratios, and inclusion and exclusion criteria. But most germane to this talk, we simulated outcome measures. Um, and ultimately, we settled on a global rank outcome because it had the most power. Um, so in our global rank outcome, participants were assigned the worst outcome that they experienced during their hospital stay. And I know we've spent a lot of time talking today about long-term outcomes, which are also very important in the pediatric cardiac population. But for cost reasons, we focused entirely on the, uh, on the inpatient setting and short-term outcomes. Um, in our global rank score, ranking was commensurate with the clinical impact. We arrived at this list, which you can see on the, on the right side of the screen there, uh, based on investigator consensus. We had cardiologists, surgeons, um, ICU physicians, and some parents um, on our, our committee. We didn't go through a Delphi process, but it was a pretty robust discussion over the course of several months. Um, so patients were ranked in this order. So at the, on, on the worst extreme, the highest rank was operative mortality, which most people I think would agree is the worst outcome. And then we descended down a list of clinically um, relevant endpoints. So the next ranked list was heart transplant or cardiac death. The next list is a subset of things that have long-term morbidity, but don't necessarily um, result in, well, if, if you receive these ranks, you don't have mortality. And those would be things like renal failure requiring permanent dialysis or neurologic injury with permanent deficit or tracheostomy. And then we proceeded down a subset of complication variables um, of uh, perceived lesser and lesser clinical relevance, although they're all major complications. If you reached the bottom of the list and you didn't have any of these major complications, then you were ranked based on your hospital length of stay. Um, and so this is where our power 
evaluation was important. Um, we knew that we had funding uh, for a trial enrolling approximately 1,200 patients. And so when we, were, when we simulated various outcomes, um, we would have lost the underpowered for a mortality endpoint, uh, about 20% power for that. We were also underpowered for a composite, a traditional composite, where you either had or didn't have the event. Um, we then looked at the composite just ranked. Um, so those outcome measures, but without length of stay. And it improved study power a little, but we still lost the underpowered. Where we had our big power gain was when we added length of stay into the outcome measure. So in our simulations, about 35, well, in our registry data, about 35% of patients had one of the major complications and 65% did not. And that's where the power gains come from, from in our study, from including that continuous outcome measure for those 65% of patients who otherwise would not have met a composite endpoint. Uh, the other bars that you can see there are simulating uh, post hoc or, or planned covariate adjustment. So most of the time when you do a trial, you randomize two groups and you don't covariate adjust at the end because you rely on randomization to balance the groups. But pediatric cardiology and I think neonatology and everything in pediatrics, um, we have very heterogeneous patient cohorts. And the result is that you can sometimes have imbalance in key covariates despite randomization. And so in our simulations, when we um, used covariate adjustment to uh, control for that potential imbalance, improved our study power by, by about three to five percent. This is an important point that I'll get back to when we review the results. Uh, we did have some other secondary endpoints. So um, most important was this unranked analysis. So the exact same outcome, but not, uh, sorry, not, not unranked, an unadjusted analysis of the primary outcome. So exact same endpoint, but not adjusted, not covariate adjusted. And then something called the win ratio, um, where you essentially take every patient in the treatment arm and compare them with every other patient in the placebo arm. And you do that for every single patient. So you have multiple comparisons, patient number one compared to patient number one, two, three, four, five through 600 in the placebo arm. And you calculate the number of times that they win. In other words, end up with a, a better outcome. So our trial cohort, as I mentioned, had 1,200 patients enrolled, 600, uh, 599 in the, in the one group and 601 in the other. Um, just to briefly touch on some of the challenges we experienced over the six years of this trial, you know, um, our grant was funded in 2016 and it took us a full year to get up to enrolling. I think that's not too unusual for a trial. One year later, we had successfully enrolled 99 patients, which was well behind schedule. That's when we had 10 cent sites activated. So we realized we needed many more sites. Uh, so we added a bunch more and we picked up speed by year three. Uh, and then COVID hit and we couldn't consent patients anymore. Um, which was a desperate challenge for us. We had to add even more sites, um, which became a cost challenge. Uh, and we rolled out an e-consent process, which ended up being quite effective for us. And at the end of the trial, um, our registry had changed data warehouses during the trial um, and we couldn't access the data. Uh, so we were delayed by six months. <laughs> but we finally managed to complete things. Um, this is a look at the baseline characteristics for our uh, trial cohort. Um, our trial was relatively well balanced with respect to key demographic features. Um, it also was reasonably represented um, with underrepresented minorities. Um, we actually had a um, lower consent rate among underrepresented minorities, which I think is a learning um, Lesson, a lesson learned for future trials, ways to improve that consent rate, but still reasonably represented. One of the things we look at carefully in pediatric cardiology is the distribution of case complexity. Um, and so uh, in the figure on the left, you can see a distribution of uh, case complexity with the, the big blue box at the bottom representing the lowest complexity cases, and then the dark blue box at the top representing highest complexity cases. Uh, those are things like Norwood procedures. Um, and so we were pleased that they were relatively well balanced. You can also see the different types of procedures um, represented there. It's one of the benefits of a larger trial. Um, you get reasonable balance between the two groups. So this is the, the global rank outcome and how it performed. Um, this ended up in terms of the primary outcome being a negative trial. You can see our p-value up there um, with an adjusted odds ratio favoring methylprednisolone, but not significant. And the two bar graphs break down the distribution of the components of the global rank endpoint. So the light blue on the left-hand side of the screen is, is mortality. 
And then um, you can see all the other binary components. This doesn't include the length of stay. Um, one of the things that we're quite pleased with and that had worried me immensely over the five years of doing the trial uh, was the potential that um, we saw endpoints going in different directions across the two, um, the two cohorts. So for instance, one of the ranked endpoints being markedly improved in one group and then another endpoint being markedly worsened in that group suggesting that our, our intervention was, was um, not ideally related to some of those endpoints. And we fortunately did not see that. I think it's an important consideration when you think of a global rank endpoint, um, global ranked endpoint. Dr. Bayer touched on this um, earlier this morning, the, the relationship between your treatment and the, uh, and the outcome. Uh, this is where our trial got com complicated. Um, our secondary endpoints did show a significant improvement with steroids. Um, so the, um, the same analysis of the primary endpoint, but not adjusted, which is the typical way a trial would be analyzed without post hoc or planned covariate adjustment that did come out to be significant. And this was uh, fascinating because we spent many hours debating whether we should go with this as our primary endpoint or with the covariate adjustment as our primary endpoint. And we finally decided on the covariate adjustment because of the power gains, but it turned out that we actually lost power with that, which a statistician said was just luck of the draw. Um, <laughs> so this obviously creates challenges interpreting the results. This was reported in the New England Journal as a negative trial, um, but you can see what a difference that that single decision made. Our win ratio was also significantly different. Um, and then one of the other secondary endpoints, bleeding requiring reoperation, was improved with methylprednisolone as well. Um, in terms of safety outcomes, um, the methylprednisolone or steroid group had a higher incidence, as you would expect, of hyperglycemia, known side effect of steroids, and so more patients received insulin in the postoperative setting. Um, Methylprednisone was less likely those patients to receive postoperative hydrocortisone, which is typically used in the cardiac ICU to treat postoperative cardiac output syndrome. So this is kind of another signal that perhaps there was some efficacy um, associated with the use of, of methylprednisone. Um, some of our subgroup analyses uh, did show significant benefits. So we saw improvement in lower complexity cases. We saw improvement in um, uh, patients with longer bypass times, and we saw improvement in non-premature patients, uh, but not in the premature cohort. Um, we looked by site and control for site in our analyses and did not see any site-related effect, and, and none of our other populations, another, none, none of our other subgroup analyses showed a significant benefit. Um, I just want to briefly touch on trial costs. It's not something we've talked about too much today, but I think it is very pertinent to a discussion of any trial with long-term endpoints because um, it definitely drives up costs dramatically. And I think cost has been a key limiter of the number of pediatric cardiology trials over years. Uh, and it was one of the reasons we designed our trial like this. We wanted to demonstrate that we could do trials on a reasonable budget. So our trial was a pragmatic trial built into a registry. Um, you can see that listed there, it cost about $3.3 million. The pragmatic design alone without the registry infrastructure leveraged um, was just under a million dollars more expensive. And then we mapped out what this trial would have cost using a more traditional trial design. And that was markedly more expensive, about $7 million more than what our trial um, ended up costing. So this was one of the main reasons our trial was feasible on the budget that we had. Uh, this was an, an NIH uh, budget. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think the major consideration or, or conclusion of our trial was that it is possible to conduct relatively large but cost-effective pragmatic trials um, in any pediatric population. Um, in large part, the cost savings would do the pragmatic design, but the registry um, infrastructure that we level, leveraged also decreased the cost. Um, we thought the global rank endpoint was successful. Um, it helped us to circumvent some of the challenges that we face with our unique patient population. Um, but I think it's very important, as Jenny um, described, to be very um, thoughtful in your endpoint selection um, and make sure that you're choosing the right endpoint relative to the treatment that you're using. Um, and despite our best efforts, interpreting the trial results um, remains challenging in our patient population um, and, uh, and I think in any patient population. 
Thank you. I'll just before I finish, like to thank the uh, the stress network because um, in uh, many ways, this or in, or in 100 percent of ways, this trial would not have been possible without the support of our community, who really stepped up and and helped us conduct this trial. Well, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> And our final speaker uh, for the session before we go into the additional panelists is uh, Claudia. Thank you. So, um, so thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and so I feel like a fish out of the water. I'm a statistician, and I think I may be the only one in the room. Uh, so I'm, I'm just feeling a little bit um, uh, in trial here. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about Bayesian uh, neonatal trials and specifically examples from the NICHD uh, neonatal research network, uh, where I've been lucky enough to, uh, to be uh, collaborated um, in a few of their trials. Um, so um, I, I sorry, I'm not going to try to pick on Kevin or anything, but um, so frequentist methods, shortcomings. Um, so why why do Bayesian, right? So well, frequentists are the one are the the methods that we medical research in general has relied on, and you know forever. Um, and the main issue with these methods is that they're often misinterpreted and misused to erroneously uh, dichotomize evidence. Where if the p value is greater than 0.05, um, the Unfortunately, the conclusion is that there is no difference between the two interventions being uh, compared uh, and, and hence proving the null hypothesis. Um, and if it's the other way, if the p-value happens to be less than 0.05, then the interpretation there is that the two interventions are truly different. Um, in this uh, commentary here that I'm showing you the, the little cartoon from, uh, came out in Nature back in 2019. Uh, where the authors uh, really are advocating for getting rid of statistical significance. Um, and they again point out that these methods really cannot prove any hypothesis. Uh, and in fact, the p-value itself is calculated uh, under the assumption that the null is true. So we cannot prove something that we're assuming, right? Um, but the, nevertheless, this um, binary thinking is quite appealing. Um, I mean, I find it quite appealing too, to be honest, but, um, but it's not correct. And hence the authors call for, you know, shoving the statistical significance uh, into the closet along with other um, artifacts, if you will. And I will point out that this commentary came out with, along with more than 40 uh, papers in statistical um, methods that are uh, providing alternatives to, um, to the misuse of p-values. Now, you know, this may sound a little bit abstract and you may think this is a real statistical issue, not so much in, uh, something that, that would concern uh, clinical researchers, <laughs> but, um, but I think, it, I mean, it really has quite an impact on the research that we conduct. And so this is a, um, an example from, uh, uh, car, uh, pediatric car cardiology. Uh, and so th in this trial back in 2015, uh, hypothermia was compared to normothermia for treatment after out-of-hospital um, cardiac arrest. And so 295 uh, children were randomized and 20% uh, in the hypothermia group had a good outcome, survived with a good outcome, compared to only 12% in the normothermia group. And so if we look at the risk difference, this is a risk difference of 7% um, in, uh, again, the, uh, the outcome being survival with a good functional outcome. So 7% to me seems like a pretty uh, impressive treatment effect. And nevertheless, the conclusion was that uh, hypothermia did not come for a significant benefit in survival with a good outcome. And so I think this is really, I mean, this really uh, shows us how frequentist methods uh, inadvertently uh, lead us to discount or abandon interventions that really are quite beneficial. I mean, I think seven, a 7% 7 difference is, is quite beneficial. Um, and so this was 2015. Uh, now, we, if we jump to 2022, same trial, 
analyzed under Bayesian uh, methods. And so using this analysis, um, they calculated a probability of 94% of any benefit with hypothermia. And the conclusion highlighted here is that there's a high probability that hypothermia provides a modest benefit in um, a good a survival with a good outcome. So I, I think that a statement like this is much more informative uh, and hopefully gets us away from thinking uh, binary. So if this is if we all find this more um, easy to understand and helpful, why are we not doing this? Uh, this is unfortunately not a probability that can be computed from the usual uh, frequentist methods that we use. For that, we need Bayesian statistics. Um, and so what is Bayesian statistics? Um, I'm not, don't worry, I don't have any formulas or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, so the, the main difference between Bayesian and frequentist uh, is just how we define probability, which may seem like a, like what? I thought probability meant one thing, but actually, no, it's, um, it's it, there, that's really the main difference. And so when we, usually when we think about probability, we think about, you know, a long run frequency so that if we flip a coin many, many, many times, how many times do we get head? That's the probability of getting a head, right? Um, but for, uh, for Bayesians, probability is just something that we, um, that we, we, uh, we use to quantify uncertainty. So it's just the probability. We're saying, what's the likelihood that this is going to happen? And the main um, criticism here, if you will, is that I can assign a different probability than you would to an outcome. And th th so that's one of the, the main criticisms. Um, but the nice thing is that once we specify a probability, then we get data, then we can update our probability using math a mathematical framework. And so this, um, this diagram here is showing us basically what, you know, what a Bayesian analysis does. And so we just take that prior probability Combine it with the data, we update it, and that's what um, what we call the posterior probability. And so once, um, so if we conduct a new study, we can update our probability, and then we can uh, we can make probability probabilistic statements like like with, um, for the cardiac study, and we can say how does this new study change the probability that treatment is beneficial. Oh, and um, and this can be a an iterative process. So you know the posterior that we get from this study could then serve as the prior probability for the next study. So what are the main advantages of a Bayesian approach? Is that it allows us to formally incorporate um, prior evidence. So if there are previous uh, studies or uh, randomized clinical trials, we can incorporate those into the prior. We can also build skepticism uh, about large treatment effects. So we know that most medical interventions that we study are gonna have small um, effects on major clinical outcomes. So we can specify that. Um, and then I think for um, pediatric and neonatal um, trials, we can use um, data from adult studies and incorporate that. Um, and one example is the, lupus drug that was approved by the FDA uh, based on a combination of adult data and pediatric data. Uh, the ability of um, Bayesian set, um, analysis to update uh, continuously, uh, it, it's a, uh, gives it, makes it a really good fit for adaptive designs. So that's another uh, advantage. But I think that most importantly is that even for the smallest uh, study that we conduct, we can answer the relevant question. So given all the relevant evidence, what is the probability that this intervention improves clinical outcomes? And then um, this probability outputs that we get from a Bayesian analysis, we can then combine them um, with perspectives from different stakeholders um, to make inform um, decision-making decisions. Sorry. Uh, so, oh, this is really small font, and I apologize for that. Um, but uh, in, so, in the network, we have um, have really uh, done quite a few studies where we've inc uh, they've incorporated this um, this methods. 
The first one there is the aggressive uh, versus conservative for therapy that uh, Jenny mentioned earlier. Um, and so here, this one, we um, like she said, you know, the for the smallest uh, babies, that the the composite outcome was really going in in different directions, and we we calculated the probability uh, of those uh, outcomes happening. And so that actually led to the second trial there, which is the cycle phototherapy, uh, which hopefully will still come for the benefit without increasing mortality. So that trial is ongoing. Uh, and then there's the, uh, I call them my babies. They're the three hypodermia trials. And so um, so they're all, um, they all had basin components. And the latest one is the preemie hypothermia, which just finished um, last year. And so hopefully the results will be finalized uh, later this year. Uh, and then the last one is the NEST trial, uh, which came out in 2021. And so just, well, just uh, briefly looking at the um, results from this trial. So it was a surgical trial comparing uh, initial lab versus drainage for neck uh, and IP. And the primary outcome was death or disability at 18 months. And the main result of this trial was that the treatment effect really depended on the preoperative diagnosis, whether it was neck or IP. Um, and so, you know, so so again, we were in that we're in the, that um, that space where we have treatment heterogeneity based on the pre-op. And sorry, I didn't realize how small this was going to look on screen. Um, but in that in the figure, um, there's somewhere in there. There's a blue line which shows the prior distribution or prior probability. Um, so it's a very flat line, so indicating that a priority we don't have. Um, that much information going in. But once we, you know, after we uh, conduct the study, uh, we combine that data with our prior, and now we get that blue curve that you see there. And that curve is actually in mostly in the direction of treatment um, benefit uh, from initial laparotomy for the neck babies. And then if we look at the IP subgroup, now you see that you know same curve, same interpretation, but that is shifted to the other side. So there you can really see um, that the treatment effect is going in the opposite direction for that for that subgroup. So I think that this is, and so this is the information that we get with a Bayesian analysis that we cannot get from a frequentist analysis. Um, so just to summarize, the advantages of the Bayesian of a Bayesian analysis is that it really allows us to make more nuanced decisions uh, than those that we would make based solely on whether p-value crosses an arbitrary threshold. Um, allows us to focus on point estimates and uncertainty, but I think most importantly, compute those probabilities that, um, that I just described. Uh, and then we can make decisions that are based on weighing benefits, harms, and costs for all stakeholders. So not just funding agencies, but everyone. Um, the disadvantages are that specifying that prior distribution can be challenging, uh, but along with the network um, investigators, I think we've we've gained a lot of um, experience doing this. There's still a lot of unfamiliarity uh, on clinicians, reviewers, editors, and even statisticians uh, with these methods, but I think it's um, is getting better. Uh, and then the last point that I'll just say is that we do need greater buy-in from all stakeholders, particularly funding and regulatory agencies. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, thank you very much for the three speakers. And uh, we'll now uh, hear from uh, Diana Green. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to thank the Duke Margolis Center and the FDA organizers for the invitation to participate as part of this panel. I'm very uh, pleased to be a part of this esteemed panel and I'm very pleased to be here with you this afternoon. So as was mentioned, my name is Deanna Green and I am the director of the Office of Pediatric Therapeutics. Um, and I wanna just say a little bit about our office and what we do. Um, so our mission as an office is to assure that children have access to safe and effective medical products, also products that are innovative. And we do this through driving, facilitating, and coordinating 
cross-cutting pediatric activities and initiatives on behalf of the agency. And so we execute several programs, one of which is our neonatology program. Um, and this program is staffed by neonatologists. Um, these neonatologists work to support medical product development by providing consultative services and expertise across the agency. They also work to train FDA staff on neonatal issues and considerations. They develop guidance and policy that is pertinent to neonatal product development, as well as safe use. Um, and they also work internally and externally um, in a collaborative fashion with stakeholders to make sure that we are all collectively advancing product development for neonates. And as you heard earlier from Dr. Marston, that is a key prior priority and focus area for the FDA. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that some of the pioneers of the neonatology program are here with us in, the, in this room, um, including Dr. Jerry Baer and Dr. Susan McCune, um, who really did a lot to get the program off the ground and make it to what it is today. And then I would also be remiss not to mention that our current leader is in the audience as well, Dr. Ann Massaro, who leads our neonatology program. So in terms of my brief remarks, I was asked to just touch upon from a high level um, the topic of surrogate endpoints uh, from a regulatory perspective, and also to talk about um, just some general insights as it relates to um, endpoint selection for pediatric trials. So we heard a little bit earlier about surrogate endpoints, and so we've said a couple of times now that they are uh, endpoints that can be used as a substitute for a direct measure of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. Um, it's important to recognize that they are not measuring the clinical benefit of interest or the outcome themselves in, of, in and of themselves, but they are intended to predict that clinical benefit. Um, and so there are many reasons of why this is an advantageous approach to, to use as part of a clinical development program and as part of a clinical trial. Um, obviously a surrogate endpoint can allow for or potentially allow for um, increased efficiency as part of a trial and part of product development. Um, there are many reasons why someone may employ a surrogate endpoint as part of an approach, um, including things like feasibility issues as it relates to measuring the clinical outcome of interest or the duration of time of which it would take to measure that outcome. Sometimes it's because that clinical outcome is rare in terms of its occurrence. And again, that, that poses feasibility issues. Other times it may be unethical to be able to design and execute a clinical endpoint trial. Um, and so we may see surrogates come in in that case. And then in other cases, it's because we understand the clinical benefit that's predicted by that surrogate endpoint, and that's been well demonstrated. And so it's, it's been used uh, routinely as part of a clinical development program in a particular context of use. Um, for regulatory purposes, I just want to point out that when we talk about a biomarker uh, as an endpoint, there are sort of three general categories that I want to mention. Uh, one is the intermediate endpoint, and so this is a measure of a therapeutic effect that can be measured um, before or prior to morbidity or mortality, um, but is likely, reasonably likely, uh, to predict the clinical effect. A second term that I wanted to mention is a surrogate that's reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And then the third is a surrogate endpoint, and this last term in this last category is a surrogate that has undergone full validation, and that includes analytical and clinical validation, um, and has, has shown uh, to be uh, proven to demonstrate a clinical effect. And so I wanted to bring all that out because the efforts that are needed to reach that threshold of a clinically, analytically validated surrogate endpoint um, can be very resource intensive. And so one of the key points that I wanted to mention today as part of my just brief remarks is that um, because of this, it often does require um, working collaboratively across stakeholder groups to be able to achieve and get that uh, proposed endpoint to the finish line as it relates to being able to be used for that context. Um, the first two endpoints or the first two terms that I mentioned, an intermediate endpoint, as well as a surrogate reasonably likely to predict um, clinical benefit can be used um, in some cases to support accelerated approval. And then those, in, those surrogate endpoints that have achieved, again, full validation can be used for traditional um, approval as it relates to regulatory purposes. 
And so one of our goals um, that we like to stress when we're talking in forums such as this is that, again, just keeping in mind the difference between uh, research uh, that is not intended for regulatory purposes or decision making um, and research that's intended to support uh, regulatory decision making as it relates to product approval. Um, and in those cases, it really does require a robust accumulation of evidence that leads to a deep understanding of the correlation and relationship between the surrogate and that clinical outcome of interest. Um, and that is very important to keep in mind. It often requires starting pretty early um, in the process to be able to get uh, to a point where that evidence has been accumulated in a robust way. And that evidence can, can vary in terms of the sources. It, it includes preclinical data, assay assessments, it includes epi, um, epidemiologic data, um, RCTs, of course, um, and oftentimes what we may find, too, is that information from other products, for example, in the same class um, can be used and leveraged to be able to inform this whole process. Um, and then lastly, I just want to mention that, um, and I want to touch upon something that Dr. S uh, Smith said earlier as it relates to the adult experience and the pediatric experience as it re relates to clinical endpoints. So as part of pediatric product development, it's, it's both a plus as well as the curse in that we often do have the adult data available to help inform the pediatric product development program. Sometimes the only the part of the curse is that it can, you know, sometimes pediatrics comes after adult development and that can lead to delays in terms of having these products available for children. But the benefit is that we can learn from the adult experience, we can learn from the endpoints that were used in that context of use, and we can also learn about whether there are similarities in the pediatric population for that correlated disease to be able to use that same endpoint in that setting. And actually, when we did an assessment a couple of years ago, looking at adult endpoints and pediatric endpoints used in clinical trials for correlate diseases, we did find that when the adult endpoint was the same as what's used in the pediatric clinical trial, that those trials did tend to be more successful. Likely that's because, again, we've gathered this robust experience with that particular endpoint. We obviously learned from what happened in the adult programs, and we were able to apply all of that. In this case, for neonates, as has already been pointed out, often we don't have that luxury to be able to leverage uh, the adult experience to a large extent as we may be able to do for older children. Part is because of the differences between the populations, of course, adults and neonates, but also because of the unique diseases that we see occurring, of course, in the neonate um, that make that challenging. And so my only point here is that I want to mention is that that then really leads to stressing the importance of understanding, um, and we heard some of this in some of the earlier talks, the natural history of disease that is occurring um, in the neonate, understanding baseline values, um, also understanding normal values in terms of what's considered normal laboratory values, because as we talk about endpoints to measure clinical benefit, we have to be really clear on uh, the expectations of that therapeutic intervention and being able to really detect that based on our knowledge already of the baseline um, condition and again, the natural history of the disease. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, I'm gonna pass the clicker here. Yeah. Kind of to, and then you're gonna pass, could you do my passing it to Susan after you? Sure. All <laughs> right, great. Cause they've got some slides. All right, thank you so much. And it's such an honor uh, and a privilege to be here in front of all of you to talk about uh, the work uh, that we do at Critical Path Institute. Uh, as an introduction, I'm Kavajit Singh, and uh, uh, I am the Director of Pediatric Programs uh, uh, at uh, Critical Path Institute. And uh, the topic of my presentation today is to talk a little bit about the work that we do at one of the programs uh, at CPAP, that is the International Neonatal Consortium, and uh, also talk a little bit about specific work as it pertains to real-world data and how we are using real-world data to create uh, something that we call as uh, drug development tools to help industry and everybody else who's doing neonatal research and neonatal clinical trials and enable them to do those research uh, easier, faster, and better. Uh, so that's... Uh, it's a, again, uh, this slide is a little dense, but uh, it's all because of all of the graphics that I've included here. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, Critical Path Institute was started uh, in around early 2000s as a result of FDA's Critical Path Initiative. And this initiative really called for uh, creating a series of uh, public-private partnerships comprised of industry, academia, regulatory agencies, patient and parent advocacy members, uh, 
for the single purpose of working pre-competitively uh, pre and collaboratively, uh, breaking silos, so to speak, right? Uh, and uh, use uh, that pre-competitive collaborative work to create, again, as I said before, uh, drug development tools, which can be used to accelerate drug development in some of the disease areas where there's a high degree of unmet need. Neonates are certainly one of those uh, populations which has a high degree of unmet need in terms of the fact that uh, a lot of, uh, most of the drugs, in fact, in the NICU are used off-label. So uh, FDA uh, thought that there's a great deal of utility and benefit to create a similar type of a public-private partnership within the confines of Critical Path Institute, uh, which would be uh, kind of a collection of stakeholders from industry, uh, all, all stakeholders from industry who have an interest in neonatal drug development and active programs in neonatal drug development, academia, uh, and academic researchers, regulatory agencies, not just FDA, but others too. For example, we work very closely with PMDA, European Medicines Agency, uh, Canadian Medicines Agency, UK, um, and uh, even more importantly, uh, patient and parent advocacy groups and patient members and nursing members as, as well. Uh, so we work collaboratively, pre-competitively to, 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 uh, to, to work on uh, research projects of uh, common interest and uh, whereby, you know, uh, there are a lot of projects that we're working on, but specifically for the purposes of this particular uh, topic here, uh, uh, conference here today, uh, we are working on uh, a series of projects where we are integrating, uh, aggregating data from, uh, real world data from variety of different sources, create large databases, and use uh, that database to, to, again, the same, same idea again, uh, create drug development tools. For the purposes of uh, simplicity, you know, we, we call it as drug development tools, but uh, those drug development tools are really pretty much anything and everything uh, that somebody who is working in a, a clinical uh, trial setting might find them those, those tools to be useful to enable them to do the studies easier, faster, and better, right? Uh, in a lot of cases elsewhere at CPATH, we use uh, aggregated and integrated clinical trial data because uh, there is certainly, if you look at uh, some of the diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, there's no dearth of regulatory grade clinical trial data from industry members. But it's not quite so the case when you talk about uh, drug development in the neonates, because as I said before, most drugs are used off label. Uh, and uh, there definitely is a kind of a lack. Uh, and I was actually talking with a couple of industry members here in the conference today. They said that one of the challenges that they experience is if they try to go and do a clinical trial, they already find that uh, in a lot of cases, those drugs, those drugs are already part of a kind of a clinical standard, even though that standard might be based on a uh, uh, off-label use of the drug. So what we wanted to do because of that particular specific problem or issue uh, is to uh, to do the thing that we do at CPATH, that is integrate and aggregate data from a variety of different sources, uh, but use the data from sources such as electronic health records, because that's where you are going to find a huge amount of huge quantity, as well as what we assume good quality also uh, of uh, data from electronic health records registries, and uh, uh, use those data to create extremely large voluminous uh, databases comprised of high quality data, and use those data to and analyze that data to create uh, drug development tools. Uh, you know. Um, one of the things that uh, we are working on right now um, as a result of this uh, uh, real world data integration effort is uh, to collect and integrate electronic health record clinical care data to create uh, drug development tools, specifically in this particular instance, uh, disease progression models for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which I think everybody has been talking about a lot about that issues as it pertains to uh, diagnosis of BPD, treatment of BPD, so we are basically trying to hope, hope uh, we are hoping to solve some of the challenges as it pertains to uh, uh, the issues with BPD drug development and use clinical care integrated data from different sources. Second effort uh, that is actually not listed on this slide, but uh, this is more of a kind of a forward looking slide in terms of what the future might look like. But the second slide that the uh, uh, second effort that we have ongoing is, uh, as uh, Dr. Diana Green was talking about, uh, one of the issues that, are, that is also pretty pertinent for neonatal drug development is lack of generalizable lab value normative ranges in the neonatal space. So. Uh, what what most like I think what 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 is happening currently is that many centers have their own kind of 
normative ranges which might differ from one center to, to the other as it pertains to neonatal uh, lab values so what we are also doing is uh, we're doing here is collecting data from different sources not just in the us but outside of the us to 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 really create what we hope would be really generalizable uh, lab value normative ranges but since as i said before uh, the data that we are collecting in this uh, are in our effort is really uh, disease and therapeutic area agnostic it is very easily scalable to other disease areas as well, other neonatal disease areas as well, because we're not, whenever we go to hospitals and ask them to contribute data to us, we don't ask them to send only data on BPD or ask them to send data only on lab values, right? So data is like extremely scalable uh, to other disease areas. And what we envision in the future is use the same methodology that we are using currently for BPD and lab values to, to expand it and scale it to other disease areas. In this specific instance, as it's shown on this slide, hoping to use the data for uh, necrotizing enterocolitis uh, and use those uh, data to create a set of uh, disease progression models for NAC. Uh, another aspect that we're extremely interested in uh, is creating a set of historic external controls that I wouldn't really say go far so far as to say that going to completely replace usage of placebo in clinical trials, but at least supplement. Uh, and reduce to some extent the reliance of uh, control arms in the clinical trials. I know it's kind of forward looking, so that's why I'm, I'm mentioning the use of uh, placebo historical controls here. Another thing that we're really very interested in is uh, another uh, neonatal condition that is uh, extremely, um, I guess, common is uh, retinopathy of prematurity. And similar to other work that we are doing in BPD and the work that we want to do in NAC, uh, use the uh, data, clinical care data from, from NICUs. H EHRs uh, to create a series of uh, disease progression models for retinopathy of prematurity. So those are some of the things that we're doing here and I'm gonna be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. And now I'm gonna pass to Dr. McEwen. <laughs> Thank you, Kamaljeet. See. Uh, oh, this is a great eye test for me. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, all the rest of you young people eyes up on the, uh, uh, so I apologize, this is gonna be really bad for me. Uh, okay, it's fine. Thank you. Oh, is there one on the podium? Oh, no, no, oh, but you could stand. The, oh, but I could turn my back to everyone, just like I am now. <laughs> um, so so I'm, I'm gonna start uh, for a say First, I wanna uh, thank Kamaljeet uh, for talking about the International Neonatal Consortium because you know, eight years ago, that was really the, the first opportunity for all of the stakeholders that are here in the room to get together uh, and, and really focus on um, uh, new uh, therapies for neonates. Um, I want to thank Deanna for talking about uh, biomarkers and endpoints. Um, and really, uh, one of the things that, that she really stressed in the paper that, that she wrote um, was that if we don't use the same endpoints as we have, as are available for adult trials, um, we really need to figure out how to fix that uh, if possible. I think pulmonary artery hypertension is probably a really excellent example of that um, where we're still struggling, um, recognizing that we are not able to use the same endpoints as adults and as Deanna mentioned, uh, for many of the neonatal um, uh, diseases. Uh, we're not able to, to model anything from adults. But if we are in the future, I really want folks to think about early protocol development and early in terms of when you're doing the adult studies. Um, because if you think you're ever going to have to go to a neonate, um, please start thinking about what that end, what those endpoints might look like in neonates and how you might then be able to collect those data for endpoints in the adult trial that then you can use to bridge to the neonatal data. It will make it so much easier for all of us in the end. Um, and then I'd like to thank Kevin for talking about some finances, because um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, so, so basically, um, we've been hearing a lot today um, from different silos. Um, and I think that I'm the last speaker before the fireside chat. Um, and it's my job to try to put the elephant together. Um, and, and that's a little bit what this slide is. And please forgive me because I do not have young eyes. Um, it, you know, if you start, and of course I can't point, but of course the far left side of the, of the slide um, is our patient. You know, this is what we're all here about. This is what we're focused on. Um, and we need new therapies for neonatal patients. We've been talking today a number of examples um, of repurposed drugs, but we haven't talked a lot about new therapies. 
Um, and it's because there's not a tremendous amount in the pipeline and we need to fix that. And, and part of why we don't have a lot in the pipeline is what Kevin was talking about is some of, some of the finances. And I'll talk about that in a second. So we start with, with academia. We start with the folks that have the great ideas in the lab. They have their patients. They want them to treat their patients. Um, and, and they essentially um, move forward um, with these, uh, with programs in the lab, they develop animal models, they may develop biomarkers, um, they may not have any idea how to qualify those biomarkers. Um, and then um, we have uh, toxicology testing. Um, and then uh, we're starting to get in the far uh, right side of the slide, we're starting to get into, get into where um, biotech and biopharma come into the picture in terms of commercial product development. Um, and then as you go circle around the bottom uh, from the right to the left, you've got first in human studies, um, and then you've got phase one, B, two, uh, three trials. Um, and um, that's what we've been talking about mostly today in terms of clinical endpoints and then data standards and then submission to the regulatory agencies. All right, I won't turn my back on you anymore. Um, but, but the whole point of this um, is that um, each one of these pieces functions very well in isolation. The problem is we haven't been able to put them together um, very well. And, and we haven't been able to link a number of the things that we've been talking about today um, one of those being um, the voice of the patient. Uh, and I will say, tell you that um, from a, a patient-focused drug development perspective, um, we go back and utilize all of the results of those patient-focused drug development efforts as we think about protocols in the pediatric space. Um, we'd love to have more in the neonatal space. Um, but um, as we're... we're I'm sorry. Your mic just died. Oh, my mom. Oh, good. At least it's not me, right? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so, um, so basically, you know, how do we connect here? Um, because what we've been saying is that uh, when we get to that, those clinical trials at the bottom here, we want to have the voice of the patient involved. That's too late. By that time, you've already got the protocol written, and now you're saying, well, did you involve a patient? Oh, no, we need to involve the patient. Now we need to go back. Now we've got a protocol amendment. Now we've got more time. We've got more resources. We need more money. We need to identify a process and better communication through this whole system in terms of early protocol development. How do we access patient advocacy groups? How do we access the folks like Deb and Betsy? Um, the, the problem in neonatology is, unlike many of the rare diseases where there are very active patient advocacy groups, um, you have time when you have a new therapy that's involved. You, the patient advocacy groups are aware of what's being developed in the pipeline. They're in those conversations. They're talking about the protocols. Um, the problem is no one plans to be in the NICU. No one plans to have a baby that's going to need to be in one of these clinical trials. Um, and so we can engage um, uh, Deb and Betsy and, and other patient advocacy groups in the neonatal space in terms of writing the protocols. But in terms of engaging the patients before they need to consent for a trial, that's much more difficult. It's much more of a challenge in our space. And, and the problem is it's not only a challenge, but it's an incredibly stressful time in their lives. Their baby is incredibly sick. They're being asked to participate in a trial. Um, and, and patients themselves may not be um, interested in trials. They may be wary of trials, um, but they're e even going to be more wary of trials for, for their babies. And so um, consenting um, patients is a, is a real issue in, in our uh, community and for our trials. Um, and so really trying to connect a lot of the dots, doing more communication, more process development of when in these, as these protocols are being developed, when as the endpoints are being discussed, how are we engaging with the patients and parents and, and the advocacy groups? Um, and I, you know, we've got the, uh, the regulatory agency stuck over on the side. And I will tell you, um, I, you know, having been an academician, so I've been a couple of points in this, uh, now three points in, the, in this diagram. You know, originally as an academic who was working with animal models, very naive about what was required from a regulatory perspective. Then I spent 18 years as a regulator. Uh, and now that I came out to the clinical research organization, 
um, uh, incredibly naive on what it takes um, uh, to really do these regulatory uh, ready um, uh, clinical trial programs. Um, so we have to be more efficient in how we're putting these trials together. We have to be more efficient in how we uh, communicate. Uh, we've been talking about clinical outcome assessments. How do we have, have those conversations with the agency so um, that when the data come in um, it, or when the protocol comes in and everyone's ready to go and the, and the agencies, regulatory agencies say, but you haven't validated this clinical outcome assessment. You haven't validated um, uh, uh, this, um, uh, your biomarker. Uh, so having those conversations early, and I said this as a regulator, um, I still hear people say, oh, we don't want to go to the agency. Oh, no, there's no mechanism to go to the agency. There's always a mechanism to go to the agency and have a discussion. And, and we're all in this together. We all want to, the, the most efficient clinical trials um, are, are really what we're all about, all of us here as stakeholders. Uh, and so uh, we all have to, to communicate. We all have to develop the process. And I will tell you, if we don't have a process and if we don't um, have a way forward, what we're finding from, from a, um, uh, uh, a support perspective, well, he's going to come. Maybe he's going to come. Um, Jumpstart me. Yeah, maybe. Um, Thank you so much. Oh, even better. I don't have to yell. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, one of the things that's really um, we haven't talked about today, and Kevin brought it up just a little, and this is just my last comment, um, is that in order to get across the end line for many of these, especially of these, these great products that are being developed by academicians um, that may have some funding uh, through NIH grants, through NCATS, um, who uh, then have to figure out how to uh, be able to do what, Ke what Kevin was talking about in terms of what it costs to do the clinical trials. Um, they have to go out and look for venture capital. Uh, and the problem is venture capital folks are very anxious about supporting neonatal trials. Um, we're a very uh, vulnerable population. Um, people are scared uh, of, uh, you can't do trials in neonates. You know, we have to do trials in neonates. We have to provide therapies for neonates. And so um, trying to, to help them understand educating the venture capital community in terms of why it's important to do neonatal trials. Um, but they also don't want to take a risk. And the risk is we haven't had a lot of products that have been approved. Uh, and it, until we have that, that uh, you know, pipeline, till we have that path that, so it's not just a, um, you know, a, a, a path in the, in the woods that, that isn't very well navigated, um, but we actually have a, well, we're not going to have a super highway, but at least if we have a paved road, um, you know, that then I think we're going to be able to encourage more venture capital folks to get into this space and hopefully really be um, more innovative in, in terms of being able to get more, more products to our, to our babies and those cute little feet on the left-hand side of the slide. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm done. Well, thanks, Susan. And thanks to all of our uh, speakers and panelists. Um, so we have a, a few minutes left um, and we have some discussion questions up there, but before we get into those, there's one that came um, through Slido. And this um, could be, uh, let's start with Jenny and then maybe Kevin thereafter, which is how might the GRS global rank score be used to measure efficacy of a treatment on a specific disease process? An example here is preterm pulmonary disease. I think that's an excellent question, and thank you so much for asking that. Um, I think the neonatal global rank score, as um, we're developing it now, and is broad in scope, um, and that is intentional. Um, and for something like pediatric pulmonary disease that we've discussed today, where 
we do know that infants with severe BPD are more likely to have neurodevelopmental impairment um, and are more likely to have severe ROP. Um, having a mechanism to look more holistically at the infant um, could be something that's really beneficial in um, measuring effectiveness. Um, that being said, um, Kevin Hill talked about kind of the more details of how the global rank score works. And so each patient um, receives one rank depending on the most severe outcome they experienced during the study period. And then the ranks um, for the control versus um, intervention groups are compared statistically. Um, and so would we'll still really want to see how that, um, how that turns out um, after we have the score developed, but I think there is a lot of potential there that we're hopeful about. Yeah, maybe I can just add a little from personal perspective. Obviously, I haven't seen your global rank score, but I think um, to some extent, it's difficult to develop a single global rank score that can be right. applied to every single trial of everything that's different aged because there are going to be nuances in what you're studying. But um, we've moved from our initial trial, which was steroids delivered in the operating room to babies undergoing heart surgery. Um, we developed a global rank score from that. Uh, our next trial, which, which is actually funded as of April 1st, um, is a trial looking at early versus delayed cord clamping. And it's uh, similar in that it's in neonates undergoing congenital heart surgery, but it's slightly different because cord clamping occurs at delivery and not at the time of surgery. So there's this intermediary gap between delivery and surgery where outcomes can accrue as well. And so we modified our global rank. We took the framework that we'd worked with and we built in some additional components that reflect that period. So for example, if the intervention, in this case, cord clamping, impacts the ability of the child to have that surgery, let's say they have a, a major complication before the time of surgery after birth, the birth complication that's related to the intervention, that's an endpoint that you wanna capture in your global rank score. And so we built that into our global rank score for this. So I think, um, my answer to that question is the global rank score that you develop, I, I, I think, for neonatology um, would be sort of an overarching framework that then can be modified depending on what disease process you specifically apply to. Um, you would still have the framework based on, you know, parental insight and academicians that these are the seven things that are really important to us. But when you're studying BPD in, in particular, there's another measure that's also very relevant. Maybe it's oxygen need at 40 weeks or uh, going home on oxygen that we're gonna plug into the global rank score um, at level four or level five or wherever you think it's most important. Great. Um, was anyone else on the panel like to comment on, on that? Okay. So I have a question for Kevin, which is after you heard Claudia, what, what did you think? And, and, and now that you thought about it. No, I'm really glad you asked because um, I actually 100% agree with her um, it, without having the, the nuanced understanding of Bayesian analysis. I'll just tell our personal story again. You know, uh, I was with a negative trial. It didn't show benefit in terms of the primary endpoint. When I look at the totality of the data, my take on it is I think steroids work. Um, and actually our entire investigative team, which consists of... Um, quite a number of surgeons and intensivists and cardiologists uh, feel the same way. Um, and we wrote this paper um, with somewhat of a nuanced interpretation. We obviously focused on the primary endpoint um, and um, the, the journal, New England Journal of Medicine, where we, where we submitted has very strict uh, policies on how you present the data. You have to stick to the primary endpoint. And there are good reasons for that. That's good trial design, um, which, I, I completely agree with. So our final published manuscript reads very much like a negative trial, which it was. Um, but I think Claudia's discussion highlighted to me that there, there need to be other ways of analyzing these data and presenting these data so that you can get across some of that nuance in the trial outcomes and the trial design. Um, so I really enjoyed her comments and I'd love to learn more. Yeah, Susan. <laughs> well, I just want to ask Kevin, um, when you said we think it works, what is it that makes you say that that's different from what the objective criteria that you had for the trial would have been? Yeah, so um, several things. Um, if you look at the individual elements of the global rank, and I presented in broad buckets like the, the 95 corresponded to three different outcome measures, trach and uh, dialysis uh, um, and neurologic injury. 
So if you look at those broad components, they almost all were the same or improved in the methylprednisolone group. If you break them down individually, same thing. Everything moved in the same direction in favor of methylprednisolone. So that was that was number one. We saw the strong signal um, uh, in the direction of, of a small benefit. Number two was our secondary analyses. Um, when we looked at it without covariate adjustment, it has improved. When we looked at it with the win ratio, it was improved. When we looked at several of the subgroups, they seem to have some benefit as well. So I, I think Claudia's initial point that like we have this p value of 0 0.05 and and we stick to that, and, and if you don't exceed it, it's not beneficial. Uh, that really resonated with me. If there's a way to get into the sort of nuanced probability of improvement, um, it makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah. Did I hear, am I hearing something in the audience? No. Okay. So uh, agreement. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, anyone else want to come on that specifically? I have some follow-up questions around that. So from a right, go ahead, please. I just had a follow-up question for you about your comment about um, being able to pick different thresholds being one of the limitations. So you choose one, you choose one, and it can be different. Any comments from a statistician as to how we <clears throat> provide more education around that? Yeah, and and, and that's a, I think that's a that's a great point, and it's a great um, um, thing to, to talk about that that we do need to have conversations about what are threshold what thresholds we should be using, uh, and I think that definitely that needs to depend on the disease that we're looking at, the outcome that we're looking at, the interventions that we're looking at, uh, and then you know what is the benefit and, and the harm. If this is the only intervention that there is for this particular disease, do we really need a threshold of 98% or 90% with something lower it really makes sense because you know this is the only um, the only thing that we have. And so I think that we need to have those conversations and it's not just it should not just be statisticians talking among themselves for sure. Uh, but also not just statisticians talking to to clinical investigators or clinicians, but it really has to be everyone, uh, and specifically uh, caregivers, patients. You know, everyone has to be involved. So the and so, um, of course, the hard part there is like, well, I need to make a decision. I need like something that is like a p less than 0 0.05, but not that. Um, and I guess my my answer is that there there are no easy answers. This is hard. This is this is hard to do, and it's something that we need to do. So from a from, from a regulatory standpoint, for this is probably for Deanna or maybe Susan with your experience, is that how does the agency or a, you know um, sort of interpret the Bayesian analysis, or um, you know is this something that is uh, or things that like with Kevin's trial. I mean, it might work, but the primary endpoint is negative. So, how do, how do you deal with that? Is it rigid? <laughs> how did you used to deal with that, baby? Let me just say again, this is my personal. Let me just remind everyone with right. personal comments. I'm not speaking on behalf of the agency, but I've seen in the last um, several years a real push in the agency towards innovation and wanting to be. Um, open to these concepts and, and really uh, thinking about them in the context of product development, you may find that um, we've issued now several guidances that touch upon some of these topics. I think one of the key areas, though, is that um, <clears throat> in some cases, the application of Bayesian approaches is novel for that context of use. And so the agency just stress early conversations. So having those early conversations around the statistical approaches um, and the considerations is really key. So um, similar to what you would be doing for a novel endpoint or a novel approach, you would do the same for, for this type of an approach, um, having early conversations with the relevant review divisions and sort of walking together collaboratively um, to think about you know, how it's gonna play out in terms of the trial before the submission of the results. Those kind of conversations are, are critical. Great. And, and I will add, and I don't even have to say, I don't speak for the agency, uh, <laughs> that um, recently, actually, the Office of Biostatistics uh, just recently published a, a really excellent article on the use of statistics in uh, pediatric trials and, and extrapolation. Um, so uh, I, I would recommend everyone read that because it's actually a really good uh, use of um, Bayesian statistics. 
Great. So, so my other question sort of to the group and anyone can answer this is that um, it seems like some of these trial results, sometimes they're a little bit disparate, you know, depending on the endpoints that are there. Is there a role for, or how would you um, incorporate sort of precision medicine into this? So it may be that some families would value one thing versus another. Can you treat or not treat based on, you know, personal preferences, you know, at the bedside or using statistics, um, um, Claudia? So not to, not to call you out, but, um, but, you know, just your thoughts on that. Um, aggressive versus conservative phototherapy might be the might be the one the one I'm thinking about. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, I I agree that um, there. Yeah. Exactly. That. Um, and I think we're lucky that it doesn't happen that often. That it that the direction of the treatment benefit really is going in separate um, directions for that composite outcome. Um, and so, if you I guess if you treat everyone with aggressive phototherapy, there your um, you're putting you're putting uh, more weight on one outcome versus another, um, as opposed to getting um, perhaps the family right does does not feel that way, and so that that uh, conversation perhaps needs to happen. Uh, I'm not sure that that happens, and whether it's something that can um, meaningfully happen at the bedside when you have this baby that's you know very small, very sick. Uh, is it a minimal, meaningful conversation to have with the parent there? I don't know. That's, you know, it's way out of my realm. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, but, but I think we also, but we need to think about what the implication is if we say treat all this way versus treat all with um, the other way. Kevin, anything? If you had a family that was, had a particular concern about one of the, the endpoints that wasn't, that was more, more prevalent in the, in the steroid group? Yeah, it's a difficult decision. Um, you know, what matters, I think, obviously varies depending on the, the person. For some families, we actually had some focus groups. We didn't use a, um, an iterative process like you did, Jenny, but um, we, we held a series of focus groups before we came up with our, our ranked endpoint. And there's clearly differences in opinion. Like some families said, in fact, having a neurologically devastated um, child for me is a worse outcome than early mortality. Um, and so, you know, how do you incorporate that into bedside decision-making? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know that there's a good answer to that. I, I did want to ask a question if I could for um, some of the things that just, just came up, but we've heard a lot today, my <laughs> FDA colleagues about um, the difference between a trial for regulatory approval versus um, for clinical efficacy. Um, and I think that's why we have it. One of the reasons we have these hard determinations, you guys have to decide approved or not approved. So as a follow up to what you were see, saying earlier, um, how would you incorporate probability into a regulatory decision when it's not a hard and fast yes or no? And then as a second follow up to that, like, um, could you imagine a scenario where probability can be adjusted as new data accrues? Um, and that's part of the regulatory approval process or the regulatory reconsideration process. Mm -hmm. I can, I'll start, but I'll just say that um, I, I think that is something that we, we do in the sense. So for example, when I think about um, probability and, and risk, if you're talking about biomarkers or endpoints that are for example, being used for prognostic or predictive purposes, diagnostic and, and other means, the risk associated with that in terms of if your confidence is not as high as it could be is vastly different from uh, the risk associated with uh, lower confidence in a biomarker or endpoint that's intended to support, again, a uh, demonstration of benefit for that clinical outcome. Um, and so I think that as evidence accrues and grows over time, and some of that information is coming from trials that aren't attended for regulatory purposes, right? They're part of the scientific and medical knowledge database that we gain over time. Those types of risk benefit assessments adjust um, as we gain more information and more confidence um, over time in terms of the evolving science and data. 
And I would just add to that, as you're looking at a, a regulatory program, it's not a single trial, it's a, it's a process. So as you're doing a phase two trial, this is why it's critically important that as we do these phase two trials and put these protocols together, that we're using not only what we think are the best primary endpoints, but we're doing a lot of secondary endpoints mm -hmm. and a tremendous amount of exploratory endpoints at this point, because what that allows us is if they're pre-specified to then, as we're looking at that phase three trial or, or the confirmatory trial, um, is to be able to utilize those endpoints that we think might have a better outcome um, and also be able to, um, uh, utilize fewer patients than potentially for uh, the subsequent study because, um, you know, these these studies are hard. They're, they're hard, they're expensive, and we need to do, we have, you know, kind of one chance to do them right. So the more we can pre-specify up front in the earlier um, trials before we get to the confirmatory trials, uh, I think we have a better chance of being successful in the confirmatory trials. Well, great. Well, we're out of time. So thank you all for your time and for your comments. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it back over to you. Is that right? Or are we going straight in the fireside chat? Is that correct? Fireside. Okay, great. Passing in the baton to you. Sure. I'm moving to the end. All the way to the end. Okay. Here we go. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so Thank you everybody for participating and um, it's been a wonderful day. I've learned a ton, have a lot more questions, <laughs> but hopefully also have made some um, some headway in, in, in things to think about in the future. So um, we're gonna wrap up here with our fireside chat where we will all as the session moderators of our four sessions today, highlight um, just a few of the key takeaway points that we had from the sessions and the discussions and then um, hopefully have some a chance to talk about kind of our priorities and our next steps from here. So I'll turn it over and let Michelle go first as the moderator of session one. Okay, so session one, traditional approaches to measuring efficacy. Um, some key takeaways, but I think the, uh, the most important one is what Susan just emphasized with um, her schematic diagram is that the neonatal research network and the pediatric therapeutics network have been active since 1986 and 2000, respectively. Um, and yet, despite those efforts, we have no compounds in the pipeline. Essentially, all of the work has been on repurposing drugs. Um, Thank God we had inhaled nitric oxide and surfactant. Otherwise we would have many fewer things to point to um, of improving the outcomes. So these babies don't just survive and their families don't just survive, but they thrive. Um, and that should be our goal for all of them. We understand it's very difficult um, that, um, not only is it difficult to design the trials in an ethical way, it's also difficult to attract industry partners um, into this vulnerable population. Um, and therefore we need to be uh, full partners in the process so that we can get things through the pipeline. Uh, the traditional endpoints of FDA, feel, function, and survive can apply um, to neonates, except that we can't ask them how they feel. Um, and so, and more important that we can uh, rely on the people who know them best and in a NICU, that's their parents and that's the bedside caregivers, the nurses uh, to help interpret the baby's activities. Biomarkers may be helpful in this realm, again, because issues with requiring very small 
um, aliquots for the samples for biomarkers have made um, development of those more challenging. Um, so the smallest babies, for those who don't live in uh, the NICU with us daily, our smallest babies of 500 grams have 50 mLs of blood total in their body. So your bottle of water there is 240 mLs or 120 mLs. So we have to be especially cautious with how we take samples from them um, and uh, spend their blood. Composite outcomes are gonna be a must because unfortunately in this vulnerable population, mortality is real. So the traditional adult endpoints of delaying disease progression or prolonging survival um, don't necessarily apply. Um, but we do need to learn and um, expand on in a prospective way, bringing in the voice of the caregivers and those with lived experience in what's important to them, that it may not mean anything to them, whether their child has a Bailey score of 70 or a Bailey score of 85. And overall, we have to consider how to balance the safety and efficacy effects um, especially in our tiniest infants, um, all too often we see trade-offs in that we may see uh, a safety signal of improvement like we did in the phototherapy trial, but also an offsetting harm. Um, and so working to develop those as competing interests um, and being very thoughtful about that is something that we uh, must learn. Selection of the endpoints, again, I think um, in traditional clinical practice um, began to change almost two decades ago with a family-centered care approach where the family is a partner in the care of their infant. Um, and a, a phrase that is often used in that context is nothing about me without me, um, that whatever you know about my infant I need to know if I'm going to make appropriate decisions on their behalf as a parent. And I think, again, we come back to the importance of bringing the parents and other caregivers like nurses and social workers to the bedside. That's what I got. Great, thank you. So I'll just summarize a little bit about our discussion in session two, which I think actually um, was well orchestrated because I think it really touched on a lot of the themes that we've heard throughout the day as far as the challenges we have with defining endpoints and then some of the movements we've had in how we tackle some of these areas and the idea of you know not shying away from these challenges but um, kind of facing them head on. So um, you know we heard from uh, Kanisha about development and pain and again going back to that challenge of feels functions and survives and how do we define feel and pain in a neonate who can't tell us? Um, so uh, using approaches um, such as the um, evaluating clinician and, and cognitive debriefing and clinician caregiver perspectives in, in informing some of the measures that we might be able to use in that space. Um, we heard a lot of discussion throughout the day about BPD. Um, and you know when, when and how we should be measuring it. And we heard from Dr. Jensen about um, using a data-driven approach um, to connect some of these different ways we can define that short-term look at the baby at the 36-week mark. We can argue about whether that's the right time or not, but um, and how that relates to our, the later outcomes that you know matter to, to families, as we've um, heard repeatedly as the important kind of benchmark for us as we as we think about this um, across disease areas. We heard from Janet Soule about um, seizures and um, that balance again um, with using a multi-stakeholder approach and in, in defining you know, how we look at seizures and again, um, getting a consensus, but even still a little bit of a fuzzy area with, are we worried about stopping seizures completely? Are we worried about decreasing a seizure burden? 
Are we really worried about um, long-term outcomes? Are we worried about all of them and how, do, how, do those, how can those be connected? But at least starting somewhere with getting everybody in the room um, and, and making some, some comments about how we should be approaching um, trials in that, in that space. And finally, we heard from um, Marna Fringa about um, NOWS, but a, again, a, a case study really for how you can um, get multi-stakeholder input and, and develop these and use these Delphi approaches to identify the core outcomes that kind of stand up to multiple rounds of, of discussion and of, of um, you know, across, uh, across different perspectives um, that, that kind of stand up to, to being important and, and need to be maintained and need to be evaluated in our trials. Um, so, like I said, I think that um, even though we chose these four problem areas where we feel like there's been progress made and a lot of efforts and work, I think they, they give examples of both the challenges we're facing and then, you know, again, approaches where, where folks are, are really trying despite the challenges um, to, to move us forward. Um, so I'll turn it to Monica then. Great. Um, well, I think in our session, there were a lot of key takeaways. I'll summarize some of them and probably miss some others. But I, I really think first and foremost, um, something I took away from not only this session, but the, the whole day and um, the collective body of work of many of the people in this room is that involving stakeholders isn't just the right thing to do. It's necessary to do good science. And that engagement has to span the full research life cycle. Are we asking the right question? Is an endpoint meaningful? Have we talked with nurses, social workers, bedside clinicians about whether that endpoint is feasible and how that might impact the, the child's day-to-day -to -day bedside care and clinician workload? Have we partnered with organizations that can help us translate that endpoint and disseminate information about results to the communities that need that information. We talked about a lot of hard questions, how to balance the need for long-term outcomes with timeliness and the urgent need for new therapies, how to link health system data with school data and other systems that clearly hold critical information about a child's long-term well-being when to use and how to think about and interpret and apply composite outcomes. And I also left with this sense of like, we can collectively solve hard problems. And we heard about a lot of examples of that today. Um, we heard about how many of the things we're talking about have been thought about and wrestled with in the rare disease community and how we might apply lessons learned from that work to what we do in this space. We heard about meaningful partnerships between researchers and diverse stakeholders and what those partnerships can do. And we heard a clear ongoing regulatory commitment to the inclusion of patient and family voices. And we saw some of the fruits of that labor in a variety of the sessions today. So, so I'm leaving today with some homework, with a call to action, um, but most importantly, I think with a lot of optimism um, that, that conversations like this can really begin to move the needle. Well, thanks, Monica. Um, so in session four, which was the one we just had, uh, was on novel approaches to measure clinical benefit in neonatal, neonatal clinical trials. We had uh, some great presentations and discussion. I'm going to talk about some of these. Um, so first, the global rank score um, has the potential to increase statistical power and to be more clinically relevant, which incorporates multiple morbidities. Uh, involving wide stakeholders of the development, and they can provide a framework for composites to be specific to a disease. So one of the things that um, uh, that you may have noticed is that um, Jenny Taylor was talking about sort of the development of a neonatal global rank, whereas Kevin Hill was talking about one that was very specific to cardiology. And so I think there's um, some there's potential for confusion that the, there's not a or the global rank score. It is It is a process by which one develops uh, an endpoint. Um, and it is nice that if uh, if this works and it is uh, validated is that, uh, and we didn't really talk much about validation, frankly, but if it is validated, then um, it has a potential to lower the number of part uh, participants and be more clinically meaningful. So it's sort of a win-win-win all the way around. Um, Kevin noted that, um, uh, that the challenges of conducting a trial in a rare heterogeneous patient cohort like pediat pediatric 
um, heart disease um, can be ameliorated really with a with the with the global rank score that they had developed um, in a pragmatic trial design which had a registry infrastructure so that's a very um, very practical way of doing things uh, one of the questions I didn't get a chance to ask him was you know how did they how did pediatric cardiology develop these um, registries we have some in neonatology they're not uh, quite as robust as the STS database with not quite as much detail, uh, but certainly um, there are some that are out there. And so how can you, how can we make them better and then use them uh, for neonatal trials? Um, and then he also noted um, that, uh, that the, that the, um, uh, the, the other thing that he said, which was very um, apropos was during the question and answer question. Uh, period about sort of taking the global rank score that they had and then modifying it for their next study. And so it's a it's a similar patient population, but it's a different time intervention. So it's a way, uh, a different timing of intervention. So it's right at birth, um, not at the time of surgery. So how can one incorporate uh, events that may happen or likely will happen from the time of birth until the time of surgery? Um, <clears throat> Claudia Pedroza talked about uh, Bayesian trial design, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, showed some very practical examples of things that happened and were published in high impact journals where you had a, a, a quote, negative trial. Uh, but in fact, when looking at it with a Bayesian lens, um, really probably showed benefit. Um, and, uh, and Kevin was a little, um, he, uh, he, he took that to heart. So to speak, <laughs> literally, uh, and so uh, we, I, I have a feeling that uh, we may see some manuscripts coming out in the next couple of years uh, from Kevin and his group. Um, they may have Pedrozo somewhere in there, um, and uh, so that was uh, some of the some of the points. And then as well, um, uh, Deanna spoke a lot about surrogate endpoints, um, and so. Uh, you know, as I have learned about surrogate endpoints through the through the FDA's lens, is that and she talked a lot about how important they are and how, what what one needs to do in order to validate them. Um, it's, it is really important if and if someone or a, a, if some group is interested in using a surrogate endpoint, um, and this is one point that was really important for the whole session, which is to involve the agency early. Um, and it seems like the FDA is willing to talk with um, individuals, companies, groups. Um, other funding agencies to optimize the trial design, optimize the endpoint design early in, in the trial development, which is really great news. Um, and it also sounds like there, there may be some uh, maybe additional flexibility um, and maybe not uh, the sort of traditional rigidity, which is also nice. Um, and we also talk a lot about, um, you know, aggregating real world data sources. Um, from you know electronic health records, other registries, other trials, um, and putting them all together. Um, he talked specifically about bronchopulmonary dysplasia, as well as um, sort of you know um, uh, laboratory values, which is something that is very challenging for anyone that's ever done a clinical trial in neonates. Is that there are no normative data, and so it's very difficult uh, to do that. And so um, he also talked a little bit about sort of disease progression and different uh, models, which would be um, great to get from those, those types of data. And then uh, Susan, as I mentioned earlier, um, really talked about um, early protocol development through the overall process and how important it is um, about one of the things is, is that if, if a company or a group is uh, working on an adult indication to think about the pediatric and neonatal indications early in the development so that they um, can, uh, so that if they are like, if they're going to be used, and I would say almost likely to be used, um, particularly in a lot of the intensive care um, drugs, uh, what we know from a personal experience as a neonatologist is that it seems as if there are adult drugs that are used, and then they sort of drift down into the pediatric groups, and then it sort of ends up um, in the NICU, um, and we have very, very little information about a lot of these drugs. Um, so it's really important to um, to get them to get the those individuals and groups thinking about uh, protocol development in kids in neonates um, early on in in the in the in the drug design program. And those are sort of the main, some of the main main points. Right. Thank you. So I think in our in our final minutes we can chat a little bit about um, you know what we see as there are a lot of challenges. <laughs> there was a lot of optimism. I agree with you, Monica. Monica, about um, you know efforts that are being made. Um, I guess one question we can go kind of through the through the panel and see what you think the priorities are, where we need to focus our efforts. So we talked about incorporating parent voice and how we do that. Global rank score, um, 
breaking down silos. There's um, a lot of um, core outcome sets for every disease process. So um, there's a lot of, um, of different approaches that were discussed today. Um, so just to get a sense of where you think we should be focused and what our one or two priorities might be. Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, yes, we need to do all of those things. Um, you know, it's like when I'm talking to my boss and it's like, okay, which of the four number one priorities would you like me to work on first? Um, that um, I think we are, the low hanging fruit is that we are well poised for developing formal mechanisms and NICHD is committed to forming um, a parent advisory group for every trial going forward. Um, and we're writing the charters for those now. So that the, that will be built in to our trials. Um, and I had the pleasure of sitting with the, the first group that we've recruited recently for uh, one of our opioid uh, trials, opioid exposure in newborns. Um, I think the other challenges are how do we make our endpoints more robust? And I, I think that's a must. And there are uh, the common outcome sets are a great way to standardize it that um, certainly would make it easier in the future to do systematic reviews um, that oftentimes you put in together a lot of studies and they had just slightly different endpoints um, that it can make it more difficult to interpret. All right, this is a hard one. Um, I will echo that, that I, I would agree that, that in my mind, um, the top priority has to be a sustained commitment to an investment in stakeholder engagement and research throughout the research life cycle. And clearly the FDA and ICHD have, have been leaders in this space. And um, I do think that in addition to building in incentives to um, help investigators and teams um, integrate parent, caregiver, stakeholder voices into the process early, added infrastructure around how to do that, roadmaps of how to do that, um, you know, refinement of best practices, clear um, guidance, and even metrics around how we grade our success when we do it well or we don't do it well, I think are really the, the next steps. And so I, I see that as um, the foundation on which a lot of the, the other challenges we've discussed um, might ultimately be solved. Yeah, I, I agree with what the other folks have said. I mean, do it all, right? That's what I, I mean, this, this is, it's hard to uh, prioritize, really, I think. that. Um, but, you know, I, as I'm sitting here thinking, I think that, um, you know, the, the possible solutions or potential solutions are, um, are, are there. Um, I just think it's important for us to sort of work together um, to sort of move in that direction. Um, Michelle just touched on it a little bit about endpoints or about common data elements or, you know, assessing the, you know, the inclusion and exclusion criteria sort of the same way with, with the different types of studies with the same endpoints um, across um, different therapeutics. And, you know, in neonatology, um, at least as far as premature infants goes, there's, you know, eight, six to eight, 10 big things um, that are all neonatologists are concerned about. Um, and so there's a real opportunity um, to sort of come together and really nail down some of those things um, as, a, as a group and then put them on paper in a protocol um, in order to, um, and then have, you know, similar protocols across different therapeutics. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about HIE, um, and there, it could easily be done for HIE because it's a relatively, you know, it's a, it's a heterogeneous phenomenon, but when it happens, they all have certain criteria that the babies meet. Um, we shouldn't have, you know, we should measure seizures the same way. We should get MRIs the same way. They should get, they should be about the same time and should, we should do certain follow-up and this is the type of follow-up we should do. We, as a, as a community, I think we should involve families and stakeholders to be able to sort of identify what those are. And then the regulatory agency could say, 
yes, we agree with that. And then you move on and then you can start looking for therapeutics or interventions or things in order to um, and to sort of improve outcomes. Uh, one of the things that um, Christy Waterberg mentioned earlier was just sort of the dexmethasone story. And I want something that for people not to forget about, which is almost all those dexamethasone st studies or virtually all of them had a placebo group. Um, so here we are in 2023, and I don't know how many babies have been randomized into a dexamethasone study, but thousands and thousands and thousands. And there have been thousands and thousands of babies not exposed um, with a bunch of babies that were. Do we really need to do that? Um, do we need to have to continually do a, you know, a randomized trial um, and have a placebo group um, when if you do the next study, it's going to be a very similar type group? Um, you know, things like erythropoietin, you know, early erythropoietin, you know, do we really need to have a placebo group if we want to use another, um, another product that's very similar, um, but just might be have a different mechanism of action? Thank you. And I'll say that I wholeheartedly agree with, I think, everybody's um, concept that, you know, all of our, our therapeutics are aimed to treat the patients and families. So it needs to start there. And I think we've made some headway in, in figuring out ways to do that. Um, I think the other um, priority is, um, is getting together these core outcome sets. That, like Susie, I you know, have worn two hats over my career, spent a lot of time in academics and now looking at things through a different lens in, um, at the FDA. And, you know, but both spaces like to be able to reference things that are <laughs> widely accepted, you know, and um, in both spaces, I'll say that when you speak outside of the neonatal community, they refer to us as tiger country, right? So um, <laughs> they do. <laughs> We, it's really difficult to perform trials when every unit is doing, every provider is doing things differently and everybody's measuring outcomes differently. So I hope that, um, you know, that this conversation is the start of us trying to put together approaches and methods um, that we can um, use going forward and reference and say, this is the way we have to start somewhere, but this is the way we'll, we'll, we'll start and, and take it from there. So thank you to all of our panelists and all the participants today. It's been wonderful. I'm going to turn it back over to Morgan Romain and do Margolis to close us out. All right. Well, I'm not going to attempt to pile on top of the expert synthesis and marching orders that you just got uh, from your moderators, but I am going to spend just a moment to thank all of our participants for their contributions, not only to today's conversation, but also to the field in general. The development of clinically meaningful endpoints for neonatal trials is a critical challenge to better caring for and treating the youngest among us, uh, which in turn is only part of improving mater maternal and child health uh, in a country when far too many indicators are headed in the wrong direction. So this is good and laudable and hard work, uh, and we thank you for it. I'm also here to thank the planning group uh, for this convening. So a, a good and successful convening is never as easy uh, or straightforward as it may appear to be, but we were joined in the journey uh, by several organizations uh, on the planning committee, first and foremost, our colleagues at the FDA. I'd like to thank Jerry Baer and Massaro, Melissa Lestini and Suna Sayo. Uh, Jerry, this is what, our fourth or fifth, I think, uh, workshop with your team. And it's always a pleasure. We enjoy working with you. Uh, we were also joined by Michelle Walsh from NICHD and Matthew Lawn uh, for UNC. And then last but not least, I do want to shout out our uh, colleagues at the Critical Path Institute, Connell Jeet Singh, Karen Stam, and Huang Huin for their technical and clinical expertise uh, along the way. Last but not least, uh, our team at Duke Margolis, uh, DeRay Kim, Nancy Allen LaPointe, Luke DeRocher, Hannah Vitello, Thomas Rhodes, and of course, Beth Boyer and Mira Gill for all of their efforts over the past months to pull this together. And with that, I'm hopefully releasing some of you to the cherry blossoms. The sun has come out, which is in your favor. You're just a few blocks away. Uh, otherwise, thank you again and have a wonderful evening.